What happened to the future we once dreamed of? We imagined abundant energy through nuclear fusion. Instead, we got an explosion in the use of fossil fuels and a climate crisis to go with it. We dreamed of flying cars, hoverboards, and hyperloops. What we got instead was congested city centers, 10-minute grocery delivery, and e-scooters. We landed on the moon, and we forgot how to go back. It doesn't feel exaggerated to say that these past few decades have been some of the most cynical in human history. However, there is every reason to believe that this is about to change. In fact, we're convinced that we will look back on the 2020s as an exceptionally productive period in the history of technology. Across energy, biotech, space exploration, 
computing to internet and AI. We're suddenly able to build things we couldn't even dream of just a few years ago. Consider the following. Starting in 1990, researchers spent 13 years and more than a billion euros sequencing the first human genome. Today, that process costs a few hundred dollars and has been done in five hours. Wind and solar are 80% cheaper than they were a decade ago, and we're able to store that energy 10 times more efficiently. As a result, we can see reducing energy costs for the first time since 1970s, and with no toll on the climate. After years of research, we've rolled out the first commercial mRNA vaccines. Suddenly, cancer vaccines could be within our grasp. And after having dreamed about it for decades, we've finally reached quantum supremacy. That means that quantum computers are now able to perform calculations traditional computers will ever be able to. Each of these is an astonishing breakthrough in its own right. However, each is also only that first critical step into a universe of opportunity. It's been long since the future felt this exciting. We call this the break of dawn. It's our team for Slash 2022, and an optimistic story about the future we wish to turn into reality over the next two days. So, what will happen over these next two days? In preparing this event, we've continuously asked ourselves one question. Who is coming? Not how many people, but who are they? So while it's really cool to have 12,000 of you here today, the number that really matters is that you're surrounded by 4,600 early-stage startup founders and operators. Each of those companies has had to apply to join the event, and having read those applications, we can confidently tell you that the very best young technology companies in Europe are in this room. In addition, we're joined by... Woo! Woo! <laughs> In addition, we're joined by 2,600 investors. That makes us the largest scattering of venture capital ever hosted on the face of the earth. There's more than one investor for each startup present. So I don't think there's any better place to raise our next round funding round than this very room. Woo. Out of the next two days, you have booked more than 10,000 meetings in our meeting area with each other. If the past is anything to go by, a number of funding rounds will once again be initiated under this roof over the next two days. Now, one funding round that all of you will definitely hear about will happen right here tomorrow afternoon. This year, for the first time, five of the very best early stage VCs will invest a million euros in the winner of the Slash 100 pitching competition. In addition to capital, Slash is about company building advice. Over the next two days, some of people behind some of the most iconic tech companies will be here on stage. In our program, we have 50 people who have built a billionaire company and 11 who have scaled to 10 billion. However, these people won't be here to talk about where they are today. They revisit the early foundational moments, what they did when they were where you are now. Also, this advice doesn't stop when the speakers step off stage. For the fourth event running, we've asked every speaker to dedicate one hour of their time to mentoring the early stage startups in the audience. So, to sum it up, you are the most relevant crowd Slush has ever had. So look up, turn around, and talk to the people next to you. Now, there are also some people in this room who don't yet work in tech, but very soon might. This event, like every Slush event to date, is being built by 1,500 volunteers. To each of you, I want to say thank you. None of this would be possible without you. Now, let's give a huge round of applause to all of our volunteers. <laughs> Importantly, though, our volunteers aren't just here to contribute towards the event. Most of them are students from all around the globe getting their first glimpse of the startup ecosystem. So when you ask for directions or go buy a t-shirt, you might very well be talking to someone who will build a massive tech company in the near future. When we started to build this event a year ago, I had a feeling that we're on the brink of something new and important. And the feeling wasn't about the upcoming event. It was about the future in general. When thinking of the next few days, the same feeling returns. 
a feeling that something ex extremely important for our future will originate within this room over the next two days. We're beyond excited to have all of you here. Welcome to the break of dawn and slash 2022. <laughs> Slush. Woo! Welcome to Slush 2022 and the Founder Stage. A Founder Stage is bringing the monumental moments at Slush for everyone, including the just witnessed opening show, the Slush 100 uh, competition, and a new addition for this year, which is the um, announcements uh, wow. from, by those bringing uh, world's first to Slush. Wow, let's hear about that. I am Johannes. Good morning, everyone. Um, during my work, I work for the Upright project. Uh, we are creating the global standard of impact measurement for companies and investors, and hopefully and possibly the next Finnish startup success story. And my name is Josefina. I'm the CEO of Startup Foundation. Uh, our mission is to support the next generation of entrepreneurs. And we will be your friends and guides for the next two days. Perfect. We're actually both long-time slushers. I was the first volunteer here in 2015. And my first time volunteering was in 2013. And after that, we worked together at Slush as well for a while. Uh, and now, here volunteering again. <laughs> let's go. Um, let's begin with today's program. Uh, Doug Leone has been at the forefront of VC for more than three decades and has seen it all. From navigating the dot-com bubble uh, in financial crisis to um, driving Sequoia Capital's expansion in China, India, and Europe. In conversation with Sequoia par partner Luciana Lissandro, Doug will share the crucible moments that have shaped his journey, his approach to company building, and candid advice for founders in uncertain times. Very timely. As you heard, Doug is a partner at Sequoia, and he focuses on software investments aimed at the enterprise market. He's a director of Action IQ, Trade Republic, and WIS, just to name a few. He's joined Sequoia in 1988. He's obviously been involved with Sequoia's investments in numerous companies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luciana is also a partner at Sequoia, where she focuses on enterprise and consumer technology companies across Europe. Luciana works closely with companies like Central and Getir, and is passionate about helping founders at all stages to unlock their potential and think on a global scale. This is Lessons from a Lifetime in Venture. Welcome on stage, Doug and Luciana. Slush. We are so happy to be back here this year, and we love the energy and the music. And I am particularly honored to be here today with my partner, Doug. And introducing Doug in two minutes is an impossible task, but I will do my very best. Doug started at Sequoia 30 years ago. He was leader of the firm from 1996 until this year. During this period, Sequoia went from a California-based and quite California-focused early-stage firm to what it is today, a firm that's active in China, in India, in Europe. We opened the office here a couple of years ago. We invest in Latin America, and we invest across stages today, from seed, Series A, growth, public companies. Doug also worked with some legendary companies and incredible founders. Just to name a few, ServiceNow, I think even in this market, it's, I don't think I checked. Even in this market, it's an $85 billion publicly listed company. New Bank, it's the largest publicly listed new age fintech out there. And Wiz, which 
arguably is the fastest growing enterprise software company out there. So that is quite an impressive list of founders, and we are really excited to learn from Doug's experience today. Doug, let's go straight into it. Uh, Slush this year is different from last year. It's a period of uncertainty. The NASDAQ dropped 30% since the beginning of the year. War, energy crisis, inflation. How do you feel about today? And is this period similar or different from 2001 and from 2008? So the first thing I want to say is thank you for being here. At my age, it's really an honor to be here in front of so many people that want to change the whole world. So I want to make sure you understand that this is a very genuine sentiment on my part. We live in a moment in time. Think about the privilege of being in front of so many people that do that. So on, a, a really heartfelt thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, unfortunately, and I'll give you the good news, the situation here today, I think, is more difficult and more challenging than either 08, which was really a protective financial services crisis, or 2000, which is a protected technology crisis. Here, we have a global crisis. We have interest rates around the world increasing. Consumers globally are starting to run out of money. We have an energy crisis, and then we have all the issues of geopolitical challenges. And my forecast is that we're not going to get away with this very quickly. Uh, if you turn back to the 70s, there was a malaise of 16 years. Even if you go back to 2000, a number of public companies didn't recover for 10 years. So I think we have to be ready for a prolonged time where we're going to find consumers running out of money, large companies, and most of the economies that we all work and live in are consumer-driven economies. In the U.S., it's 70% consumer. Consumers running out of money, demand decreasing, tech companies' budgets being cut, and so I think we should be prepared for a longer period of challenges that we have faced in the past. How long? Who really knows? But it will not be 12 months. It's not we're going to hope for a 2024 recovery. That would be my forecast. Doug, we have a lot of founders in the audience. What kind of companies do you think can win in this environment? Um, a few things. Companies that solve real problems. Companies that can justify a hard ROI period, not soft productivity gains. Productivity gains is a soft ROI, but where you go for someone to be either controlling a budget, let me help you save real money, or a greed gene, let me help you make some real money, and do so with a true mathematical argument. Uh, those, and then companies that have strong leaders. And what's a strong leader? A strong leader is somebody, not only that has a vision and can execute in good culture, but in this market, someone that can communicate clearly with their employee base. Someone that doesn't bullshit their employee base. Because at this time, you want to bring your employees in and ask them and tell them, here's the challenges. And by the way, Google, Facebook, Meta are laying off. So it's not that we're in an environment where everybody can run away. And just be honest with them and communicate, here's the challenges. But more importantly, here's the plan because you got to get people to buy in. Uh, and it's got to be a clear plan. And then get everybody to all hands and said, we're going to go dominate. Those are the kinds of companies, in my opinions, uh, in my opinion, that are going to first survive. And by the way, survival in this market is half of the battle. And then excel. Let's talk about that a little bit. I'm sure that you have a lot of advice for founders. You shared some of it already. Do you have specific advice for very early stage founders, let's say for seed stage founders or growth stage founders? or not so blanket? So the younger you go in a company, the more immune you are to economic conditions. Think of it at the other extreme in the way we solve all math problems. We look at the extremes. If you're a public company, 
uh, you really are targeted, you're pegged to the public market environment. If you're a seed stage company and you're a year and a half from product, you know, or, and revenue and maybe two years from profitability and seven years from exit, you have nothing to do with, with, with the public market. And so realize where you are in the continuum uh, one, but to me the more important segmentation is you have to figure out if you're weak or strong. And the lesson for me for 208, and we always learn from you, you have to realize we learn from you all the time, was if you can afford it, do not take your foot off the product accelerator, even during tough times. Because tough times are gonna be followed by good times, and if you've had the ability to invest in product, which is really the core of the company, and sales being on the outer rim, you're gonna come out with a much better offering when the time is right. And so, my advice is in product, if you can afford it, continue to invest. In sales, don't go far out on the payback curve. It's not time because your competitors are dying, so there's no reason to push it. If your payback curve was a year, now is the wrong time to go get customers with a two-year payback. So. Product first, revenue second, and then if you're really, really weak, you do the best you can to hold on to product, marginal improvement, but if you're strong, attack on product. Attack on product and find the right balance for sales and revenues. It sounds very straightforward, but I wonder, Doug, how many founders really realize in the moment if they're in a position of strength or in a position of weakness? Well, look, it's not that tough. The only thing that's tough is product market fit. It's the genius level you bring in product market fit. Each one is different. Everything else I mentioned is mechanical. Mere mortals can figure that out. It's what we experience business partners. Notice I didn't use the word investor. Experiences partners, experienced business partners can help you solve. And essentially what you're really doing is you're doing a SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, challenges, and opportunities. And you look at the market opportunity, figure out where you are. You know in most cases your competitors are gonna die and you're dealing with the stodgy public companies that are not gonna be innovating, and just do a clear SWOT analysis, figure out where you are, because every strategy you do and every tactic you employ has to do not from the inside out, but from the outside in. It's a response to the market at large. So do a clear, no holds bar analysis with your trusted business partners, figure out where you are, and then take action. Really not more, much more complicated than that. Like everything else in life, the easiest solution is probably the best solution. We talk a lot at Sequoia about crucible moments, these moments that can really change the course of a company. And as an industry, perhaps we're going through a crucible moment now. When you make all the decisions you just talked about, are there any particular um, is there any particular advice for founders from a mentality perspective? Is there anything that you've learned from the founders that you work with that really helped them or that you use an ex as an example? So I'm going to try not to be self-serving and really be helpful to you. Think of what happened in the last two or three years. Whatever you did was rewarded by some investor because of the plethora of capital you were rewarded no matter what. You made a shit decision, a crap decision, you got money. You made a good decision, you got money. Which is a lousy way for you to learn your craft. All that is gone. The healthy balance between founder and business partner is now in place. And what you're going to learn now is the best lessons you're ever gonna learn. Even in our business, imagine an investing associate that joined us two years ago. Everything they invested went up and to the right. They actually thought they knew what they were doing. But what a terrific training time. And so I would view this as a cleansing period. I would view this an incredible opportunity. This is a crucible moment, but not in the way you think. I think this is a crucible moment for you to undo some of the bad habits and become business people, true business people, to invest your precious capital in the things that really have payback. And let's face it, 
if you have 10 million dollars in a bank and can do one thing versus 45 million dollars that can do three things, where do you think the better decision is going to be made? What do you think the better decisions can be made when you're loose or when you're desperate and you really have to focus? So this is a crucible moment for you, but in my way of viewing it, it is a terrific crucible moment to shed some of the things you've heard before. Let me remind you, I have to be a unicorn. God forbid if I don't raise money at a higher price, the, the morale of the employees, all that's gone. Communicate to your employees, if you need the capital, don't think about, oh, it's a hundred million dollars less. The only question you should ask yourself is this, how do we make our company, not my company, our company, the strongest possible company three to five years from now? That is the only question that matters. When we hold your shares and we figure out what to do, now you're public, we don't ask ourselves, my, look how the stock went up 10 points. Maybe we should sell or distribute. The only question we ask ourselves is, what can this company be three or five years from now? Because every wonderful company has always has the crazy buyout offer. The only thing that matters is the future. We all have the possibility of playing long term, of looking the long term, which is really what our business is all about crucible moment to take advantage of the situation, not so much to survive, but to figure out how to get stronger in a world where fewer companies are getting started, the major companies have layoffs, you have a chance to upgrade, you have a chance to get stronger if you play your cards right. It almost sounds like you're saying that the last few years were less good than today to start a company. Like everything Which is else in life, you know, one of the things I learned in life is the truth is often the opposite of what you think. Uh, the last two or three years seem like wonderful boom time, but look, talent was diluted. Many look-alike companies got invested. A whole bunch of investors came in that absolutely had no clue what they were doing. Think about it now, fewer competition, fewer competitive companies, more talent, the investors who were weak are frozen. This is a much healthier time for you and us. So I would view this as an amazing time. The two times I love most are boon times and times like these. Boon times, you exit, you sell. Terrific time like this is you invest. It can be a good time to buy and sell at the same time. This is a time to buy, to invest, to develop great habits. And so out of this gloom that's in the air, I would encourage you to shed all that gloom and really be aggressive and really think right now in terms how to dominate. You have a chance to dominate. My partner Ravi reminded me 10 minutes ago, the eight and center line, it is tough to pass more than one car in a sunny day when you're racing, but you can pass 10 cars on a rainy day. Think about that. I like the, the, positive, um, the positive attitude and I'll build on that. In 2001, Sequoia invested in two companies that are generational, Google and PayPal. Of course, we also invested in many, many companies that are no longer here. Was it obvious from the early days that PayPal and Google would create something special, would survive that period, would even thrive in that period? Is there anything those founders did that our founders and the audience can learn from? You know, very interesting. Google, a lay market entrant, and there's a great line by a Google investor who I won't name that three years after the investment said, we've never paid so much for so little. Google was a company that was a walk in the woods. There are many roads to heaven, as my partner Shalender in India says, very philosophical in India. There's no one way. And Google is a company that took a long time, as many of your companies will. Uh, and so that was not as obvious. PayPal was more interesting because it was a conglomeration of an incredible amount of talent. In fact, if you look at all the people that left PayPal, um, they started many, many companies. Uh, and so 
PayPal was more obvious. There the issue of PayPal was the gun to the head that eBay said being the most of the revenues from PayPal were from eBay. And the fact that uh, we wanted to hold on for a long time and it was one of the situations not unlike YouTube that was sold 353 days after we made the investment where the offer seemed so extravagant. Think of YouTube, think of PayPal, think of Instagram sold for a billion dollars, which actually saved Facebook. And so uh, many lessons there. The lessons there is great companies have started during dark times. Don't accept what looks to be a terrific offer. I gave you the question you want to ask a few years from now. And there are many roads to heaven. In a case of uh, PayPal and YouTube, more of a direct line. Both, uh, in a case of YouTube, lay market entrant. In a case of PayPal, early market entrant. Uh, and in a case of YouTube, a bit of a walk in the woods. So there is no singular way to get to heaven. Uh, you just have to find your way and have the conviction to stick with it. I'll ask you an unfair question. People talk often about those cases where a founder and a team had a great offer on the table and it was really hard to say no, but they said no and then went on to build even bigger companies that are, became legendary. I think service now maybe is an example, I'm is not sure. Is this first time founders or second time founders? Uh, regardless. Yes. So there are also stories that yeah. don't get told as often where founders reject a great offer yes. and then don't find success. I know it's an unfair question because I'm asking you to generalize. How do you know? Uh, look, there are many investors. We're not that smart. But we, you have to assume through real logic that after 50 years we've learned something. And what we've learned is when the flywheel starts going, it surprises us. With you as a founder, the first time you see it, you go, oh my God, I can be worth X. Uh, in our case, we haven't gotten too many of those wrong, mostly because of really pattern recognition and experience. What we often recommend to founders, not founders in a Series A that get bribed by new investors, you haven't done anything, you've written three lines of code, how about if you take 10 million off the table and you get us as investor? That's called bribery, it should be legal, people should go to jail for that. But if you're a founder that's built a business, you've got revenue, I would suggest the following, take 10% of your holding off the table, 20% max, Take the pressure off, which really then uh, de-risks you, maybe your partner in life and so on, and gives you the courage and maybe even the business alignment to go for, to go for it for the long term. I think the answer to your question is make sure you align yourself to the business partner. And I want to say a word about that. I am so tired of hearing founders saying that I got a term sheet. Whoa, I got a term sheet to me and I'm going to speak out of school is like saying, I went to a bar and the first person, male or female, depending on you are, spoke to me, I got married. That's what it sounds to me like. Think about how you architect your product. Most of you are technical. You spend time architecting your product. Why don't you architect your cap table exactly the same way? And yet that doesn't occur to you. We hear, I got a term sheet. Oh, he was first. So what? Be very careful in who you choose as your business partners. Do careful reference checks, not only even the companies that work. We all have companies that work. But ask, give me a list of three companies that didn't work. Show me your character is when a CEO was struggling. What did you do? And those are the great references you want to ask out of your business financial partners. How about mistakes? Are there really obvious mistakes that founders should avoid in this part of the cycle? Yeah, don't get caught up in a mania. The next round, oh, I've got to do last round's post or the morale of my company. Be pragmatic, play long term. 
if you've got to raise $50 million and your last round was 500 and this round that's 350, first of all, the 500 has what is called weighted average dilution, that you're not going to pay very much. And then explain to your employees that you're way better off with another 50 million at a reduced price. Your 409A will come down. Your next set of employees are going to have slightly lower price share, which is an advantage. And, and go for it. And explain to them that now you have the firepower to win in the long term. To me, that's the greatest error I'm seeing right now, trying to protect some artificial last round's price for all the bad reasons. One of the reasons is that there has been so much press around startups. And back in my day, I'm joking, but let's say five, six, seven years ago, in Europe at least, startups did not use to announce their valuations when they raised money. And today, it became quite common. What's your general advice on startups' relationships with the press? Should they try to be front and center, build a brand? Should they stay stealth for as long as possible? Startups have two advantage. Stealth and speed. Why would you ever give up any one of them? So my advice as a board member is shut the hell up unless there's a reason to be loud. And what are the reasons? Customers, I don't think a customer cares whether you raise money at 350, 650, or 850. Recruiting or fundraising? I don't think a press release helps you in recruiting either. It is the sales skills of a CEO, of a founder. And so most cases when you're small and weak, why announce? There's so many announcement week. Just lay low and be like the restaurant that doesn't post their phone number and yet there's a line out the door. There are times you have revenue, you have 42 salespeople, you want a little marketing air cover, that's when it's time to speak. You're a year before the IPO. You want to create a buzz. That's the time to speak. But at most time, speaking only provides you with cocktail kind of, uh, of material so you can show your friends how well you're doing. That's a bunch of crap. Resist that notion. One of the things that many of us appreciate about you is that you're very direct. And speaking about the press, Sequoia has been in the press a lot for the past couple of weeks. What should we have done differently? So, first of all, I, I, I'm not going to mention any acronyms. And you must appreciate that we don't know what's going to happen, but I'll forecast for you, regulators, investigators are going to come. So I'm not going to comment there. I'm going to make general comments. We are in the dream business with you. Would you like us to lose that trait? Now, I can tell you that after the last week, for the next three to six months <laughs> that we're going to dream a little less. But like having a child, you forget the pain of having that child three months later, a year later. We want to be in the dream business with you. I can tell you we've done careful due diligence, but what you see at the end of the quarter in a due diligence statement doesn't reflect what someone may have done in the middle of the quarter. We've looked at it, there's nothing much we could have done any differently, and we do not want to lose our virginity, our true belief to line ourselves with you and to dream with you. I think we lose that and we're out of business. Thank you for sharing that, Doug. Any parting words of wisdom for our founders in the audience and the general audience? Don't listen to all the stuff you read. You have a great opportunity in front of you if you play your cards right. You have an opportunity to pass 10 cars. Do not waste a good recession. That would be my parting advice. Doug, we love hearing from you. We love having you in Europe. Thank you so much for coming from California to Helsinki. And um, I want to thank everyone in the audience. Um, and we love meeting founders so much that we organized a an open coffee get together with all the Sequoia partners who are here. I think it's six of us. So please, if you're free at 1.30, join us. Um, I tweeted the details, but we're going to be in the first floor lobby. And just ask us if you can find them. We're excited to say hello to you in a bit. Thank and, you. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Doug and Luciana, for that. That was definitely interesting. I love the sanity check on where we are with, with the economy right now. Yeah, and on the other side, as a, a growth company builder, I'm pumped up. One anecdote that came to my mind, you can pass more cars on a rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, hey, next. As said, this slush, we're gonna have never heard before announcements on the stage. And this is going to be the first one. Yeah. So Maria, Maria Gabriel is the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, Youth and Sport. Under her leadership, the New Horizon Europe, Erasmus Plus and the Cultural Standard of Creative Europe programs will be defined and implemented. Yeah. We have no idea what's about to happen, but backstage she told me that she's here to bridge the gap between regulators and the startup ecosystem. Oh, that's really interesting. That's very good. So give a big hand to Maria. Hello, hello, the best innovation community in the world. Dear students, dear innovators, dear investors, dear friends. First of all, it's a great pleasure for me to be together with all of you today. Thank you, thank you very much, Slash, for being the most exciting, the most positive, and the most future-oriented event for startups. Well, today I would like to share with you why and how Europe can become a global leader in deep tech innovation. First, let's set the scene. Actually, we have some very, very encouraging facts and numbers. First, we are witnessing a new wave of innovation, but let's see what happened in Europe. For the first time, we have seen a record number of investment, 100 billion in European startups. For the first time, we compete with the United States for the early stage, the 5 million rounds. And at the same time, what we have seen that it's only one year in 21, we doubled the number of European unicorns from 44 to 89. So in the only five last years, the increase of innovation potential of Europe is 13%. All this, it's really encouraging. And actually, we all can see that we have to build on these strengths. And that's why, together with the European innovation ecosystem, we decided to seize this opportunity. Let me just very briefly mention what is specific about the new deep tech wave of innovation. For sure, the last decade, that was great to see the digital wave of innovation. That definitely made our life easier. We already have seen how we can be more efficient, more productive, how we can really de reduce human error. But Definitely, we arrive at the moment of our history that only with digital tools, digital solutions, we can't find these solutions that will allow us to tackle the deepest societal challenges. So what I would like to share with you today first is that when we talk about deep tech innovation, it's tackling deepest societal challenges climate change, demography, mobility, digitalization. Today, only together we can succeed. And Europe, again, already have some very good examples for this new deep, wave, deep tech wave of innovation. What is different? Different is that first we have extraordinary startups with breakthrough technologies, innovative, and during the pandemic, we all have seen that we have now a new tendency, a new dynamic that is created. 
look just at the example of BioNTech startup that discovered the mRNA technology, but at the same time, startup needs big companies and large corporates in order really to scale. On the other side, it was important this time to work with regulators in order to have the authorization procedures as fast as possible. At the same time, we need strong venture capital. At the same time, we need talents. We need people with the right skills and competencies in order to allow all this ecosystem to thrive. So it was great that we have this good example, but of course, it's only one. That's for us a new, new dynamic. This time, with deep tech wave of innovation, what we would like to see is really a cooperation between big and small, between universities and regulators, between industry and public authorities, in order, again, to tackle our deepest societal challenges. That's why. Together with the ecosystem, we decided to seize this chance. And the last one here, I must say that I'm really very grateful to all our unicorns, startup, venture capital, women founders, because the new European innovation agenda is your result, the result of your work. What we decided is to identify clearly five flagship initiatives, the main actions that we need at European level in order to facilitate your life and to put into action 25 actions for the next two years. Clear priorities, concrete actions, very, very targeted timetable. What are those five main flagships? For, first, scaling up. It's true that today in Europe we have an extraordinary number of startups, but we have to be there to help really to pass the so-called Valley of the Dead. We need to be there for the scaling up. And that's why at the European Commission, of course, we'll make our contribution with mechanisms like Escalar or new listing act that we'll, we'll adopt in the next month in December. Our intention is very clear, 45 billion euros raised by private and institutional investors in order to help the scaling up of our companies and, of course, to have European champions. The second flagship initiative, and I'm always saying that only the innovation community understands what that means. We need experimentation spaces, we need sandboxes, we need test beds and living labs. Of course, there is not only artificial intelligence or hydrogen, but we need to provide these to our innovators in order to thrive and to grow. Third flagship initiative, we need to talk about innovation cohesion. Actually, we have everywhere in Europe, in all our regions, vibrant, dynamic, local, regional innovation ecosystems. But they are don't, not connected to each other. We need, with all our regions, to build a pan-European innovation ecosystem. And that's why our main action is to have in Europe 100 regional innovation valleys with a budget of 10 billion euros in order really to push and to accelerate. Fourth flagship, I'm sure that everyone knows what I, we are talking about. Talents. The most fierce competition in the 21st century it will be for talents. And we need really talents in Europe and we need to become attractive destination for talents. For that flagship initiative, it's 1 million deep tech talents in Europe for the next three years. And of course, we would like to create, create a European talent pool in order to help our startups to find talents not only in Europe, but to attract talents outside of Europe. Here, there is a particular challenge really to make working closer the two worlds of research and innovation. And that's why we would like to promote this cooperation. Finally, maybe that sounds a little bit different from the four other flagships, but we need to work on robust data sets in order to have policies that are really adequate to what happened on the ground. We need 
a common definition on startup, on scale-up. We need to have a very clear picture what's happened, what are the tendencies, because no one knows what will be in 10 years our future, but we have to be ready to react. And here, a special word to a topic that is very close to my heart. We need more women in deep tech, in innovation, in the world of startup, and here they have my full support. Now, the flagship initiatives are here with concrete examples from the 100 regional innovation valleys in Europe to the 1 million deep tech talents, for scaling up to robust data set, passing by experimentation spaces and sandboxes. But it's true that it's really time to pass from the co-creation of the framework, it's here, it's necessary, to the co-implementation. That's why that's my call today for you, because for, for us, the new European innovation agenda is a call for action. Don't hesitate to join the coalition of the willing. That's an informal alliance of public and private actors of the pan-European innovation ecosystem. And we would like to implement together this new European innovation agenda. We would like to have regular meetings every six months in order to see what is working well, what, what is not working, and where there is a need of some additional efforts. The first meeting will be the 7th of December during the EIC summit. That's my message to you. You already have shown us that we can be a leader as Europe in this new deep tech wave of innovation. Join the coalition of the willing and continue to be in the driving seat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Slash, because here I can only join one message. Slash for me is S for solidarity, L for leadership, U for unity, S for success, and H for humanity. Let's show together that with the new European innovation agenda, we can promote a European leadership, we can show that innovation is here in order to make our societies and our economies resilient, future-oriented, and supportive of all their talents and regions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was really interesting. Yep. Uh, next up, pregnancy, infertility, babies, parenthood, and miscarriage. Words that carry strong meaning. And these concern most of the people, regardless of gender. Uh, why has it been so difficult to get support through the start? Hmm. Maven Clinic was founded to ease the family building journey, providing 24-7 access to a virtual clinic with Care Navigation, the largest telehealth network in women's and family health, and communities for parents uh, and patients. Yes. Kate Ryder is the founder and CEO at Maven Clinic. As a former journalist and investor, Kate is very well equipped to pick signals through the noise than most of us. Maven has raised more than 200 million in capital from investors, including Sequoia Capital, Oak HC, Dragoneer Investment Group, and Lux Capital. Today, she'll, she'll stare the stage with Juliet Bailin, principal at General Catalyst. Juliet partners with pre seed to Series A entrepreneurs in enterprise and healthcare as a part of General Catalyst's global thematic strategy. We'll hear, by the way, something new from her soon. I'm not sure what. This is Picking Signals Through the Noise, founding story of Maven Clinic. Welcome on stage, Kate and Juliet.
great to have you here, Kate. Thanks to be, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, we've got some huge congratulations in order, first and foremost. Maven has closed and announced on Monday its $90 million Series E round. So huge congratulations for that. Thanks. Led uh, by you. Yes. <laughs> we are General Catalyst. We are could not be more thrilled to have led this round and partner with you on this journey. And this is a significant investment, not only in this funding climate, but also as a testament to everything you and your team have accomplished. And we're just thrilled. Um, and I'd like to start at the beginning of that journey. You know, we're at Slush, which, which attracts some of the highest potential founders across Europe at the early stage. So for you, when did you know you wanted to start Maven and why, why this idea? So, um First of all, it's so great to be here. I was working in London, Maven started in London um, about eight years ago, and, and I was starting to hear about this conference slush, and it seemed so cool. So eight years later, it's really awesome to be on stage. Um, so I started Maven uh, you know, eight years ago in London because there was a clear gap in care uh, for women and families, not just in the US, but globally, um, You know, when you get on that journey of parenthood. And so I had just kind of entered my 30s, and, um, and I was starting to see a lot of stories from my, my friends as they were going through that, that family building journey around infertility, postpartum depression, miscarriage. Um, you know, if you were gay, you didn't have main core, like main fertility benefits through your employer or your, you know, a lot of the, the system wasn't covering kind of, you know, surrogacy and adoption and those pathways to parenthood. And so there was just such an, an incredible need and it was right at the early stages of digital health. And yeah. so all these companies, you know, I was working at this venture capital firm in London, and all of these companies were coming to pitch um, healthcare innovation, and no one was talking about women, and no one was talking about families, and this was such an obvious entry point for, for so much of the healthcare journey. And so I thought, very naively, um, this is something that uh, I, I can definitely do for the next 5, 10, 20 years, and so Maven was born. Beautiful. There's always a bit of naivete in those <laughs> moments. You need it to push yourself forward. And you mentioned, I mean, it's been an eight-year journey. When you reflect back, are there certain major milestones that you believe led you to this moment now? Um, you know, uh, of Maven's success? Yes, exactly. Um, so I would say, you know, working in healthcare, it, you know, you, you, our go-to-market has been B to C to B. So we, we sold to consumer and then we um, went into business. And I know we'll talk about that. Right. But, um, you know, I think when that first big client really takes a risk on you, um, that's really where, and, and they say, oh, we're going to bring Maven to our population. Um, that's really when I think the, uh, one of the big milestones occurs. And so for us in 2017, so two years after we launched, um, a, a Fortune 50 bank, uh, you know, the global benefits director said, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a chance and bring you on. And we were like 30, 35 people at the time. We're like, oh my God, like, you know, our <laughs> ACV was like $50,000 and awesome. it jumped to, you know, it was like a huge multi-million dollar contract. Yeah. Um, but that really was an inflection point for us where not only did our entire team go heads down to operations and execute on that contract and we delivered it, you know, I have an amazing team, we delivered it flawlessly, but also from an venture capital standpoint, you know, Sequoia is one of our amazing investors. I know Doug was just talking, they led our Series B um, and it was, uh, you know, Oak, which is an amazing healthcare investor, led our Series B with them. And so that was also an, an inflection point in the VC community. Got it. And you would, of course, Kevin, your exposure to that at the beginning of your career, you know that quite well. You mentioned yourself, you know, Maven started as a direct-to-consumer business, has since evolved to partner with employers and insurers. Can you walk us through that transition? Because I've, I've heard you say that starting the business with the consumer first has been a key to your success. So maybe you can expand a bit about that. Sure. So um, because I, I am a patient on the Maven platform, so I have three kids. Um, I, I actually started my pregnancy and parenthood journey with a miscarriage and then since went to have three pregnancies on Maven. Um, and so I, in, in some ways, I just wouldn't know how to do it any other way. Um, I think building, uh, one of the big things you have to look at when you're a founder, particularly entering a complicated market like healthcare is what's your unique kind of insight and what's your unique competitive advantage. And so, you know, given that women and families have been so underserved for so long, I mean, honestly, my unique insight was like, how do we build a better system, particularly for women? Um, and so, uh, and so that's really where 
it, it, you know, we have had a very product focused company um, for a very long time. And so the thinking was, if we can really build a compelling product for consumers, there's probably not going to be as many of them on the platform in the beginning, because this is largely a B2B market from a sales standpoint. If we build, though, an amazing product, that's going to be our competitive advantage when we walk into a benefits team, an employer team, or, or a health plan, and we say, listen, you know, you really should take a bet on us because look at all these engagement metrics, look at all this impact we're having. And so again, it, it takes a while and it took a little bit longer. You know, we were mainly, we sold our first uh, benefits contracts in the, uh, six months after we launched, but they were really small. Yeah. And so the first two years, most of our users were consumer, not coming through the enterprise. Yeah. But it was an, uh, we were able to really just continue to hone the product and, and uniquely craft it to their needs. And, and so then by the time the scale started to hit, you know, we had a pretty unique value prop. So we were one of the first companies, we well, the first company to, and this seems so obvious for any women or, or parents sitting in the room, but to bring postpartum and return to work care as part of the core prenatal care model. And that was just, I mean, that's like obvious need that, that members have. Or, yeah. you know, we were the, one of the first companies, uh, actually, no, again, I think the first to, to bring the fertility journey into, you know, and tie it together with the pregnancy journey. And again, that's just so obvious because that's what's happening in real life. But then when we then we went B two B and we talked about that with the buyers, yeah. you know, we had these insights. But then we had the data to prove it from our products. Got it. Because that's an interesting piece actually in the U S. Because there are obviously your benefits managers, your Mercers, your Willis Towers, Watsons that that help companies think strategically about which benefits they should choose. Were you part of that education for why women's and family health should be part of the conversation? And how did you lead some of that dialogue? Oh yeah, I mean we I think we part of the the go to market in the beginning it was very clear we just had to evangelize the problem. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we were I think al always talking about clinical impact and having a clinical strategy early yeah. on is really important. So, we had a lot of doctors and we had a lot of providers saying, you know, this is critical for outcomes, this model is critical. And so we didn't have them yet, but you know, there was like a, we had a a plan around how to get them and then we would survey our early members um, and and kind of tie it to their, their self-reported data in the app to say, look, directionally, this is going in the right direction. So we always had that kind of clinical impact story. And then we just used a lot of patient stories as well to talk about, hey, I had, you know, I had a baby and then I had nothing to support me after that. Or, right. hey, I, I actually really didn't want to go back to work. You know, in the U.S., um, sadly, we, there's no federally mandated uh, paid leave. And so there are some companies in the U.S. where people have to go back to work after six weeks. Now, what we see from our European um, clients, too, is uh, on the other side, you have 12-month leaves, but that also is really, really hard for women to yep. go back after being at home for, for a year. And so, there, it, you know, it's on both sides uh, an issue. Um, and so, to be able to talk about some of those real patient stories um, really helped evangelize kind of the early days. And so then what, you know, what happens in, in markets, we went from being in a very kind of, we were like the only solution, kind of talking about, you know, this one thing. And then yeah. all of a sudden, all these other companies came into the market, which was great because yeah. they put pressure on the buyer. But then now, you know, the most important thing in a, in a more competitive market like we're in today is it's not, you know, you tell the patient stories, but then bringing it back to the clinical impact and the data, um, it, is really where Maven continues to stand apart. Would you say that those are the key differentiating factors when a company or an insurer, anyone says, you know, why should we work with Maven? Is it really the data? Is there anything else that you use to say this when you think about the whole landscape of women's or family health products? Well, it's both the data, but I think for, particularly for employers, employers are looking for breadth. So they, mm -hmm. employers are really busy and they, they don't want just kind of one point solution. They want, you know, if, if they don't want just a fertility benefit. They right. want a whole kind kind of family care platform. And so I think what, you know, for us too, just following that member and following that consumer in terms of what they want has propelled us in our product roadmap to kind of not just stay in one place. One area. Um, so, you know, in our product roadmap, it's always a trade-off between breadth and depth. Some years we go deep um, to get the clinical data. Other years we go broader. And yep. so um, so that's kind of, I think, also where Maven stands apart. That's a, that's a perfect segue too, to talk just a bit about the platform. You know, when I think about women's and family health broadly, there are so many areas that are underserved and those are global issues and we'll talk about that as well. And Maven is already addressing gaps in parenting and pediatrics and fertility and family planning, et cetera. And earlier this year, you launched the first platform for you in, in menopause. How did you decide 
that menopause was the next product and, and maybe a bit more broadly, how do you decide which areas to invest in and prioritize? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so actually menopause originated, a lot of the, de the global demand originated here in Europe. So really? um, in the UK, I think about a year ago, uh, they had a commission, um, the government did on how menopause shows up in the workplace and how it affects women. And so ever since then, um, a lot of employees at a lot of companies, including our own kind of big multinationals, we're starting to say, okay, if health equity is truly kind of a, a, a value here and DEI is a value, then, you know, we're investing a ton in fertility and, and family building, but what about menopause? And mm. so, um, so for us, I mean, it's obvious, it, there's a clear need and because we have so many OBGYNs on our platform, they've always as well asked us. And so we have a client advisory board and for years we were asking the client advisory board, do you want menopause? Do you want menopause? And that, that just wasn't at the top of the list. And then all of a sudden in Q1, we asked our client advisory board, do you want menopause? And they're like, yes. Um, and it was because a lot of this kind of grassroots demand um, that originated in Europe that then made its way back to kind of, you know, big global benefits teams in the, in the US as well. Um, and so, you know, because we're a technology company and we have a set of core capabilities, um, we, we already had the care delivery. So we already had the, the OBGYNs. Right. We have an in-house content team. We have virtual classes, we had all of that. So we quickly packaged that up. Um, we, we built it in four months and then we actually oh, launched man. it a, a month ago and we already serve wow. over a million lives. Much of it is global. Um, over a hundred of our clients bought it. So it was, it was, you know, healthcare doesn't move that fast. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of an, an amazing, um, an amazing story. And, and we're projecting, you know, m a, a many more clients to adopt it next year. Okay. That's excellent. And you mentioned this is an idea that came from Europe. You're now launching that in the U.S but reverse, Maven's actually focusing quite a lot on expanding its presence outside of the U.S. You have members already in over 175 countries. Can you tell us today a bit more about your global strategy? Sure. So global is just also one of those incredible stories where if I, if I look back at our numbers and our pipeline and our user base, um, in 2020, it was still, I, I think a lot of companies were talking about global, but it was still in its nascent stages. Now, um, you know, over 60% of our clients offer Maven globally. We have some of our big kind of Fortune 50 multinationals um, launching Maven globally. They just, or Microsoft just uh, launched us globally, I think, two months ago, which was incredible. Sure. Incredible, yeah, and, um, and and just the, the demand and the uptake. I mean, we didn't, you know, it was our first Fortune 50 launching globally and we didn't know what it was gonna look like, but we've since now, we have a bunch more launches in a, in a few months. And I think what we're seeing um, globally is, you know, fertility and family building benefits similar to the US have also been left out of care models. And so it's a complex web of laws where it comes to surrogacy and adoption and IVF, you know, everything's changing all the time. Some IVF is supported publicly, others sure. people are going to private clinics. Surrogacy is illegal in some, some countries, so yep. there's medical tourism aspects. And so for a lot of big multinationals and, and you know, who want one team across the globe, you know, they can't really say, okay, we're going to help our U.S. employees build families, but not right. our global. So, um, so we have some enormous launches. Um, you know, we've grown 10x globally in the past uh, 24 months, wow. and we're projecting to grow another 10x in the next 12 months. So we're now, you know, we have local care advocates around the world. We're now hiring a local um, sales team on the ground in the UK. Um, but it is just, it's, it's awesome to see. And it's starting with fertility and family building benefits. But, but then the conversation is more broader. Right. It's broader about parents in the workforce and pregnancy and, you know, health, gender equity at work. And some of our clients in Japan, particularly, um, you know, they, they, they're all in on return to work because they're, they're, they're having, you know, big problems around keeping women in the workforce for us and having senior women. So every country is a little bit different, um, but it, it, it definitely, get, you know, it's, it's really, really exciting to see. Core. And, and you started in London. I mean, you mentioned it yourself. You know, you came up with the idea for Maven in London, not far from where we are now. And then you decided to start the company in the U.S. You know, there are lots of founders here who are probably thinking very carefully about where to build their businesses. How did you make that decision at that time? 
Yeah, so I, it's so great to be back here because some of our best friends live in Europe. Um, many of our amazing angel investors are, are European, Brent Hoberman from First Minute. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, we were in London. My husband and I were like, oh my goodness, um, we love London. Um, however, there were two reasons that we moved. I mean, of course, I'm American, so was able to move very easily from a visa standpoint. But, um, but number one, um, I have three kids today. And so personally, I wanted to, I knew I was going to have kids on this journey. And um, my parents live an hour from me. So my mother is with my children right now, and I'm so grateful. And so I think that is so important, particularly of female founders, um, to make sure if you're going to have kids on this journey that you get that care team around you um, yes. so that, uh, you know, I, I miss my kids, of course, but they're really happy with their grandparents. They're eating more <laughs> sugar than they've had probably in a month. So, um, so anyway, so that's number one. Number two, I think for all founders, um, you know, you have to look at the TAM. And yep. the TAM is really what allows you, I think, to build big businesses. In the U.S., healthcare is nearly 20% of GDP. Yep. It's a multi-trillion dollar market. And so f it was a pretty obvious thing, you know, if product market fit takes a second, if you're operating in a big TAM, you know, you can kind of figure it out. And so, you know, the, and, and also the, the U.S., um, maybe you've seen that the headlines recently, but, um, you know, Roe v. Wade was just overturned. There's always been, I think, challenges to access to women's health care in the U.S. And so wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we started there. But, you know, we signed our first global contracts in 2018, 2019. So actually starting in London has become a big competitive advantage because Excellent. we lean on our investors. We lean on, you know, we, we understand global in a way that um, yep. I think some of our U.S. competitors do not. That's very important. It's something, you know, we're very hands-on with our early stage founders. There's a reason that we're in London and in New York and in Boston and in San Francisco and in Palo Alto. You want to be able to support companies everywhere. And making that decision about when you launch in the U.S. is something that we think about very, very carefully. And, and it sounds like you did the same from quite early on. Um, and bringing you back maybe to your VC roots as well, I mean, you're, you're a very active angel investor. And I know that making time for other women who are building companies is also a huge priority for you, has been for years. What is a frequent piece of advice that you give to early stage founders when they're starting their journey? Yeah, um, well, first of all, you have to really like what you're doing because it's <laughs> really hard. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, probably a Pete, my dad's an entrepreneur. Um, okay. And so it's been amazing to have his kind of coaching and guidance along the way. So some of these the nuggets of wisdom are, are his. But one of the things he said really early on, because I think when you're a seed stage founder, you know, everything is just so heavy and the highs are high and the lows are low. And, um, you know, at one point he was like, you know, nothing and no one is ever as good as you think they are, also not as bad as you think they are. And sure. so I think it's, it's um, you know, riding those highs and lows. And I think the other... The other thing that, that, at least in healthcare, has been so important, but I, I would imagine in every industry, you know, I think one of the, the things about being a founder is that your learning curve has to remain high and you have to remain humble because you're constantly being thrown at things, you know, that you've never seen before. And so for us at Maven, um, I, I'm an ex-journalist, actually, uh, and so I have a, a, a huge network of advisors. We have four board independents, which was really important to me wow. across all these different sectors. And so I kind of say it's like my network of sources. Um, and so when I encounter, and it's you know almost every day, there's some new situation, whether it's a go-to-market question or a product question or a financial question or just kind of a, I mean, a management question. We're, you know, over 500 people now. Um, you know, they're, I'm able to ask them and pick up the phone and call them and text them. And so, um, and, and then of course, having an amazing executive team who, who so every decision I make, yeah. um, usually I have inputs from three to four people who are experts in that field. And, and that has helped me from the very early days until, you know, it continues to help me a lot. Maybe we can talk just a bit about team for a minute as well. I mean, you've been so thoughtful about surrounding yourself with extraordinary people, not only from an advisor perspective, but on your executive team and frankly, among the 500 people at Maven. Is there any secret sauce to that? Any thought about building a team, especially a global one with such a significant strategy? Yeah, I mean, the, the questions around team are, are so, um, you know, there's so many these days because we're in this hybrid work environment now. Yep. Um, I think, though, that for us, um, having values is so important um, and having values that are co-created by your team. And well, so I think some people kind of think, oh, the founder has to create the values and it's this top-down kind of approach. But 
for us, you know, yes, kind of I have a point of view, but I also, you know, we, we just refreshed our values. We refreshed them every two years. I think also hearing from the team, hearing what's most important from them, you know, has, has helped inform them. And so, um, and then as you, as you kind of have values, to be able to lean on them as well. If you're announcing a tough decision or, or there is an issue, you say, well, you know, a, a value of ours, some of Maven values are embrace a service mindset or, you know, continuously learn, keep healthcare human. That's been a Maven value for eight Forever, years. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I, th I think that's really important. And then the other thing um, uh, that, you know, I, I personally look at is uh, on our executive team, but but also our senior leadership team and like the managers of the company that are really leading, you know, the, the charge on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, that, that incredible growth mindset and humility that they have to have. Like, you know, working in healthcare, you have deep expertise in so many people that work in the industry today, sure. but for them to be successful at Maven, and we've had some stories where they haven't been successful, you have to come in with an open mind yep. and you have to be able to say, oh, the way I did something here, I might have to do it a little bit differently. And then same from tech, right? We have a lot of people, we have people from the tech side, and you know, when they come in to Maven 2, the way they did in their old company, we want them to come to Maven to teach us that, but then they need to be open to kind of, you know, doing things in a new way because we're, you know, continuing to create a category. And yep. so, um, so anyway, so I think that that growth mindset and humility is something that we even test for in the interview and hiring process. Beautiful. It's, um, I'm smiling because it's <laughs> something that General Catalyst takes so seriously. We talk about growth mindset all the time. Um, because our business is changing incredibly quickly as well. I mean, look at this environment that we're in, and General Catalyst has been around for over 20 years. So there are many MDs at GC who have seen these cycles, and we're able to help our founders think very carefully about it. But anyone in this industry, be it a founder or an operator or a venture investor, has to think very carefully about growth and change and yes. evolution. And you guys have been doing it for a very long time, and it's heartening to hear. Um, you mentioned this briefly. You, t you mentioned Roe v. Wade, for example. Um, there are many depressing headlines across the world when it comes to women's and family health. For you, at a 10,000-foot overview, are you hopeful? And what do you think it takes for us to actually move women's and family health forward? You know, um, I think founders are always optimistic, right? So <laughs> um, I am hopeful, actually, because I think that... Um, you know, human ingenuity always sees us through, and when bad things happen, I think, you know, Roe v. Wade is just basically an affront to access in healthcare. All the major American medical associations have said this is terrible. Um, you know, nearly one in four women uh, in the U.S. get an abortion by the time they're 45, and you know, sometimes it's for medical reasons, sometimes it's for private reasons, so it truly is just, you know, part of the core care model, and, it, and, and, um, and so I think, though, that in this moment, um, you also, all of the data coming out, the clinical data, the economic data on, on something like this um, is, is very bad, but maybe it's gonna take this to kind of you know, build a better future. And so I, I think I am optimistic because at the highest levels of industry in, um, in America, uh, at least, uh, you know, there are people that are talking about how to change this. So I wish it were being changed tomorrow because people are suffering every single day because of this. But I do think that we're going to get to a, a point where there's going to be consensus um, about, you know, a, a better kind of, you know, system for, for women and families. And, you know, I, w I was just actually reading this essay. Um, it was from the 1950s oh, by, wow. by, by Catherine Ann Porter, this great, Excellent. you know, American writer. And it was right after the atomic bomb was dropped. And it was this horrific time when everyone was kind of questioning the future of humanity and like who we are as a species. Right. But I think her, the whole point was like, but then you figure out that you, you figure out your way out of it and, you know, you take a step back and then you go forward. And so I think all the entrepreneurs here in this room um, I, and, and particularly all the entrepreneurs innovating in women's and family health, I think the cat's out of the bag, yep. Pandora's box has been open and, you know, we together are going to create a much, much better system globally. Beautiful. Beautifully said. Well, thank you for joining us, Kate, for your wisdom, for your candor, and we're energized to see what happens with Maven next globally. Great. And we're so, thank you to General Catalyst for leading the last round. We could not be happier. <laughs> so appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you, Thanks, everybody. everybody. <laughs> Great. Yeah.
Thank you, Kate and Juliet. Next, something clearly many of you have been waiting for. Congrats on making to the front seat, <laughs> gentlemen there. <laughs> so, what is the role of the governments in creating an environment for innovation? In the global tech scene, how has Europe stayed strategically autonomous? These questions will be discussed on stage with Finnish Prime Minister Sanna Marin. Sanna is the youngest Prime Minister in Finland's history. Think about that. Yep. Sanna will be interviewed by Erika Savolainen, the CEO of Slush. Also a long-time slusher. Her first time volunteering was in 2014, and now she's leading the whole show. Wow. So this is Europe government's entrepreneurs. Where should we start? Welcome on stage, Sanna and Erika. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Erika, I'm CEO of Slush, and I'm here with a special guest, so Sanna Marin, the Prime Minister of Finland. Thank you so much for coming here today, Sanna. Thank you so much, Erika. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited that we have this great event, Slush, in Finland that gives opportunity to new startups and also founders, investors to meet and create new things. I'm so excited. Thanks, we're excited as well. So um, we'll be discussing the concept of strategic autonomy uh, in the European context and also um, the role of go governments in creating an uh, environment for innovation. Um, but should we start with uh, sort of a warm-up question? Um, so you, you've been in your position for uh, three years now as a prime minister, and I would guess that the past years haven't looked like exactly you expect that. So, so how would you describe the past few years for, for yourself and for Europe? The past few years has been years of crises. First, when I started as a prime minister in 2019 in December, uh, the COVID pandemic came through and, and swiped the whole world. So it's been filled with crises. COVID, of course, touched everyone's life in many different ways. We have to put many things in our societies. We have to close many things in our societies that we never thought that we would have to do, uh, and the situation was very severe and still is. Mm -hmm. The pandemic hasn't gone anywhere. And after the pandemic, the war came. So Europe is now in war, something that we didn't want to see, but this is the reality, what is happening right now. And then the energy crisis, and now we're looking forward and hopefully not, but it might be that there might be economic crisis as well coming up. So we have lived through many crises, but I think we will still survive these crises and be more stronger uh, afterwards. Yes, um, that is definitely true. Um, you've actually um, recently said that uh, the past few years have proven Europe's uh, ability to act on crises, but also they revealed some vulner vulner vulnerabilities. Uh, so should we set up the scene with this? So what do you specifically mean with the strategic autonomy uh, of Europe? And why is that an important topic to discuss right now? Well, as you mentioned, these big challenges that we have faced has shown us our vulnerabilities. And I think this should be a learning point for Europe and for the whole world, that we should build our own strategic autonomy and our own uh, capabilities when it comes to critical issues. Uh, when the pandemic hit us, we saw how dependent we were on medicine on, or, and uh, also medical uh, applies, uh, from, for example, the imports from Asian countries, especially China. So we were too vulnerable. And at the beginning, that really caused us a lot of trouble. Uh, we didn't have, for example, masks or, or other um, gear that we needed for our healthcare workers and for the people to keep them safe. This was a great vulnerability, and we have to uh, put our 
put up our own production very fast. And actually, we worked in Finland very closely with, with companies to do this. And of course, the same situation was in all of Europe. So that showed that one vulnerability. And now we are in war uh, in, in Europe. And we are seeing how heavily this hits not only Ukraine, but all of Europe because of energy. We are too dependent on Russian energy, and this is causing us a lot of trouble. We should cut these uh, dependencies once and for all, but of course it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. But this shows us a great vulnerability in Europe. And this, of course, has a big uh, economic impact as well. We have to put a lot of money to new investments, especially to renewables and other energy sources right now that we can make sure that we will cope this winter and the upcoming winters. But it costs us a lot of money and we weren't prepared of doing this uh, so fast. And also, one vulnerability is defense capabilities. Uh, we cannot be dependent as European Union uh, the help that we are now receiving, and thank God the United States are so involved in the situation in Ukraine, but we cannot be so dependent on the help uh, of others, United States or, or other countries. We should uh, build up our own capabilities as well and be better partners to the states uh, in, in NATO uh, and otherwise. Uh, and also, uh, we are seeing how the energy crisis influ influence or I impacts uh, food security in the world. So there's another vulnerability there. So if, if I would uh, co collect all the vulnerabilities that we have seen during the crisis, there are the medicines, the medical supplies, uh, vaccines as well, uh, then energy, food, cl clean water, these are vulnerabilities that we have to make sure that we can, in every situation, make sure that our, our uh, citizens have the capabilities to, to access these, uh, these goods and, and necessi necessities uh, that we all need. And then the defense capabilities that we need. Uh, but Another one, and this is a crucial one, and this is something that I really want to discuss today. Uh, it's about the future, mm -hmm. and actually, it's about today. And it's the di digital capabilities, the mm -hmm. technological capabilities that we are depending right now. Our societies are digitalized, and will be even more so in the future. Our societies will be totally digitalized. And if we don't build these capabilities beforehand, right now, and make sure that, that we are investing in new technologies, in digital solutions in Europe, with, uh, together with the public sector and the private sector, then we will create vulnerability that will be a crucial one in the future if there would be a crisis concerning this. So this is something that I want to highlight, the know-how, the knowledge, the techno technological capabilities that we should have, and make sure that we are not making the same mistakes with technology that we have made with energy, that what we have made with medical supplies, and that we have made in many other areas. Yes, um, I think we are in a right place to discuss, especially the technology part, um, right here. Um, so, uh, as you said, um, you want to focus on the future, uh, and I guess that the audience and I as well, we share an optimistic view of the future of Europe. So, uh, what should we focus on next uh, to make sure um, that we don't make the same mistakes uh, on the front of technology? Well, I think the starting point should be that we should be very open. We should be very open and honest to notice what are the mistakes that we have made. If we cannot make this, uh, this knowledge of ourselves, that, that where we, we have made mistakes, then we cannot learn. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have to look at the world, we have to look at the situation and, and say, we made mistake in energy, we are too dependent on Russia, this is causing us a lot of problems and it's causing us a lot of money as well. So that was a mistake. And now we have to learn from it. Now we have to do something else. Now we have to build our own capabilities when it comes to energy production and also make sure that we have all the grid the story technologies uh, and, and that we are working together as European countries. We are grading a new energy market in Europe. So we have to look about the situation very honestly and say, we made mistakes, now we will learn from it, and now we'll do something else. Now we will uh, fix the situation and, and learn from it. So this is the starting point. But I really worry right now that, that not every European country is on the same page with this. I understand that especially to politicians, it might be a bit hard, and also everybody else, it might be a bit hard to say, 
I made a mistake. I thought the situation differently. And for example, when we look at the, si the energy situation uh, in, in about Russia uh, and the connections that Europe and Russia has about energy, there was a logic there. There was a logic why we built these cl close and tight connections with Russia, Germany and others as well. Finland as well. We thought that creating these very close connections, economic connections, energy connections, we would prevent war. It would cost too much. So there wouldn't be a war, there wouldn't be conflicts, because our ties would be so tight uh, in economically and, and also otherwise that it would cost too much. So it was an act of peace. But we didn't notice that the Russian logic don't think like we do. They don't think like we do, and this is something that we should learn. Our Polish friends, our Baltic friends, they were right. They thought and said all along that Russia thinks differently. Their logic is different than ours, and we should have listened to them. But we have to look at the situation now and say, we were wrong, our logic was different, it was logical, but it was different than the Russia's ones, and we should learn about the situation. And I really worry about the, this technology part, because I fear that we are making the same mistakes with technology, with digital solutions, also uh, with uh, all the natural materials that mm -hmm. we need to build these technologies. And I want to make sure and discuss in the European Union and with our democratic partners that we should cooperate more. We should make sure that we have uh, these uh, trading routes and, and all the uh, critical issues uh, solved within the democratic countries, cooperation with, with democratic countries and not be dependent on authoritarian regimes. That logic is very different from us. Yeah. Could you give us an example of a mistake we're about to made, uh, make in, the, in terms of our digital solutions? Uh, about technological yeah. solutions. Well, we are seeing already we have vulnerabilities here. Let's be honest, we have vulnerabilities already. Uh, for example, when we are looking about chips or semiconductors, we are too dependent. We are too dependent on Taiwan. We are too dependent on, on specific sources. So we have to versify. We have to versify these sources. We have to make sure that, that different uh, uh, democratic com com countries, companies uh, are uh, building their capabilities and that they are investing in Europe, that they are investing in the United States, that they are investing in different democratic uh, countries, also in Asia, Japan, South Korea, India, uh, then we were looking at the Indo-Pacific, uh, Australia, New Zealand. We have partners, we have the countries and we have the capabilities, but we have to make sure that we are now investing and we have to invest right now because these capabilities aren't built overnight. It mm -hmm. takes time. If we want to build, for example, um, production facilities for semiconductors, I think that takes about 10 years to be top-notch, so it doesn't happen overnight. And we have to make sure that we are investing now in energy, and we are investing now in new technologies, we are investing now in production, we are investing now in new innovations, because there are also new technologies coming up, such as, or they're not even new now, but, but they are, uh, of course, been building, uh, building right now uh, AI, uh, or, or quantum uh, mechan mechanics, quantum um, uh, technologies. These are the new, new ones, and we have to make sure that we have the capabilities and the know-how and the knowledge uh, to build these technologies and not be dependent on China, not be dependent on, on other uh, countries uh, that have different logic than democratic countries have. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, I don't mean that we should cut all trade or that we should cut all ties, economic ties. I don't mean that. I only mean that we have to make sure that we are, we are not vulnerable, that we are not, that no authoritarian countries could, uh, could blackmail us like mm -hmm. Russia is doing now with energy. We shouldn't put ourselves in that position where authoritarian regimes could blackmail democratic countries by saying that, okay, then we will make sure that you won't get any semiconductors or chips or, or any other crucial uh, 
materials that you need for your economies to work. We shouldn't put ourselves in that position. And that's why it's so important right now to discuss about the European strategic autonomy and also the vulnerabilities and also what we should learn from the crises that we have faced and make sure that we are smarter in the future uh, and that we have these uh, capabilities to face crises. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the audience seems to agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, collaboration on the EU level earlier uh, to make, make all this happen, but I think we uh, often run to the uh, same challenge. So EU, EU is a complex entity, 27 member states. So how do we ensure that we get all of the member states uh, on the same page to work together? Well, this is the million dollar question. <laughs> How can we make sure that, that we as European countries that are different, we have different cultures, we have different backgrounds, we have different languages. How can we make sure that we are on the same page, that we are noticing the situation and how severe it is and making sure that we will make the right decisions right now for the future? This is the million dollar question. But actually, we have already started the discussion just uh, last European Council, we have very good strategic discussion about China and the vulnerabilities that we have. We are not, I will be honest, we are not on the same page yet. We are not on the same page yet. But I was positively surprised how many countries, majority of the countries, saw these vulnerabilities and said that we should make sure that we won't put ourselves in the same position that we have put ourselves with Russia. So I see hope there. I see hope there, but we have to continue discussing about the topic and at the same time make sure that we will work together. It doesn't mean that we would cut economic ties with, for example, China or some other country right now. Of course, with Russia, we should cut all economic ties right now and make sure that they will uh, lose the war and we should get those, those troops out of Ukraine as fast as possible because it's also causing us so much in Ukraine, human lives, but in, uh, elsewhere it will, it's causing us a lot of money. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we would cut all economic ties, for example, with China. But we have to make sure that we are investing. We are investing right now in new technologies, in digital solutions, in green transition, that we will put our money where our mouth is. We are discussing about digital transformation. We are discussing about uh, green transformation. We are discussing these important issues. But we have to make sure but that we are also making the work, that we are also making the smart investments that will help us in the future. And we need cooperation. We need cooperation because it's only smart. It's only smart to cooperate, to work together. For example, Finland, we have a top-notch, top-edge uh, technologies concerning AI or 6G or, or 5G uh, technologies. We have Nokia, for example. Uh, we, are, we have been building our own uh, quantum computer, uh, and, and we have great technologies and great know-how and great knowledge. But we, as a small country of, of only over 5 million people, we are using this much money, so so little, because we are a small country. And Germany, for example, is, is using this much money, or you don't see it on the, on the <laughs> there, I will show it like this. This, this much money, <laughs> Finland this, Germany this, but they are not producing, I would say as Finnish Prime Minister, they are not producing as good quality technologies that Finland is. So we should use those resources together, put our minds together and make sure that together we would create these high, high tech solutions for all the European countries and for all the democratic countries. And we should work with the United States as well and other democratic partners to make sure that we will win the race uh, when it comes to new technologies. And let's be frank. There is a race, there is a competition, there is a geopolitical uh, issue there. There is a race between, for example, China and democratic countries. There is a race between China and United States. And we have to make sure that we are winning. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, um, so uh, to move to a uh, race, uh, we uh, win the race, we need to a uh, environment uh, that allows uh, innovation. So let's move on to the role of governments uh, in creating uh, that uh, environment. So um, 
I'd, I'd like to ask from the perspective of Finland uh, that what, what should we do uh, to create an optimal uh, environment for innovation? Uh, and also, how is that visible in your government's policies right now? Well, actually, this is one of the key issues that we are focusing on. And I'm very proud to say that we have a parliamentary agreement to raise our um, research, development and innovation funding up to 4% of our GDP by 2030. And that is very, very um, uh, inspiring and also very ambitious target for Finland. I, I don't think that there are many countries in the world that are using 4% of GDP to R&D uh, or and innovation. So this is a great target. And we have a parliamentary agreement. So not only the government, but also the opposition shares this goal. And that means that we have uh, the site uh, to the future also for the companies, also for the private sector to invest as well, because we cannot make this ourselves. The government or the states uh, cannot make this uh, ourselves. We need partnership. We need the private sector. We need the companies. We need the businesses. We need, we need um, uh, all the, the key players uh, in the society to work on this target. Uh, and we have worked together also with the private sector. And actually, two-thirds of the money are coming from the private sector. And this is why it's so important that we have this broad political um, understanding, uh, parliamentary understanding about the goal, so that the private sector and the companies can rely that this doesn't shift or change when the government changes, when we have elections. So I think this is one of the things that I'm very proud of, that we have this understanding and that we have a clear target, clear goal. And if European countries would use 4% of our GDPs to research, development and innovation, the European situation would look very different. Then we would win the race. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and I also think that, uh, talking from the perspective of startups, um, we also need dialogue between uh, regulators uh, and the uh, startup ecosystem, uh, as those both uh, function fundamentally differently. Um, so what do you think? How successful are we in that dialogue in Finland? Uh, and how could we improve? Well, I think we could always do better. I think we have, because Finland is a small country, so all the key players know each other. That's, that's a strength that we have. We, we can gather around in, in the same room and actually when I <laughs> go outside and, and be in the public library or in the street or jogging or go to the supermarket or, or whatever, people are always so happy that we live in a country where you can see the prime minister in a public library like everybody else. So we are a small country and we are very down to earth and you can meet the politicians, you can meet the, the CEOs of companies and you can meet all the key players in the society in ordinary atmospheres. So, so we have a good ground for cooperation, for discussing different matters, to know each other. And I think this is a great strength for Finland and also other Nordic countries. Uh, but we could do more. We should do more. And I'm so happy about Schlush uh, as an event because this is one platform that uh, enables and gives the startups that are source of innovation. You are creating new things. That's amazing. So, so this is one platform platform where we can meet, where we can discuss, where we can create uh, new ideas, new innovations. I'm sure that there are many startups here that will meet and actually create something together. You have your own ideas uh, already. You have your own products already. You have your own apps already. But when you meet, when you discuss, you can create something new, something bigger, something more interesting. So I think that when we discuss together, when we meet, when we cooperate, that always creates possibilities for new innovation and for new amazing things. Definitely. Um, I think we have time for fun, uh, one final question. So let's fast forward 10 years. Um, what's your vision uh, for the Finnish uh, and European startup ecosystem? How does it look like and what's its role in the ecosystem? Well, I think I should ask you the question. <laughs> from well. from Slas, what is your vision uh, for the startups? Uh, I would say my vision for the whole society is that that Finland has um, created itself. We are we are still a welfare state, but we are a welfare state that is um, green. 
that is digital, that is um, on the edge of new technologies, that has a lot of possibilities, that is a success story. This is what I want to see as a society. And we need the startups also to make this happen. We need the new innovations, we need the new, new ideas, we need uh, new things in our societies to make sure that we will that we will not only manage and survive, but that we would thrive and that we would succeed as well. And I want to see a, a, a society where every child can become anything, and in a society that is uh, green, that is sustainable also from the climate and environmental perspective. And I think this is also a key issue when we look at our competitiveness. I think the countries that will make this transformation and change earlier will be the ones that will have the best competitiveness also in the world. Yes, that is definitely so. So, thank you, Sanna. This, this has been a really, really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, and I want to once more thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank the audience for joining uh, to hear us today. Uh, and hope you have a good day. Thank you so much, Erika, and thank you that you are here. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. It's lush. Sanna and Erika. That was a really interesting discussion. Definitely. I hope all of you enjoyed that too. Um, next up, uh, Too Good To Go's business model saves meals from restaurants, cafes, and grocery shops where unsold food goes to waste. Hmm. To date, the company has been able to save 170 million meals. That's an insane amount of meals that represents uh, 425 million kilograms of CO2 saved. I Impressive. mean, think about the things we do for the environment here. Absolutely. Mette Lykke, known for her time leading and exiting the fitness and training community Endomondo, moved to become the CEO at Too Good To Go in 2016, only nine months after its founding. So, how can each of us here at Slush make a change and contribute to reducing food waste and creating a better planet? Let's hear more about this. This is Growth for Food, Fighting Food Waste at Scale. Welcome on stage, Mette. everyone. I want to talk about scaling a social impact company, in this case, Too Good To Go. But first a question here. How many of you grew up in a household where your parents would tell you to eat up what was on your plate? Most of you? Yeah. So did I. It's, uh, it's very reasonable advice. Unfortunately, we're not really listening. So almost 40% of all food produced in this world goes to waste, it never makes it to human consumption. Now, this is dumb for many reasons, so I'll, I'll just focus today on, on three of these reasons. First, there's the environmental problem here. Almost 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from food that we waste. Not from food we produce, but from the food we waste alone. Then there's the social aspect. This is the bit of a paradox here. We talk about how can we produce enough food for everyone, when in fact we do produce enough food, and still 870 million people go to bed hungry. That doesn't make any sense. And then last, there's the financial aspect. All this food wasted has a total value of $1.2 trillion on an annual basis. I mean, the founders and, and, and startup people in the room here will go, wow, that's a pretty big time. 
that's like that's a real market that you can tap into, and that's that's also the approach we take, uh, and how how I think about this. At least there is an op an opportunity here to do better. Some of you may be familiar with Project Drawdown, and if not, I, I definitely recommend having a look at it. It's a group of researchers and and very esteemed scientists who've come together and said. We don't have to talk about the climate issue anymore. We get it. We know what's wrong. Instead, they focus on the solutions. What are the top things we need to do to solve climate change? And what they find is, on the consumer side, the number one action we can all take as consumers is to reduce the food that we waste. It's the number one thing we can do. So. Uh, driving, running too good to go here, we think about ourselves as a social impact company fighting food waste. And what does it mean, social impact company? We, we talk a lot about that. Um, but for me, it means that every time we make a euro in revenue, it's because we've done something good. We've saved a meal from going to the bin. So there's real impact in that. But we are definitely not an NGO. We are a company. We've taken in investor money, a, a, good, a good chunk of it. We've raised 150 million uh, euro to date. Uh, and of course, those investors reasonably re expect their money back with a decent return. So we are a company. We have to deliver on market terms. I think sometimes you know, being social impact becomes, makes you a little bit lazy, and you think you're doing so well, so you don't have to think about the company side. I definitely think you have to be very commercial as well to really get to scale. So I'll talk more about that. Our mission is to inspire and empower everyone to fight food waste together. And in this mission statement here, we have Inspire, which is about creating awareness, opening people's eyes around the issue of food waste and why it really is a massive problem. But then the empower part is almost more important because that's really where we give people the tools to actually do something about it. And when we talk about climate change and how we solve this, I, I, I do agree a little bit with the Project Drawdown people that we do get it now, but we need the tools. We need it to become tangible. And at the end of the day, Fixing all of this is really about changing habits. Um, so in my last company, Endomondo, it was about creating this habit of fitness, making it fun, fun enough to do fitness that you will really want to go do it. Today, it's really about creating habits around the way we treat our food, the respect we have for food, and how we, how we work with that. Uh, the app, just very simply, it's a, a marketplace for surplus food. We connect any baker, restaurant, supermarket who have food left by the end of the business day with consumers who come, they pick it up, uh, and they buy it uh, at a discount. Uh, it's pretty simple. Now, if we look at the status of where we are right now, we're in 17 countries uh, with the app. We have a team of roughly 1,100 people, or waste warriors, as we call them. Um, we have on our supply side 128,000 stores, and on the demand side, 67 million users who are saving uh, food from, uh, from all of these stores. So that's, that's what we think about as our, uh, our direct impact. It's relatively tangible. We can measure it by the second. It's about three meals per second now that we help our partners save from the bin. So relatively tangible. And I think, you know, some, some entrepreneurs would probably be happy and say, let's, uh, let's run a successful marketplace and, and let's really keep it at that. Um, but I think back to our mission statement here, I think there is, there is an obligation almost to, to see if we can do more uh, than just operate the marketplace. Um, so we have what we think about as our indirect impact. This is, uh, this is a little bit like, you can think of it as the halo effect we can have on top of our marketplace. If we can change perceptions around food, if we can use the marketplace to, uh, to inspire people to think differently about whatever leftovers you have in your fridge, to sort it better, to think about your shopping, then we can have a much bigger impact when we also have 67 million users on our platform. So I'll give an example here of, of how that can materialize. Um, and that has to do with date labeling. So just very short, there are two types of date labeling uh, in most countries. The, we have use by dates and we have best before dates. Big difference between the two. 
use by date. That's the date you actually want to respect. There's a safety hazard if you eat a product after that date. Best before really means often good after. It means you should look, smell, taste, and not waste. You should basically use your senses to figure out if you want to eat it or not. So a pretty simple um, thing we came across was that half of all consumers in Europe don't understand shit <laughs> about this. I mean, we, most people will just say it's, it's probably the same thing. So to be on the safe side, I'm going to throw away the product. When we learned about this, we basically decided to see if we could help do something about it. So we teamed up with uh, some of the biggest food producers in the world, including Unilever, Danone, and Nestle, and basically uh, partnered up with them to have them improve the labeling on their products. Uh, so we've rolled this out now in 13 countries, and uh, something similar to this label here is now on more than a billion uh, products out there, and really trying to educate consumers when you are sitting there at your kitchen table and, and you're watching the products and, and taking these decisions. So just one example of how uh, we can be able to actually have more impact uh, than the commercial side. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we got here. So what, we, what you have on the, on the chart here is really how many meals we've saved since the beginning uh, of our funding, founding. Uh, and you can also see here how we've uh, launched uh, qu quite a few countries along the way. And I think one of the, one of the things I love about growing companies uh, is that it never gets boring. Uh, but one of the things that I then find tough sometimes about growing companies is that it never gets boring, too. Uh, so, so you really have to, uh, you have to grow with, with the company. And for me, it's helpful to think about it in, in different phases. Uh, so first phase for us was really proving the concept, figuring out, is there actually a market for this? It's great that it has a good cause, but is there a real market for this or not? Then we spent, uh, we basically said in 2017, uh, that we had been growing way too fast. We were already at this point in, in 10 countries, more than you can see here. We were already in 10 countries after just a year in operation. Uh, and it was a little bit mad, making the same mistakes in all 10 countries. We didn't have a playbook. We didn't know how to open a country. We didn't know how to run it either. So really, same mistakes all over. So we said, end of 16, time out. We're going to slow down so that we can speed up later going to shut down four markets. We're going to change the entire setup from a franchise-like model to one where it's all one big company. Well, not one big company at that time. One company, I should say. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to take a full year with no new countries, but where we just really focus on the foundation. So what are the, the tools that we're going to need? What are the processes that we need to succeed? And how do we set the right team needed to really uh, make this grow? So we spent more than a year on this. And, and at that time, that, that was a little bit nerve wracking because I think your instinct when you're in the early phases is just faster, faster, go, go, go. But sometimes I do think you have to step back a little bit and slow down so you can speed up. Then early 18, we were ready to grow again. Uh, but having global ambitions, we wanted to figure out how do we actually open new markets. So we opened up two relatively comparable countries, Netherlands and Belgium, almost at the same time, but in, in two very, very different ways. And, and that was our A-B test to figure out how do you successfully launch a market. So we did that and sat back a little bit and watched as, uh, as those two countries developed very differently. Then we took the best learnings from both of those launches and used that to then create the playbook that we then used for the Spanish launch and for, for all the launches uh, we've had since then. And this was really our expand fast uh, phase here, where we were roughly opening a country a quarter uh, during this period. And we had a real party with it until uh, March 2020, when, uh, when COVID hit. Uh, it may not look like much on the chart here. You can see it right below uh, Portugal there. It, it may not look like much here when you look at it uh, in the perspective now. But back then, when COVID hit, 
Um, the vast majority of our partners were forced to shut down, and when the kitchen is closed, obviously there's no food to, to save either. Uh, so we lost 60% of our revenue over 10 days. Uh, uh, which was a good uh, educational experience um, uh, as, a, as a leader. Um, and then from there, we basically uh, decided to try and keep everyone on the team and then raise the money we would need uh, to succeed with that. Obviously, we couldn't uh, get any, any funding from, uh, from outside, so our current investors uh, decided to, uh, to chip in and, uh, and help us execute on that plan. It was a fairly aggressive plan, but that also meant that five months later, we were back to where we came from, and then we've been growing uh, rapidly uh, since then. Then, about a year ago, we started this phase that we call uh, growing efficiently. Um, and we started this because when we, uh, when we entered this year, I think probably like many of you, we were quite optimistic about the future. Everything looked great, things were flying. Um, and we were, uh, we were out to raise capital, started that process in January. Uh, it, it was all going really well. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, close anything by the end of April. And during April, when all the, when all the tech um, companies uh, on, the, on, the, on the stock exchange really developed really poorly, of course, the whole market changed as well. So we decided. We decided back in May that this journey we had started towards growing more efficiently, would have to, we would have to speed that up significantly, and basically we wanted to be profitable by the end of this year. So within five or six months from, uh, from that time. Um, so that's what we call independence here. Uh, it's actually worked really well for our team to talk about profitability as independence and not as profitability. I don't know if it's because we're a social impact company or not, but it's, I think it's a lot easier to rally people around independence idea, because for me that is also what profitability means. It does mean that we are independent of external investors. We'll take in money when we need it, but now we actually have options. We wanted to have that optionality where we can say, you know what, we don't like these terms, or we don't like this match, or you know, we're just going to do our own thing. So really rallying the team about independence has, um, has been pretty big for us. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why I like to think about these phases and be quite strategic around them is that it really helps on the leadership side as well. Because each phase here will have different characteristics, you will have different objectives, you will also have different leadership requirements. And that goes for yourself as leaders, it probably also goes for the team that you have around you. It's not to say that you change your team in every phase, but I think you have to be intentional around what is it that it's going to require from a leadership perspective to deliver on this and uh, the profiles I have on board, are they the right ones? Do we need to make changes? Do we need to add something? And so on. Um, so we are, gonna, we are gonna hit profitability this year. It's, I mean, and for the first time ever, it's not a flag. We keep moving and now it's in 12 months or now it's in six months. We are actually gonna make it uh, this month, uh, which uh, feels really, really nice, but also, it leads to the very obvious question, what's next? What do you, what do you want to do with that uh, after? Because this was really something that has been on our minds for a while here. And when we think about the future here, it's really impact at scale. Uh, now we have a position where we can actually look at going from being a marketplace only to being a one-stop shop for our partners, in particular our supermarkets. We just announced the acquisition of a French company this week uh, towards this. Uh, and we can also expand into new geographies. So just summing up a few things here for, for those of you uh, who would love to make a difference as entrepreneurs. First, choose a real problem. We have enough photo filters and ad companies and shit out there. So I think if you have the drive and the talent, please choose something that will leave a good mark. Just make the world a little bit better if you have the option. Uh, start small, find the product market fit, goes for all companies, but think big about your impact once you see that. And don't just think about your direct impact, think about the indirect side too. Can you build a halo on top? 
And then last, don't be fooled here, uh, social impact is, is hot, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can get lazy. You have to still deliver on all the same metrics every other company needs to deliver on, or you definitely won't be able to raise a dime. So, um, so that's my advice. Go out there and, uh, and start better companies. Thanks a lot. Ready. Yeah, thank you, Mette, so much for that talk. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Mette. Revolut has grown to become one of Europe's most valuable private companies. Revolut has not only been ex able to expand incredibly fast in Europe, but also has established its foothold in the US and also in Asia. Nick Starnsky, Revolut's co-founder and CEO, has led the company from the founding team to the over 5,000 employees they have today. Prior to launching Revolut, Nick worked as an equity trader. John Duran is a general partner at TCV, who helped set up and launch TCV's London office in 2012. He focuses on investments in software, internet, and fintech companies. John's current investments include Believe, Brax, DreamSports, Klarna, and Relex, to name a few. Nice. This is from two to 5,000, Revolut's road to global expansion. Welcome on stage, Nick and John. Wow, it's great to be here. Um, my first slush, I've heard a lot about slush over the years, and uh, the energy is really great. So thank you, uh, everybody, for organizing this. For, for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Doran. I'm a partner at TCV, based in London. Uh, TCV is a global investment firm. We've been backing iconic technology companies for the last 27 years. Companies like Spotify, Netflix, Twilio, Salonis, and right here in Finland, uh, Relex. Uh, and I'm, here today, I'm delighted to be here today to talk to another one, uh, Revolut. Um, great to be here with you, Nick. Um, maybe before we start, I'll give you a quick story. I, uh, I first heard about Revolut when I was, at ho I was on holiday in Ireland uh, visiting my parents. And I was at this kind of small cafe in the middle of nowhere. And I saw these people using their uh, purple Revolut card. And I asked the cashier, what is this? And she was like, oh, that's, that's the new thing. That's Revolut. Everybody has that. And uh, very quickly after that, I got in touch with Nick, uh, got to know each other pretty well. And uh, you know, here we are today. We're investors in the company and delighted, delighted about that. Maybe as a starting point, um, I just want to say congratulate Nick. Uh, I know people saw the press release today, uh, 25 million customers. That's pretty amazing. Um, I Remember, I think it was in July, we announced uh, tw 20 million. So that's 5 million customers in four months. And I think it took four years to get to the first um, 5 million. So incredible momentum and clearly accelerating. So congratulations on that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. It's hard to imagine people here don't know what Revolut does or is, but um, it's a pretty tech savvy crowd. But for those who don't, Nick, do you want to just give a quick background on, on Revolut and what your mission is? Sure. So uh, I started Revolut in 2015, and the initiative was my uh, personal problem. So I used to travel a lot, and I, I was expat living in London. So I, I sent money abroad a lot as well. And I was always amazed uh, how much fees I paid to banks um, and to, to exchange currency as well. So initially, I launched Revolut as a, a simple uh, FX card which allowed you to save money when you travel. So you saved uh, about $50 for each $1,000 that you spent. So I started uh, 
started the company, we got our first 500 customers, and you know, we raised our first uh, seed round. And at later stages, I encountered similar problems in other financial services. For example, stock trading, crypto trading, uh, insurance, business bank accounts. And slowly we added uh, all, all these services to, uh, to Revolut. So Revolut is now a digital bank, a super app, how we call it, which, uh, which is live in 39 uh, countries um, with uh, 25 million customers, several hundred thousand are business customers, uh, growing very fast, uh, seven years old now. They're pretty staggering numbers, right? You, you mentioned just there, 25 million customers. I think you said 330 million transactions per month. I think there's a thousand businesses in Finland alone now using um, Revolut Business. I think you're adding about 2,000 businesses a week globally. So pretty amazing. Um, can you tell us how you got here? What have been the kind of key lessons? Seven years is an incredibly short time to build such a big business. What are the kind of key things you can talk about? Key lessons? I mean, there are many of them. Uh, the main one is, uh, well, not the main one, but one of, one of the important ones uh, applicable to every startup or every business is the quality of people that you have. I think, you know, people always talk about quality of people, uh, but it's still so important. I would say it's 90 to 95% importance in success of businesses, quality of people that you have. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, one of the consistencies we see across all the technology companies that we work with, and even in our own organization, is that great people solve, solve problems, right, and kind of can help you build. Um, one of the things that I think differentiates or differentiated Revolut from the first day was that you built a business, or you had the ambition at least to build a business that was international, multi-geo from day one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges of doing that? It's not easy. Most, I think most people, if you're giving advice to startups here, would say try to solve you know, the problem you're facing in one country first. Uh, you guys didn't do that. Can you tell us a little bit about the thinking behind that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, uh, so when, when I remember all these conversations with uh, especially VCs, no one believed in the product. And then when I showed the app where you can simultaneously spend money with the can and also send money, everyone was thinking uh, I'm crazy and no one is going to use it. Because uh, uh, for people, uh, putting two things together was kind of counterintuitive back then. Uh, and then it took actually a lot of time to raise first seed round because not a single investor believed um, in the product. So that's one thing that I've done, you know, which is counterintuitive. I, I didn't really focus on uh, one product, and then we started with uh, two. And another big thing is, uh, so we started uh, working on launching simultaneously in many countries, UK and Europe. Again, everyone was telling me that, OK, you are too unfocused. You know, you, you'd rather focus on one country, conquer the country, and then you know, move on. I mean, luckily, I didn't do it because um, from infrastructure point of view, uh, to build multi-currency, multi-country, uh, multi-regulation product is, uh, is easier from start. Uh, because if you just do it one country, then you want to expand into second country. You need to change a lot of backend. Um, you need to change uh, regulatory process as well. It's actually uh, um, easier to start uh, multi-country, multi-product. Easier to go multi-country, multi-product day one. Uh, long term is easier, yes, I do believe. What's been harder, the going multi-country, is it the getting the people, systems, and processes right, or getting the product piece right? I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, in terms of people and process and product as well, because uh, if you think about countries, uh, every country has uh, its own uh, regulatory regime. So onboarding, uh, slightly different for each country. Transactional monitoring, slightly different. All these uh, nuances uh, regarding uh, compliance, fin crime risk can be you know, quite, quite different. So to build it properly uh, takes time. And uh, you really need to build it uh, in a modularized way when you switch on and off different components. Uh, and uh, as a result, your system can be uh, flexible enough to cover as many countries' regulations as possible. Got it. So it sounds like you, you, you think it's easier to do it day one. So you, you see that competitive mode being multi-country, multi multi multi-geo, sustainable. You're not seeing anybody. Are you seeing your competitors being able to kind of copy that? Or is this, how sustainable is that mode in your view? Uh, well, if, if you look at uh, history, so I think you know, the most successful banks uh, that achieved it was uh, Citigroup and JP Morgan. I think Citigroup 
there were some point on uh, 60 countries plus, then now they retreated to 40, 30 countries. Uh, reality is very difficult to do. So the way uh, old banks expanded, they simply bought new banks in, uh, in other countries. But as a result, the systems were different. They need to integrate systems. Systems didn't really work with each other. As a result, they had a lot of compliance problems, money laundering problems. And as a result, they gave up, and then they uh, retreated from, from a lot of countries. Uh, our approach is different. We, uh, we build a soft, right? We're not building a bank. And then software should be uh, as modular rights and flexible as possible to cover as many regulatory use cases as, uh, as possible. So the result is one system we do not really need to integrate with every new system when we go to a new country. But still, because regulation is so uh, wide, um, it takes time to launch a country. Got it. Um, you've had great success in some countries. I think the penetration in my home country, Ireland, is more than any other bank today after you know, five, six, seven years started. Pretty amazing. I think the UK, also incredible penetration. Why have, you been so, why have you been more successful in some and not in others? And are there countries you're not going to enter because of what, you know, incumbents or other reasons? I mean, some countries' banks are shittier than in others, I mean, as simple as that. But in Ireland, banks are terrible. As a result, we, we got 60% of market share very fast. Some countries' banks are better, so it takes uh, a slower speed for us. But uh, overall, we're probably top three uh, digital banking provider in every single country in Europe. And then many, in many countries, we are num number one, uh, such as UK or Ireland. Top three in every country in Europe. Yeah. And that's based on number of users or? Just based on their uh, up any downloads, up any activities. Got it. OK. And where, what are the next kind of, can you give us a preview of the next countries you're going into? It feels like the pace is picking up. Uh, so we are working on launching Latin America. So we're working on Mexico and Brazil. Uh, we're launching India as well. Uh, we started working on the uh, Philippines. Will it be the same product there, or are you thinking in some countries you might have a full banking license, you know, full, full offering, other countries you might be more payments oriented? How are you thinking about that? Uh, it depends. So it depends what kind of license we can uh, get quickly, but usually we start with, uh, with a bank account and payments product. Uh, once launched, we are adding uh, stock trading, crypto trading, and other products that we have. Got it. Um, we have a lot of founders in the audience who I think uh, are either building B2C and B2B. I think what's unique about Revolut is you have 25 million customers, hundreds of thousands of businesses. So you've kind of gone down the path of building both. What has been the, the, your, different, your experience doing that? Has it been easier on the B2C side or the B2B side? How do you think about the trade-offs? Uh, in terms of product, B2B is definitely much more difficult uh, because uh, there are so many, uh, so many use cases that you need to cover. Uh, plus, complexity of onboarding is business is much, uh, much harder compared to to retail account. Retail account is very simple. Okay, a person takes a selfie, submits documents, uh, but then when you onboard business, there are different corporate structures. Company can be based in multiple countries. Company can own other companies. Uh, so it's it's hard. It's much harder. Got it. Um, I want to shift focus a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that a lot of CEOs are focused on these days is leadership. There's a lot of focus on that around. Uh, we've seen, you know, especially what's happened in the, um, in the press in recent weeks. Can you talk a little bit about your leadership style? Um, leadership style? Well, le leadership style and how it's grown over the years? Style. Uh, we are very flat. Uh, so I prefer to, to, to have as many direct reports as, uh, as possible. So there's communication uh, feel, uh, flows freely through the company. Then, uh, so the way it works, uh, because I'm already in business for, for, for many years, uh, I managed to um, create a great team of very capable people who are uh, autonomous and then self-sufficient. So they, they select the right goals themselves, and then they execute in order to, to reach these goals themselves. And I'm more like, a, I would say, a coach. And because I speak with so many people, sometimes I change uh, their direction a bit to ensure they achieve their goals in the most uh, effective way. So uh, in short, I prefer to be as flat as possible and then to have uh, my direct reports uh, as smart, as, as self-sufficient self as possible. Got it. So much surprising for me to hear that, actually. I would have thought you were really, um, in the early days at least, really in the micro. But it sounds like you're empowering 
your team more? Is that has that been a change, or has that always been the case? No, I'm still in the micro details, but because my yeah. direct reports uh, they they are so good, uh, my involvement is uh, uh, not as necessary because they know details themselves. But knowing details is super important. A lot of managers, especially coming from big corporate fat jobs, they're just uh, managing, uh, being hands off. Uh, for them. Uh, being hands-off means they're not into details. I think uh, being in details is super important because uh, the value of the manager is uh, very simple. They A, need to show direction, and B, change direction uh, if direction is wrong, and also observe quality of execution. If, if you don't know details, then it's impossible to show the right direction, that's number one, and then impossible to evaluate uh, quality of execution as well. So as a result, a manager who doesn't know details is uh, you simply paying them for nothing. Got it. Um, you've been incredibly successful. What are the kind of two or three traits that you think you admire in yourself that have kind of gotten you here? Uh, I think for entrepreneurs, it's very important to be uh, uh, great problem solvers uh, based on their logic, based on the first principles, not rely on assumptions or on experience, just going, diving to uh, two plus two equals four level, right? If there is some co complex concept that you cannot uh, explain yourself uh, down to the level of 2 plus 2 equals 4, then it means you don't understand something. And I see a lot of people, they just rely on their experience or rely on other people. Uh, but that's uh, not a good approach. I think you know, for entrepreneurs, it's super important to, to be as deep as possible um, on the binary level, 1 and 0. It's number one. Uh, and number two, I think character is also very important. Uh, being competitive, uh, uh, being uh, driven, uh, being always uh, hungry for success. Because the reality is it's super hard to build a company, and uh, you'll have a lot of uh, failures and a lot of setbacks. So having uh, a character and ability to uh, stand up you know, when, when something happens, um, and uh, having ability to problem solve, uh, to, to find in the right direction and execute in the right direction is super important. It's a good list. So quantitative, highly quantitative, highly resilient, competitive yeah. problem solver. Is it the same for, the team, for your team as well? Is that, are they the traits you look for, or is there other things you look for when you're hiring people? Yeah, we, we, with time, because we obviously hire thousands and thousands of people, I probably interviewed myself about 10,000 people. Uh, so with time, uh, we, we build a pretty robust system how we hire. So obviously, you need to assess the skill, skill set of a person who you hire, whether it's designer, developer, product person. But I think you know, more important is uh, assessing problem solving. So every single person that we hire, they are smart people. And it's super important to hire smart people because things change, uh, industries change. And then if, if, if people don't have this first principle thinking ability, when things change, they are not able to, to catch it. So super smart people is very important. And then uh, secondly, what is important uh, is uh, uh, we call it barriers interview or high achievers. So we are really looking at the uh, track record of every person that we're interviewing, what they achieved compared to their peer group starting from university. And then the reality is that past performance is uh, a clear indication of future result statistically. So if a person used to be a high achiever in university, then in, in their first job, second job, third job, uh, most likely they will achieve a lot in, uh, in your company as well. So that's, that's another important point. And then on top of it, you obviously interview for, for skills. We've talked a little bit about it around the topic, I guess, just now. And I think there's been a lot of commentary in the press over the years. How would you describe the culture of Revolut today and how, how has that evolved? I know you guys have been very focused on the quantitative side of measuring that, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, culture, I mean, best is described is that we are, we are like a professional uh, sports team, right? So what it means in practice, uh, you are as good as you score. Uh, and then, you know, no one will stay in the team forever because, you know, obviously, you know, there are more people, more competition, uh, more tournaments, and everyone understands it and uh, accepts it. So we're really uh, targeting uh, hiring these uh, uh, elite athletes, right, who, who are prepared to, to work in a competitive environment and who who want to win, who want to be uh, number one. And obviously, it's a, uh, it's a competitive pressure. And uh, people, uh, to be the team, they, they accept it. But as a result, uh, being in the team means that you learn from the best really fast. 
and then you uplift yourself as an individual, which is huge. Plus, on top of it, you know, having uh, such a brand as a Revolut uh, on your CV, plus our training, uh, plus our kind of you know know-how to run a business is super super important for every person. I love the analogy of the professional sports team. Um, you've also got, I think, a, an ownership mentality of Revolut. I, th I think it's well known that every employee has shares in the company. Um, we don't see that every day. Um, I think there's, you know, there's philosophies on both sides uh, of that. What's, what's your view been? Has that been the case since day one? Uh, how, would you recommend that to other startups? Yeah, so, so for, from day one, uh, I have this philosophy of, uh, that everyone should be an ownership of the company. So when we hired people, we gave them sign-up bonuses and shares, and then we also paid uh, uh, like performance bonuses and shares. So what, what I observed with time, especially early days, uh, uh, people didn't really understand the concept of uh, options in the company. But now I think you know, it's more and more common in Europe. But US, uh, from day one, all, all, all people appreciated options. I see we're just running up on time. Um, before we go, what is the most, um, can you share with the audience, I guess, what is the most important thing you're working on at Revolut now, um, and how are you making it happen? I mean, the reality is, uh, no matter how s smart uh, my team is and you know, how, how, how much we believe in any important things, uh, reality is always different. So we, we prefer to, to work in the way when we do new bets. Uh, we, uh, at the moment, we're trying to do like 10, 15 new bets uh, simultaneously. And uh, based on my experience, uh, no matter how I believe in you know, one of them, I'm always wrong. So I just you know, prefer to, to run a portfolio of bets, and hopefully two, three, five of them will work out. How long do you give a bet before you decide it's working or not? So we have clear timelines. So we, fr from the time when we decided to, to launch a new product to uh, execution is usually nine to 12 months. Uh, but nine, 12 nine months. to 12 months to launch the product. Uh, then in terms of finding a product market fit, it's another six to nine months. If there is no product market fit, we, we, we just stop working on it. Then if there is product market fit, then we need to, uh, to have at least 10, 20% growth uh, month on month on kind of you know, user metrics, gross profit metrics. And then when a, when a new bet reaches, uh, say, $1 million uh, gross profit a month uh, revenue, then uh, we pump more resources into it, and then we hire more people. Uh, and then we have certain KPIs on, on gross profit uh, and revenues that we want to reach year after year. Got it. So you've got incredible processes in place, right? And success so far has been fantastic. If we do a pre-mortem, right? So we're sitting here five years from now, and you've not achieved your ambition for the business, for success, that you think is ahead of you. What do you think is well, the reason for that? Uh, well, I, I see it again and again, you know, just company and teams, they're becoming, uh, I would say, settled, right? Not as uh, ambitious, not as aggressive or as before. Slowing down, you know, happy with uh, what they have. And uh, it's always, you know, the beginning of the end, and uh, you see it again and again. And then if you look, for example, at S&P 500 companies, the like company on average stays is in the S&P 500 for what, for eight, 10 years, maybe 15 years. And uh, that's, that's reality. I think you know, one of the most uh, common reasons why uh, a company uh, loses success is just people within becoming too, too settled. So the thing, you know, if we don't achieve what we want to achieve in five Never years settled. time, we, 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 yeah, we, we are the, too settled, yeah. That's the company logo. Maybe to, to round off, um, some advice for founders here. You know, one of the things that I see week to week with you is just the, level, the intensity level never drops, right? It's seven years in. Um, you've been in it for years. You appear as fresh as ever. How do you, how do you manage to do that? How do, you, how do you refresh yourself such that you're, you're, you avoid burnout? What advice would you have for founders here on that front? Uh, I think advice is actually you also need to uh, manage your bet properly, right? Because if, if something doesn't work for a long time, you'd rather stop doing it and then switch to something else. Uh, that's super important. I, I see a lot of people who are burnt out, uh, stuck to products that don't work out. For me, personally, I mentioned that if, if, a, if a bet doesn't work out, I mean, like, stop doing it, you know, find, find something else. Also, just you need to be as flexible as possible. Um, 
uh, this one, and then uh, when you really find something that works out, uh, there is a product market fit, then uh, obviously you need to have a lot of energies uh, to, to execute. And then people have energy from different things. I mean, I personally uh, do a lot of sports. Uh, I try to get out for a week, uh, switch off, go kite surfing, windsurfing, hiking, climbing. Um, so I, uh, I get a lot of energy from kind of you know, sports nature. Uh, some people might prefer you know, other things, but that's, that, that works for me. Great. Is that something maybe when you were first starting, the first year or two, you had time for? Or did, you, did you make time for that? Or is it something uh, you, you need to, for? right? Because uh, otherwise, if you don't do it, your energy goes down, and then you're not as sharp, uh, and then you make wrong decisions. So you really need to keep your energy very high all the time. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Really appreciate you uh, coming on today. And congrats again on 25 million customers. Incredible milestone. And wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much, Nick and John. During the past two years, we've undergone a historic restructuring of the way we work. After all, who would have thought that the backbone of the modern organization could be scrapped overnight? Mm -hmm. Two years later, we know that distributed work doesn't just work. Done right, it allows to build better cultures, give an un unprecedented level of freedom to our employees, and hire the best talent globally. It's yes. really amazing the change that we've, been, we've gone through. Absolutely. Leaders from two exceptional startups, Alex Buasis, co-founder and CEO of Deal, the automated international compliance and payment platform, and Quinn Slack, CEO and co-founder of Sourcegraph the code intelligence platform. We'll join the stage to explore why and how their companies continue to embrace the work from wherever. The conversation will be led by Katie Roof from Bloomberg. Katie is a reporter for Bloomberg's reporting on tech finance, including pre-IPO fundings and exits like IPOs and M&A. I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, this is remotely better than before. Welcome on stage, Alex, Quinn, and Kate. to be here in, in Helsinki. Um, you guys are here in person, but our conversation is about remote work and people um, communicating um, with their bosses and, and remotely. So um, we were talking a little bit this, about this on the call the other day um, and about how things have shifted a little bit. Um, maybe last year uh, people were, a couple years ago obviously people were you know, fully gung-ho about working remote, but now we're seeing a little bit of a change. What are you seeing? Are you finding some people want to go back to the office now? Well, I don't think remote was ever the right thing for 100% of people out there. Nothing is right for 100%. I think 40% of the people, they like remote. 40% they like to be in the office. Now they can do that. And 20%, they'll go to whatever company appeals to them and they don't really care as much. So. It's that 40% that you know, we as an all-remote company are going after. What about you? I mean, your business kind of revolves around people being remote, right? You can um, yeah, you sign I up employees internationally. <laughs> yeah, I do agree with that a little bit. You know, I think uh, you know, what we do is we help companies globally hire and globally expand, right? So I think post-pandemic, there's definitely some people that feel the need to actually go back to the office because they feel like they'll have more control over that. And hopefully the tools that we're building will help even more people feel the trust in their team. But I think it's a matter of finding the right balance. And um, you know, going back to the office, like Quinn said, is a matter of like the founder, the culture of the company. And I think what we'll end up having is a mix of different companies having the right setups for themselves. Right? Flexibility is going to be a big thing over the next few years. 
And so, um, are you finding that there's there's a geographic difference between attitudes towards remote work? I mean, I guess since you have, you know, so many international clients, mm -hmm. maybe you have some visibility into that. Uh, I don't think we see geographic differences. I think we see vertical differences. So if you look at like larger banks, for example, you know, they feel the need to have people in the office, while startups are a bit more. Uh, you know, flexible on that front, but I think it's uh, what's going to happen. The way we see it is most companies understand that they need to adapt to the world of today, right? Like you can't force people to go into the office. It's not as efficient. It's not about a nine to five, uh, like nine to five anymore. It's about building a structure that is focused on the outputs of your team. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's it's really not been about geography, right? Because you have companies like Queens in the U.S. that are fully distributed and let people work from wherever they want. It's always it's been for us about the larger companies, the ones that feel unsafe about their workers, not their teams, you know, not actually being working when they're at home. That's the main issue we've seen from most companies. And those big banks, they're so big <laughs> that they have so many different locations. So any employee at one of these big companies is remote with respect to most of the people at their company. So even if they're in an office, they might be working with 5% of the employees at their company. I, I love it when people like force you in the office. And you know the main thing I love to tell them is like, well, when you have an, uh, a building with 10 floors, you're probably not seeing each other anyway. So what really is the difference there? I, I do get that there's some roles that like need to be in office, right? And need to be next to like the trader or things like that. But in general, the way we've been thinking about helping companies go global and helping companies like embrace the right flexibility for their team is just understanding their needs. And I think it, there will be some form of clawback over the next few months or the next few years, but it'll go back eventually to just being more flexible. And so you mentioned that you're hearing that you know maybe 40% want to be in person, or 40, uh, you had a breakdown of different um, needs for different people. So how do you reconcile those differences? You know, maybe some people want to be home, but their team wants them in. How do you how do you navigate that? Yeah, well, you find people that like doing whatever your company is doing. So we're all remote, and we build tools for developers. You know, we, we um, have code intelligence, and I'm a dev, and I know that the times as a dev when I was coding, when I was most productive, is when I could get in this total flow state and no interruptions whatsoever for like eight or 12 hours. That's when devs are most productive. So I know that, and that's why I wanted to build a company that was all remote too. There's a lot of other devs that feel that way, but there's a lot of devs that don't want that, and they're not going to lie in the interview process. No one's going to interview with a company that works in a completely different way from how they want. So I think you just got to be upfront about the way that you work. We have this public handbook. We're inspired by GitLab in that. We talk about how we work and what it means to be all remote and how there's freedom and how we're async, and then we find those people that want that. And if they don't want that, then I don't think they're even going to come and talk to us. Yeah, we've, we found a good middle point for us. We basically, you know, we actually announced that recently. We did a pretty big partnership with WeWork where what we do is we give global memberships to every single one of our uh, employees, our internal team. And what they can do is they can go to the office to any WeWork whenever they want around the world. And what we've seen is there's like clusters of people within geolocation. So for context, we're about 1,800 people. So you have like the London office, and I think there's a couple of people from there that would just say, hey, I'm going to the Covent Garden WeWork today. And then suddenly you'd have 30 people from Dill going to that, uh, that WeWork. So there's a good balance between like, when does it make sense to have a separation from home and to the office, and when do you want to go there? And you just need to build the right infrastructure to support your team on how to do it. And so um, are you finding that sometimes companies are listing jobs by time zone now instead of by location? I heard that that might be, become a trend. We try to. At least on the PNN side, on the product and engineering side, we try to have like, so we built in a way that we have like micro teams, engineers and product managers. We try to put them on the same time zone just because it's easier for them to, to work. I know you're a big fan of async. It's a little harder yeah. for us, but like maybe that's an interesting perspective as well, right? Yeah. I, we hire without respect to time zone. We don't try to get teams that are all in the same time zone. And that's because we feel it's important, even if you're in the same time zone, to have a working culture that supports being asynchronous. And that, again, means if you're working async, then when you need to get a lot of work done, you can get in flow. You have all the context you need. You don't need to bug someone else or wait on someone else for all the information. If you make it so that people have the context that they can work, that's what it means to be async. And then you can have people from any time zone. I wish I could work like that. 
I don't manage. It seems yeah. too hard for me. Like, there's so many things happening at the same time. It's like, uh, I, I think there's some roles that work better async, right? Like engineering works really well. Yeah. But like for us, customer support or sales, no way they can go async. Like they have to be in the time zone of the customers all the time. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, async is not perfect. But you also got to balance it against if you're async and you hire in any time zone, you can find the best people in the world no matter where they live. And not all the best people live in the Bay Area or in Finland or whatever. So it's all a trade off. So do you do anything to help employees bond? Because you know, sometimes if people are only communicating over Slack, maybe tone can be misinterpreted and what have you. So how do, how do you make sure your employees get to know each other? Yeah, so we went all remote right before COVID. So we so before it was cool. Before it was cool. About a month before <laughs> it was cool. And everyone at the time was like, you're making a huge mistake. And then we looked like geniuses about a month later. And uh, I think a lot of people got a, the wrong idea of what it means to be all remote in COVID. Everyone was forced to be all remote. And everyone was essentially antisocial. You couldn't actually meet people in person. Now, we did not go all remote because we're antisocial. I actually love meeting up with people. Our team loves seeing each other. And we actually have more quality time. So we will fly the whole company together to meet up twice a year. And we'll have a lot of different team meetups. And when you're with your team, you're not hunched over some laptop in a co-working space. You're not just seeing them at the water cooler. You're actually spending quality time with them for two or three days. I think that can build stronger bonds than just sitting next to someone at the office or having them be three floors up in the office. So all remote does not have to be an antisocial, and it, it should not be antisocial. Uh, bringing 1,800 people is going to be hard in one place. But uh, no, I think like, like Queen, like we built a lot. We actually uh, built products to help people connect. So for example, we have a plugin that you put on Slack, and you'll match people every week uh, with across the company from different departments so they can spend some time together. Uh, obviously, for example, it's the end of the year, so allocating different budgets so people within the same city can spend some time together for nice dinners and things like that. So um, you know what, what we've found is similar to Quinn, people travel like within teams. Last week, I was in Amsterdam for work, and suddenly there was 25 people because 10 people from the customer success team decided to be all together in Amsterdam for that weekend. So I think people find ways to connect with each other. Uh, and you know we need to do our best to enable that uh, as a company. What do you do about talent that maybe, what if they don't live in a good home environment for being productive? I mean, do you, you, know, are you, do you provide WeWork? Memberships, or not, maybe not WeWork, but some some sort of office space, or are you just just operating on the assumption that everyone has a quiet workspace at home? Yeah, we, you know, I know you said you have that WeWork partnership. Uh, we offer reimbursements for co-working spaces for team members, and all of that stuff is so much cheaper than having one centralized office. So it completely makes sense. I think there is a valid concern around if you are very early in your career. Are you going to get all of that interaction with other team members? And so I can totally understand if a lot of people that are very early in their career choose to go to an in-person company. But what I would say, even there, that's you know when when we talk about that, we're thinking of someone who's in the Bay Area or in Paris or Berlin. And if you're a young person there, yeah, maybe go work at a company. But most young people in the world who are really talented don't work somewhere where there's a lot of tech companies around, and they don't have the option of going to an in-person company. And so for those people, it's great if they could work at a world-class company anywhere in the world, that's an awesome opportunity for them. But what can you do you know, for the people that do join your company and are entry level, what do you do to help them have a better you know, onboarding experience and, and you know, a real, I guess, apprenticeship? Yeah, uh, well, we have to have team members that genuinely want to help them onboard. We have a lot of stuff written down. We also spend a lot of time with them. We get them together in person. Uh, not you know in an office all the time, but we have all those touch points. And also, you know, it's a self-selected group of people that do want that. And overall, we have less uh, you know junior, new to the workforce employees than other companies. And I think that's just the you know the reality of an all remote company. It's not good or bad, and there's no one size fits all solution. So I mean, there was a talent crunch for a while, and that might be changing a little bit, as unfortunately there have been a lot of tech layoffs lately. And I'm wondering how that could impact all this. I mean, maybe you know, um, people were more demanding before about you know having precisely the right work environment, and are, 
I don't know. Are you seeing anything change in the interview yeah. process about remote? Well, it's interesting for us, right? Because like as a company that enables companies to hire, right? Like we we've been, you know, I believe a pretty good partner to help those companies in downsizing, right? As they need to just solidify their business. Um, yeah, I think that in in general, we're gonna start. In a couple of months, because people still have a lot of money in the startup world, uh, and, and if the market doesn't pick it back up on the fundraising side, I think you're going to start seeing a bit of an employer-driven market. It definitely was an employee-driven market over the last uh, over the last few years, which is you know it's great for employees. But uh, when such downsizing happen and companies need to tighten the belt a little bit, uh, you know you need to start uh, cutting some parts. You know, I was talking to well, Lindsay, who couldn't make it today. And you know, as they as they developed the company, you know, they, they rolled out a lot of great perks, uh, but some of them were not used at all. But still, removing things that are not used is very complicated. So in general, we're definitely seeing companies kind of rethinking their where are they going to spend their money. Maybe not all the benefits that they rolled out are being used properly and might not be as useful. So yeah, I'm definitely betting on an, um, more of an employer-driven market over the next few years. But I think even in an employer-driven market, it's not as though all remote is just a perk to employees. Yes, yeah. it's very employee-friendly. A lot of employees love it, but it's also good for business. I mean, if you wanted to pitch it to Elon Musk, who is moving away from that, you could say, well, Elon, what if all of your employees had an office at their house that they could work at 24-7 and they have no excuses to not work? Now, that's not our pitch for all remote, but that is one way you can look at it, and it's very employer friendly. So I think it's win win. I don't think that all remote is some fad that you know employees demanded, and now it's going to go away now that it's a tighter market. It seems like some of the large companies are you know either encouraging or demanding people go into the office more, and I wonder, you know, is that going to benefit? Companies like yours, where they, where they are more flexible about remote work, and people say, "Oh, I don't want to work at you know giant company X anymore because they're forcing me to go in." It's trust, right? Like the reason why they need people to come back is because they feel they don't have control. They feel like people are not working as hard as they should, right? So if you build the right infrastructure, in our case, we're very KPI and output driven, right? Like people need to deliver on X and Y and Z. As long as they do, I don't care if they're in an office or not, right? So, but those companies feel like they have more control when they have those, those people in office, right? So I definitely think that a lot of people, and I've seen it happen, and I've seen people working at those large companies being very frustrated, will leave their job if you don't give them the flexibility, but more importantly, the trust, right? Like if you're a very talented person, you can work anywhere. Might as well work in a place that feel, like where you feel trusted, right, and empowered. You mentioned earlier something about how you know you're getting different kinds of employees who maybe didn't live in a major city and didn't have access to this kind of opportunity before. Um, how are you going about finding these people? I mean, is it just through through online job postings, or you know, if they're if they're not in your current city and within your network? I mean, how do you how do you find an interview talent remotely? Well. Usually they find us. Our product is for devs. Any software developer can use it. It's code intelligent, so you know it applies pretty much to any dev who's working in a big code base. So if they've heard of us, then hopefully they find their way on to see that we're hiring and see how we work. So we've got an advantage in that way. Are you but guys open source on some parts? Yeah, we're open yeah, source. That's, that's such a nice trick. Like to hire great people, being open source for engineers is like one of the best things you could be doing. Yeah. yeah. It helps us hire people that have used our product at their previous company. So what we're seeing sometimes is other companies are uh, laying people off or downsizing. Then they're like, well, what are the tools that I loved using the most? And then they'll think of us and they'll see us. And no matter where they are in the world, they can apply. So you just cast the net so much wider, and it means you get the best people from all around the world. So is your interview process fully remote? Yeah, it is. In a few cases, uh, candidates have asked if they can come and meet up in person. And yeah, uh, that's totally fine, too. Because again, we're not religious about this. We're not anti-social. That's not why we're all remote. We're all remote because we think it's a better way to get really focused, great work done. It really helps you hire faster as well, right? When the word is your playground, when you're hiring people just based on their skills, when you're able to set up interviews in such a fast cadence, not having to fly in and all of those things, it just makes the experience really nice. If, you're re if you have the right team, the right process, uh, you can really give a great experience to people, which I think you know, is better than making them fly for 20 interviews in one day, which some you know, big banks like to do. And so um, how do you go about assessing 
how productive your employees are. I know there's been some very controversial stuff like employee tracking software for, for remote workers and what have you. I mean, hopefully you're not invading people's privacy, but you know, how do you measure someone's productivity if you're, if you're not able to, to see them? Well, even if you can see them, it's hard to, <laughs> if you're in that mindset, to measure their productivity. In fact, if you can see them and if they're friendly over lunch and you really like them as a person and like all that, that can actually bias your judgment. And ultimately, you want a company based on trust and based on results. And yeah, that's really hard to build, but it's not a problem unique to all remote. Yeah, being very based on results, you know, being doing a really full jobs on OKRs, KPI, defining everything so that very unbiased you can say, well, you know, there's some roles that are easy, right? Like sales is a bit easier or support is a bit easier to, to quantify. But generally having either binary or like, you know, pretty interesting KPIs and making sure that you follow through and make sure you actually do, you know, do your performance review and assessment on those KPIs is what we've seen the most productive, right? And I think it's worked, it's worked pretty greatly for us. And something else that has always struck me is a lot more roles are remote than we actually think. There's so many accountants and lawyers and people that travel all the time, people who play basketball or football, they're all remote. You travel all the time. You know, you don't maybe call it all remote, but that's essentially what you are. My first job out of college, it, there was an office, but I was traveling to visit customer sites basically 100% of the time. And so way more companies are actually making all remote work than uh, you know, call themselves all remote. I mean, do you feel like you're a remote worker? Well, Bloomberg requires three days a week in person, and we, we even have a Helsinki office that I'll, I'll be wow. visiting while I'm here. But, but, um, you, but do you feel like you need to be at the office to actually like, write quality content and meeting good founders right, and writing about deals? Sorry, if I put, you can also skip it. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm getting interviewed all of a sudden. Um, I mean, you know, with, with the reporting kind of job, they understand I'm often at conferences and, and what have you. And so we, we view that as, as in-person work. It, it counts. But, um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm curious if you guys have seen any data or any information that shows how remote-first companies compared to in-person companies in terms of performance and productivity? Yeah. I have not. That would be very interesting. Have you? No, we, you know, now we just serve companies, remote or not. So like we, and we, you know, we don't really look at productivity data. Like it's more about helping them grow. But uh, again, for, for us, it's what we're seeing is companies just finding their fit, right? It's not about being all remote or all this. It's not about all in the office. It's about you know, based on like the leadership team, the C-level team, like what fits us better. Uh, but I think you can run the experiment in a couple of years, right? Now that you have fully remote companies like ours or Queens, right? Like, let's see which are the best performing ones per cohorts, I guess. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways to see it. But as of now, n no tangible data, let's say. Well, GitLab is doing OK, right? They crushed their last quarter, didn't they? Or I think so. I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot of great companies out there that are all remote that are yeah. doing really well. I don't know how you'd perform that experiment, though. That'd be very interesting. You need to, <laughs> you know, make it randomized or something. That would be very interesting. Well, maybe if you're a public company and you measure quarterly results based on when the employees were in the office versus at home. I don't know. You do hire curious faster. curious if that was out there. Um, you hire faster. I'll say that, right? Like when you are all, rem it's just much easier to not only find great talent, but just move across the different like departments at the company that, well, think about it, right? Like let's say you're a San Francisco based company. You want to hire for, you know, hundred roles over the next two months. You're still competing with all the startups around. You're still, you know, it's very expensive to hire there and you're limited to like who can come to the office, which is very, lim like it's quite a limiting radius, like 30 miles radius, right? So I'd say like if the market is favorable for high growth, which I don't know how it is today, that is definitely a strong advantage. And so since you deal with a lot of companies that are doing hiring themselves, are you finding that companies have sort of a one-size-fits-all approach, either remote or not remote? Or are they saying, OK, certain departments, we want them in you know, for weekly meetings? Or uh, what are you seeing on that? It's funny. It's like I talked to two different founders. I think that even spoke today or they are speaking later today on stage. You know, One of them told me, Engineers, I want in the office. I want them together. But salespeople, they can do whatever they want. And the other, the other founder told me they straight up as engineers, they can work from where they want. But salespeople, I want them all in the office, like talking each other up and selling together. So uh, I think the answer is the same, right? It's like 
everybody builds a company and hires people to a culture that they're kind of like building as a, as a team and that culture shapes up to be a mix of whatever feels best for you, right? And if it is engineering in the office and salespeople outside or vice versa, you know, it's, uh, it, it develops the right, you know, for most successful company, they, they build a model that fits really well for them. And so since you were one of the first to be remote first, I mean, were there any sort of growing pains in making that switch? I mean, obviously everyone else started, I guess, once the pandemic happened and there was the whole stress of that. But before, you know, before even dealing with the stress of the pandemic, what were the hurdles you faced? Well, I mean, it's all trade-offs. So before we went all remote, we were remote first. And that was because when we were starting Sourcegraph in 2013, dev tools were not cool. Everyone would say, oh, you can't sell to devs. And so it was hard for us to hire in the Bay Area, which is where I live. We saw our friends going to Facebook and all these other, you know, many generations of trends have come and gone in the time that we've just been, you know, at this. So it was, we didn't really have a choice. Um, definitely, we've seen that async takes a lot of thought to make it so that you have all the context written down and so that you've got those cultural you know, relationships built beforehand that let you just get in focus. But all of that, it seems like you'd want to do all of that even if you were in person. So it feels like a, it is a forcing function to do async well, but that's all a good thing to do. So you know, they're growing pains in a sense, but I would not attribute them to being remote, per se. What about you? I mean, I, I mean are you seeing any challenges that some companies face when shifting from in-person to remote? Yeah, I mean, luckily for us, we were remote from the beginning. I, uh, I've never worked in an office, so I don't even know what it feels like. Um, so <laughs> never worked in an office? Never. No, so <laughs> so I, I can't really uh, understand uh, the gap or the difference. But I, you know, I think the, the shift is hard, right? Like if you go from an all-in office, every day together culture to like suddenly being alone, like you really, and that's why you know. I think people in HR over the last two years were such the glue of companies. I mean, they always are, but specifically in those times, because you know, like accompanying people into a f 360 into how they're set up and how they work and their day-to-day -day was a big deal. So I can definitely see how companies have failed and tried to go back to a model that they know and they understand, specifically if your executive team is a bit more comfortable with that model. Um, and, but again, I think it'll be a matter of balance, right? Like, what we're seeing is some companies that went back into the office are starting to lose their talents, so they need to adapt their policies again to something that makes more sense. Any last thoughts on, on the <laughs> remote work? I would just say it's not one size fits all. Some companies should be all remote, some should not, and you know, same for employees. Some people want all remote, some people want to go into an office, and that's OK. And if you're one of those companies that is all remote, that's 40%, maybe even 60%, because it's the 40% of the people in the world that want all remote, plus the 20% that could kind of go either way. You just want to make it so that you attract the best people in that group. You guys are in how many countries already? We have, I think, 34 countries, about 225 people all around the world. And no specific cluster anywhere, right? Like really everywhere. Well, the clusters were not intentional. We have clusters in Berlin and Paris and London and SF. And then just a lot of people, you know, all around the world too. That's, that's kind of like the beauty of it, right? Like the ability to bring such a diverse group of people. And I don't, I don't know how, how your hiring processes are, but just the idea that you are able to say, hey, we just want the best talent. We just want to be able to hire the best people. And you might want to open offices in those locations and just look for the best people in those local countries. But the mindset, one of the things we kind of came out of at deal realizing through helping all those companies is, sure, you know, there will be discussions on whether you go for a hybrid model, full office model. But the concept of, I'm just, I've broadened my horizon when it comes down to building a team. And now I'm just looking in general, albeit I might prefer to have 80% of my team with me. I will you know, take chances on people um, and give opportunities to more people around the world. I think that's kind of like the beauty that came out of remote working in general, apart from the flexibility. And you know, this is one of the trends we're the most excited about, right? Like being able to tap into the hundreds of millions of amazing people that are as talented as your Bay Area people or others, and just giving them the opportunity to work for the best companies in the world. That's something we're very excited about. And that, is not going away, right? That's what we've seen.
Yeah, that promise is just so motivating. I mean, personally, when I was learning to code, I was, I don't know, 11 or 12, and I loved that I, growing up in Chicago, Illinois, right in the middle of the US, I didn't know anyone else who coded. Chicago was not a big hotbed of tech at the time, but I could go on the internet, and no one knew that I was 11 years old, and also, <laughs> Like, I could work with the best people building code out there anywhere in the world, and that was so magical. And then uh, the Google CEO came to town and gave a talk, and I happened to attend it, and I you know, go up, I was in high school, and I'm like, hey, I think Google's really cool, I know how to code. And he's like, oh, we don't hire high schoolers, and we're only hiring California. And that was such a letdown to me. But I love this new world where, if no matter where you are in the world, you can go and work with the best people in tech, and you can go work at the best tech companies. That is so inspiring for me personally to you know, have some small role in creating that kind of world for all these young people out there. And also, I love as a CEO that we can hire those amazing people that have this crazy talent somewhere in the world where we would not have found them if we were just in the Bay Area. Do you hire high schoolers? Uh, yes, we would. <laughs> I think we, uh, we don't intentionally do that, but we have because, I mean, there. Uh, I also wow. <laughs> uh, work with this nonprofit called Hack Club, which is a kind of global high school age coding community. And the kind of things that kids can build, it, it's, it's amazing. And I think like, wow, I wish I could not have a job and you know, kids take care of sometimes to just go and code and you can get a lot done. And there's so many kids that have that so much freedom and time and they can build amazing things. So uh, yeah, we would. There was one time we actually had to check the age on a candidate, uh, and it turns out his parents were down uh, waiting in the car during his interview. Oh. Look, look, the, look how like the how different the world is going to be. You know, like if you think 20 years back, you wanted even not that far ago, you, you wanted to work for the best company, you had to move. Now that you don't, now that you can just hopefully find the right opportunities. I think the, just generally the world dynamics, the immigration dynamics are going to be super interesting. And like, I'm excited for this new world. And I'm excited for what, how economies are going to profit from that and how the world is going to develop. All right. Well, thank you so much. Great to hear about remote work. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>
Yes, it is. We just figured it out before when we were talking about what to talk about. Um, yeah, and we've actually had a kind of a common journey since, uh, since that time. Uh, some, some common touch points. So, uh, but that time when I first met you, mm -hmm. I think like you were not working exactly on what Ready Player Me was yep. today. Do you want to share a little bit that story with us? Like, yes. your founder story? For sure. So, Ready Pair Me, we've been around for nine years. Uh, we started as a hardware company building 3D scanners um, uh, to scan people and create realistic avatars. Uh, we did that for a few years, and then we built a kind of a, a software product for big gaming companies, and we worked with like Tencent, Huawei, HTC, Vodafone, Verizon, custom building avatar systems for those companies. And there was dozens of avatar systems from scratch, and that's where we really learned to build great avatars and then eventually build it into a platform that now more than 4,000 companies are, are using in, in their games and, and virtual worlds. Wow, 4,000, <laughs> wow, that, what a growth. Exciting, right? Yeah, like, we uh, went from like 30, 30 companies using the product to like 4,000 in 18 months. So that was a, that was a wild ride. After a long time of uh, you know, building and learning and grinding, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. I'm sure we'll get back to that. Like six years of grinding before like, you figure out what would be like the key business model for you? And yeah. So at, at what moment you found or you understood like, like working on the avatar more specifically would become like the future of the company? Yeah, I mean, like we, we started the company, we made a bet on people spending more and more time in virtual worlds with every year that goes by in games and hanging out together and VR is one component to that and so forth. And, and that's been the core kind of bet. Um, and avatars are needed in virtual worlds. You need to have an avatar that represents you well, and you need an avatar that travels across worlds. So that was always the thing we were trying to solve or build for. Uh, but it was from hardware to you know, all the other stuff we did. And then eventually built a platform when the technology was ready, and, and we were ready, and we kind of figured out how to build an end-to-end -end product for developers. Uh, but it was more obvious every year that went by that avatars and virtual worlds and the metaverse is happening around us, and, and I would, you know, it's going to be important to build that. And what about Sandbox? Uh, you've, you've, had a, you ha you've had a long, long journey as well. Oh, yes. So we started Sandbox uh, with the idea in 2011 that we wanted to empower anyone to become a creator. And back then, I was already a serial entrepreneur. Uh, we had co-founded three companies with my business partner, Archer Madrid. We had two exits. And I always had a dream of how to make video games. And I saw like mobile and smartphone as a way for anyone to become a creator again, making like game cre video game development accessible. But we wanted to go one step more removing the barrier of like, having to learn programming language. And, and so using touchscreen, we came to the idea, let's make a game where people can just by the touch of their finger create yeah. and share. And it rapidly grew into a large success. We, over eight years of existence of that mobile game, we had 40 million installs, 70 million creation. I actually remember in 2016, I was here at Slush pitching uh, as a founder, trying to raise funds for that sequel version yeah. of my previous game. And um, in 2018, we have been a, my mobile game studio has been acquired by Animoca Brands. And we started to play around blockchain technology. I was always exploring. I've been a geek all my life, an early adopter. I bought from the first day of pretty much every tech product. So when I found about blockchain, I said, oh, great. Let's see how we can use that in a creative way or a way that supports what we want to do. And we found that blockchain and NFT would be a great way like for uh, combining it with user-generated content to enable people to make their own content, own it, transfer it from one game to another, and even sell it outside of the place where they were originally created, those content. Yeah. That was one key challenge we had back then, because on mobile, our creators were uh, amazingly talented. We were giving them a lot of like, social recognition, social fame, but we have literally no way to reward them financially, sharing a part of the revenue that they contributed to our game right. back to the hand of the creator. And NFT solved that problem. And so we pivoted into building a new version of Sandbox in 2017, 3D, multiplayer, multi-platform. We were one of the pioneers in blockchain gaming. I remember there were probably uh, less than 10 companies in the space, and maybe even less than 10 people in the audience when we were first pitching about the idea. 
And uh, well, today, I think like Sandbox has been one of the most recognized uh, builder in the space for like contributing to the open metaverse. Yes. But it's not been like this overnight success story, like many people imagine. It's been like a 10 years overnight success story. Yeah. And we still have a lot of challenge and a lot of things to keep building, to grow, so that uh, we can reach that level of recognition and those hundreds of millions of users that we want to reach. Nice. And, and then what, was the, what made you make that bet so early when it was very unclear, like where three games weren't a thing, right? Like, so what made you make that bet? And then the follow-up to that is like, what did, what did it feel like when this space like, exploded into existence over the last few years? And you, know, you scaled from a relatively small team to a relatively big team now. So like, what was the whole journey like? And yeah, what, what made, yeah that, that, that's, that would be great to understand. So what really drives us is like how like we empower the creator concretely. Mm -hmm. Like I might, every day I wake up, I have this passion to see what people are making. Yeah. I'm just having all that joy that it brings to see like people being empowered and uh, giving life to their imagination with new tools and doing things that even yourself couldn't imagine. And uh, it's true that uh, like adding that capa creative capability and now seeing as well that it had a positive impact in many people's lives thanks to the ability to monetize. Yeah. That's been amazing. But it's not been like a short journey for sure. And at the beginning, we, we had, of course, a lot of like uh, challenges, people who didn't believe we were capable of building that product, building that platform. Uh, but ultimately, when I being super laser focused on creator first, mm -hmm. being like user driven, and that's some of the core value in Web3. Like, Web3 for me is user centric, community driven versus like profit centric or like trying to centralize all data. Right. And uh, that's ultimately that conviction, that passion for the space, uh, and all the different factors of being a geek and early adopter, loving and connecting with other entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. have been driving us to where we are today. Awesome. And so in your case, like, uh, how, how did you see that growth from uh, like working with some of the major virtual worlds yeah. today? How have you been... Uh, pushing to the idea that they should open themselves yeah. to connect with avatars that come from outside world and, and yeah. use Ready Player Me as a solution? Have you seen friction? How have yeah. you addressed it? Yeah, so uh, for us it was you know, custom building out the tech for big companies to start, and then when we built Ready Player Me, why we really built that, built Ready Player Me was because we saw there's kind of two paths, potential paths for the future of the metaverse. And one of them is, is a good path, and one of them is not a very good path, uh, if you ask us. So one path is a more centralized path, where the metaverse ends up being owned by one company or a few companies, and we spend most of our time in their worlds. Um, and that is a scary future. Like They make all the rules, they have all the power over the world we live in, essentially. Uh, not a good future. Uh, and the other path is a more open and decentralized metaverse, uh, where you know we end up more with more something more like the internet, where you can navigate with different between different pages, and you can have a consistent experience across many virtual worlds. And it's built by millions of developers and creators, and not by one company, and it's not owned by anyone. Um, so, and for the open metaverse to really have a chance, there need to be services and standards and protocols that kind of make it easy for developers to link you know different virtual worlds together. Um, and, and that's why we built Ready Player Me, because we felt the world is kind of getting ready for that. There's like a wave of decentralization. Like Web3 is like a set of technologies, but as importantly, it's a mindset and a philosophy, right? It's mm -hmm. not building a wall garden, it's connecting worlds and so forth. And, and we felt that the, the, the world is ready for that, and that is the kind of macro trend com com you know, combined with like people just spending more time in virtual worlds. And then um, I think we kind of timed it right. Um, and, um, and yeah, like avatars just help kind of break down some of the virtual worlds and make it easy for people to navigate between different virtual worlds. It's a naturally consistent part of your metaverse experience across now thousands of experiences. So um, yeah, and when we launched, like we had also spent six years you know, grinding our faces off and kind of learning <laughs> what it takes to build a good avatar system. <clears throat> And so we knew what, to, what, what we have to build. 
And there's certainly friction and, and resistance from more traditional studios that still have the you know, old way of kind of building a closed economy that they control, mm -hmm. and it's a walled garden, and, and that's fine. Uh, but there's a big amount of the industry that has the kind of like the Web3 minded approach to building things, and they prefer to have avatars in their game that travel across the metaverse instead of just you know, stuck in, in their world. So, um, and by kind of working with the early market, kind of their philosophy, philosoph 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 yeah, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophically, <laughs> I got it. Um, aligned with open metaverse, we can build a big enough of a network to prove the rest of the world that having avatars in your game that you can buy and use across the metaverse is actually a better business model for your game. It's a better user experience because you can you know, bring in assets from other places. So our goal really is to like show the general industry by working with the kind of like a uh, current network that building an interoperable system is just a better business and a better way to do things. And that really tips, up, uh, tip, tips over kind of the rest of the industry that is still very kind of uh, traditionally minded. Um, so it has to be a no-brainer business, business decision, basically, and that's what we're working towards. Well, I couldn't agree more. Like for me, there's only one way for the metaverse. It has to be open. Yes. Like I believe fundamentally that true digital asset, true digital asset ownership is a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. Just like we enjoy like physical property, we should be able to enjoy the way we want all our digital asset. And the metaverse is the best place for like having like all the use cases for like enjoying the digital ownership. Yes. Avatar is like the best representation of a concrete use case for it. I think the most understandable, the most accessible. And uh, we've been building the sandbox with that vision. Like you want to be able to use avatars either from like various brand that we brought in yeah. uh, to experience uh, content made in sandbox, but also of outside of Sandbox, but also like you can come and play with avatars, like ton of avatar collection from outside Sandbox. It's a feature yeah. called interoperability. It's a technical world, but at the end of the day, what it means is like just if I own any cool NFT collection that I like, then I can play around with it in the metaverse and I can use it as my new identity as I cross around many other virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm glad that we fully agree on that. And, and I hope that more and more people will realize that we cannot build the real metaverse if we keep like a very centralized mindset and we only agree on like we need to build APIs that are like still controlled by companies and data that are not in the hands of users behind. Yes. Um, 100%. Yeah. And like the Kind of like the, the Web3 world is aligned with that vision, and that pushes us to figure out those standards and build those services that link the virtual worlds together, and then hopefully tip over the rest of the industry as well. Um, both but, yep. Yeah, no, but one thing I was thinking, though, is like, even though like, uh, it's what we're saying is like there's this technolog technological possibility behind it's really important. We shouldn't forget as well, like, users will appreciate that benefit first and foremost because they have great content, great experiences. So the technical capability is now today. The new challenge that we're facing is like how do we bring and build like exciting experiences, immersive experience, more social, a new format of entertainment that like is really compelling and makes users want to come and come again and again and again. So driving like retention so we can build like full business model on that and it can be become sustainable over a long term. Yes, makes sense. And uh, both of us work with a lot of brands. So uh, how do you think kind of real world brands, like traditional brands, kind of play into the whole future of the metaverse and virtual worlds? So brands is typically one part of the strategy to achieve that, like to bring exciting experiences through like the content, the characters, the stories, the location that people are already familiar with. Mm -hmm. And uh, for them to interact in a more meaningful manner with their favorite characters, etc. And for the first time, because Sandbox is a very user-generated content platform, they can take those contents, uh, use them in the game maker, mix them, 
uh, take many of their favorite brands to create a mashup game if they want or mashup experience and monetize it the way they want as well. That's a strong first value proposition. The second thing is like brands are looking at new way to reconnect with consumer. Like they kind of exhausted of that relationship that the Web2 platform has been imposing them and uh, like not having access to their consumer uh, data, not being able to communicate or target them and offering content where like attention span is in the range of like few seconds to a minute at best and like our interaction are limited to like, share, retweet and maybe comment. Users want more interaction and they find those interactions in virtual world. Like they can chat, they can interact, they can socialize, they can express themselves with an avatar, they can carry real emotion. And on average, we're seeing users spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes in virtual world, which is like incredible in terms of time and attention if you compare to yeah. any other uh, media or format. And we want to keep pushing those creative um, uh, interaction through as well, like the way like the avatar is going to move, the animations, the emotes, the kind of action that we can do as a group in a, in a, in a land. And then once we've retained those users for the brands, um, those users will keep staying in the virtual world and explore all the content, content made by the creators themselves. And that's how we drive more audiences and more users so the creators can also benefit from them and fully um, maximize the potential of the creator economy where because they own the content and they receive the majority of the revenue from the value they bring, like in case of Sandbox, 95%, yeah. not 30%, not 70%, 95%, then like the creator economy will take off and all those virtual world should like, like become, I believe, like the next wave of the internet. Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels that ownership uh, of assets is an essential part of the future of the metaverse, right? And that really like uh, motivates a lot of creators and, and, and builders to take part and innovate and build their careers around building stuff for virtual worlds. And uh, that creativity and, and that, that energy put into the space will you know, create a lot of new uh, types of experiences. So maybe to give some concrete numbers here, mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing like thousands of people whose job is like building content in Sandbox. From the beginning of the year, we have roughly 10 builder studios around the world. We were like pioneers to create those experiences for the brand or for themselves. Today, there's more than 230 studios around the world, almost every continent. And they have like long pipeline of production to build those experience and use, like, like employ themselves, people, and so on. So, indeed, and it's very exciting, like, that ecosystem is taking off. And, like you said, like, the success of an ecosystem is essentially the success of the builders into it. So, that's what we want to push forward. And nice. I, I know that you are also working on something quite exciting on your own roadmap to open this avatar economy around as well in Ready Player Me. Yes, totally. So, like, how we think about building our product is like, it, it's it's a tool. It's tool like a tool set, of um, uh, and it kind of enables other people to build stuff. So avatars are nothing on their own. They're only useful if they're used in cool and awesome games and and built you know by awesome developers. So that's really our focus. And then now we're also opening up the avatar content part. So like anyone can come in and create avatar accessories and assets. Work with a lot of brands because that really enables them to like sell virtual fashion. Before, they had to go to each individual ga game and make a deal and create custom assets for them. When there's real interoperability of assets, they can just focus on what they do best, creating virtual fashion and selling it. And we make sure that it's use used in thousands of virtual worlds. So, um, and that ability brings a lot more creators uh, into the space and opens up opportunity to take part of the virtual economy and so forth. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, let's change to founder topics. This is uh, this is a founder <laughs> stage, right? So uh, we've both had a pretty crazy few years scaling ourselves and the companies and so forth. Uh, you have a much bigger company, uh, but uh, what was the experience like? Um, you know, going through that through that crazy time, and how do you stay focused, and how do you how do you make sure uh, you stay sane in the whole <laughs> process? Well, uh, for sure, it's really overwhelming to see like how uh, for the past four years, Sandbox moved from being like, oh, they will never make it to yeah. kind of like, oh, they did something interesting and I'm interested to be part of that journey and build something in it. 
And um, the, thing, the first thing that really uh, excites me the most is like, this is global. Like every country I go and I speak, we're able to see like a whole ecosystem of builders, of projects, of brands that want to be part of the metaverse, who want to also, because it's a virtual world, it has a map, so they want to own virtual land on that map. They want to develop neighborhoods, so that strong feeling of community, proximity, because we're in a spatial environment now. We're no longer just on a website or yeah. gallery of content that are disconnected from one another. And also, like, we, even though we are building, we used to build product and tech product, today we are building uh, a platform and f we are focused on content. Like, seeing all the creativity around the world and the content first, that's, that's really exciting as well for me. And I, I want to keep inspiring people that this is a platform that we do. We do it for the, we build for the community. We provide you the tools to be uh, more, to give life to your imagination. We want to take your feedback to keep improving it over time. Mm -hmm. But we want also you to fully own all the content you, you have and be the first to benefit from that creative. We don't want to take away from you like the success. We want you to be successful as we grow together. And so that's, uh, for cor of course, uh, very exciting. Also, as an entrepreneur, it's the first time that we move. I think r right now, Sandbox is about 420 employees mm -hmm. in 10 key um, uh, office locations, like Paris, London, Seoul, Tokyo, Hong Kong, uh, Los Angeles, Montreal, and Buenos Aires, and Uruguay. And um, it's a challenge, of course. Like you keep learning every day as an entrepreneur. Uh, I haven't run company large like this before, but we we learn, we progress, and we all super very motivated. Like the number one thing that people see when they see Sandbox is like all our motivation and energy to make this the way we envision it. That's our dedication to the community and all the builder in the space. Awesome. Yeah. How about yourself? Like you moved to close to 100 people already? Yeah. No? Yeah. 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 It's a challenge. I think like uh, you have to learn as a founder, you have to learn to manage the downsides when things are not going well, which I learned well over the first six years <laughs> of like two weeks of runway many times and so forth. Ooh. And that's like, that's actually kind of like easier to manage, I feel, than the, the, the times when things are going well because you have so much stuff coming at you at all times. You have to like process an amazing amount of information, and you have like a high risk of drowning <laughs> into this whole thing and like just like losing the the main thing, right? And uh, it's very hard to uh, assess that and understand if you are still, uh, you know, um, understand what's going on basically, and uh, and you're still guiding the ship, you know, and not uh, uh, distracted by everything else, uh, but. That's what we sign up for, you know. We we exactly. grabbed the dragon by its tail, and now we are gonna riding it, you know, trying our best. <laughs> that build you strength, resistance. You know how to run a company and then keep like a longer runway, yeah. or being protected, specifically in the current market condition. I yes. suppose we're like keeping a long runway. There's a lot of companies that trust us with a very key feature of the product as well. So it's very important for us to be, to be to be trusted and and stable um, for those companies. Um, I think the last topic we can cover is kind of the, the turmoil on the market. You know, there's uh, FTX collapse with a lot of others with that. So how do you think about that, that as a founder, as a builder in the space? And how do, you, uh, how do you think about that? Yeah. So, well, the current market is like a bit d dull in at the moment. Like it's not sp specifically only cryptocurrencies or blockchain. It's like all tech and uh, tech companies valuation that are being like corrected. And there's been a number of layoffs at larger company like Meta who fired 11,000 people, which is right. significant. Um, and so that, that's definitely not a great general market context for uh, like fundraising typically. And there might be a market risk in general, how we evolve, that you learn how to make yourself more resilient to that market risk. It's not the first time that it happens. So we understand, specifically as we evolve in Web3 and crypto, like to have like secured enough cash for more than three years of development in the case of Sandbox, so we can keep developing safely. 
But on the other side, I'm seeing as well like a growth of adoption in Sandbox. Like we have more than 4.3 million users with a wallet. We have over 230 studios in the ecosystem, uh, 33,000 landowners. And the last season that we opened, so like 10 or 40,000 at daily active users, 260,000 monthly active users. While we are not yet fully open as a platform, we're still in beta. We're not yet on mobile. So seeing that the fundamentals, like the player adoption, the ecosystem adoption, the user adoption is there, makes me convinced that so like, if we focus on like, let's keep building, let's keep making this place more fun and fun, let's add more creative possibility and designing content, designing avatars, yeah. uh, and then when market goes back, I think like, we'll benefit as well from like, the double effect from there. Yes. I mean, I think the great companies are built on very kind of long-term macro trends, and the kind of small waves in the market don't really change that, right? Like, people are going to spend more time in virtual worlds. The world is getting more decentralized over time. And we are also out of time. Uh, so uh, I was let's short. wrap this up. This was a great <laughs> chat. Thank you, Seb. And thank you, everyone. Let's keep building. Thank you, Timu. <laughs> let's keep building. <laughs> and see you in the metaverse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sebastian and Timmo. Next up, uh, John W. Thompson has been leading technology companies for four decades. Most notably, he succeeded Bill Gates as the chairman of Microsoft from 2014 to 2021 and guided the company through a CEO transition. John is no stranger to the weight of responsibility, the complexity of leadership, and innovation in the ever-changing technology environment. While there are no shortcuts in building companies, there are ways in which you can prepare to make them endure the storms. John, who is currently a venture partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners, will step on the stage to share his lifelong lessons on building enduring companies and making tough decisions in leadership positions. The stage will be shared by Paul Murphy, also a partner at Lightspeed Venture Partners. Paul has been a product developer and a multiple-time founder before he discovered the knack for fundraising while working on the other side of the business on behalf of his own companies. This is Building Enduring Companies, Lessons from Microsoft, IBM, and Symantec. Welcome on stage, John and Paul. Hi, everyone. Wow. So nice to be back here. My first slush was actually in 2014. Uh, and it's, it's awesome to see the energy is just as strong as it was back then. Uh, so my name is Paul Murphy. I'm a, a partner at Lightspeed. I uh, am based in London, and I lead our European efforts to expand uh, the franchise into Europe. Um, we have an amazing session here today with uh, John W. Thompson, who is a venture partner at Lightspeed. Uh, I want to dive into that, but before uh, I do so, I just want to tell you a little bit about Lightspeed in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, we are a global fund. We have 12 offices around the world in six countries. We have about $18 billion of assets under management. And this summer, we launched our latest fund family, which is just over $7 billion uh, to invest in everything from seed all the way up to pre-IPO rounds. Um, we've invested in some iconic US companies that you might be familiar with, like uh, Snap and Affirm. But we actually have a whole host of companies in Europe as well, uh, about 30 at last count. Companies like Personio, Vinted, uh, Lightyear, many others. In fact, nearly half of our companies are outside of the US. So uh, with that, I want to jump in, talk a little bit about uh, John's amazing career. I'm lucky enough to call him a colleague. 
uh, at light speed, which is an incredible uh, thing for me to be able to do. He has 40 years of technology industry experience. <laughs> and before we jump into specific questions, I just want to ask John if you could tell us a bit about yourself. How did you end up here? What did you want to be when you grew up? Yeah. Those sorts of things. Well, I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida, and it is about the biggest contrast to where we are today <laughs> than anywhere else in the world because the temperature there never gets below 72 degrees. But nonetheless, I grew up in a family where my father was a military guy, became a postal worker, and my mother was a local school teacher who ultimately, as her career progressed, she became a principal and administration, administrator, if you will, in the county school system. The one thing, though, that I will never forget about my life experience with my mother and father, my mother had a point of view about life, which is life is about lifelong learning. And so you should plan to learn your entire life. And I translated that into, I will never retire. Because if you're going to learn your entire life, you can't stop working. And so while you said I've been in the industry for more than 50 years, the actual number is almost 40 years. The actual number is almost 53, and I'll cross that 53 mark in June of this year. Never in my wildest dreams, never ever, did I imagine being in tech. As a matter of fact, I wanted to be a lawyer because the most prominent people in the African-American community in the 1960s were teachers, preachers, doctors, and lawyers. And I knew I couldn't be either of the first three, and so I opted to go to law school. Well, lo and behold, six months before going to law school, I sat down with my father-in-law, who was a very prominent attorney in West Palm Beach, and said, here's what I'm thinking. I'd like to go back to law school. And he looks at me and says, okay, let's talk about that. How much money do you make now? And I told him it was about a little over $10,000 a year. And so he says, so where do you think you'll be a year from now? I said, well, I'm about to go on quota. So I'll have my first full IBM territory to sell into. And generally, your salary goes up by 75 to 100% in that first year. He says, really? I went, yep, really. He says, well, where do you think you'll be three years from now? And I said, well, I suspect I'll be 3x more than I make now. And really? And he says, why would you ever leave that job to go to law school where you will make essentially the same amount of money in your first year that you make now? And it was that conversation with my father-in-law, who's long since passed away, that got me to say, I'm going to stay. And I'm going to try to concentrate on technology in a way that I can be effective. And quite frankly, I can develop some experiences that are valuable to others in the industry. So 53 years in this industry has been an incredible journey for me, and I expect to go another 50 years. <laughs> we, we have the same expectations. So um, I think you know, there's a few chapters of your career that I want to dive into and we can all learn from. Let's sure. start with IBM. So yeah. you spent 28 years there. Uh, you've seen, you saw presumably a lot of change. What were the kind of highlights, key learnings from your time there? Well, IBM is an amazing company, or at least it was during the period of time that I was working there. And one of the things I came to recognize is that it's a structured environment, and you have to learn how to deal in that structure. And back in those days, it was always about blue suits and white shirts. Well, I was from a community that didn't wear blue suits and white shirts. I wore what I call two sister suits, Polly and Esther and they were any color but blue. Yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, as time progressed, I came to realize, while you may be smart enough to advance your career, you're not aligned enough to advance your career at IBM. And I ended up moving to, from Tampa, Florida, my first job at IBM, to Atlanta. And while there, I said, I need to buy a wool suit that's navy blue, and I need to buy a white shirt and a striped tie. And that was the aha moment for me that it was more about cultural acceptance, not trying to fight who you were and what you wanted to be. And candidly, the stay in Atlanta was a great inflection point. And about five years later, I get a call that says, we'd like for you to come to Boston to be the director or, I'm sorry, the regional sales manager here. And I thought, what a great place to go. Well, back then, Boston did not have the reputation as being an embracing community. 
And I was going through a divorce, and I didn't want to go because of the nature of the community and my two young kids. But I finally made a decision that I'll go because I can always go back to Atlanta, which is the African-American mecca of the United States. And so I went to Boston, and the leader of that region decided, I like you. And oh, by the way, I want to prove that Boston nor me are ethnically biased. And so within six months, I was his chief of staff. Within a year, I was running a branch. Within two years, my branch was the top branch in the nation. And then six months later, I get a call from the chairman of the board saying, Tag, we want you to go to MIT Sloan School. We'll pay your tuition and we'll continue to pay your salary. And so my IBM journey was one that I never imagined. But that decision to move to Boston was the most important inflection point in my career. Never again did anything that spectacular happen. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So what brought you from Boston to then Silicon Valley to go run some Well, I had been at IBM for 27 years, 9 months, and 13 days. And I knew I was never going to get to run the company. And I had joined my first corporate board when I was running our Midwest operation. And I would sit in the boardroom, and people had these fancy epilepsies that said CEO, chairman, president. And I said, head of sales for the Midwest. And it was so narrow. And I went, wait a minute. They don't know that much more than I do. And if they can have those fancy titles, why can't I? And sure enough, I called John T. Thompson at Hydric and Struggles and said, don't come to see me anymore about a sales job or a marketing job or a product management job. If it's not a CEO role, I'm not interested. Well, sure enough, 90 days or so later, I get an email note that says in the subject line, perfect match. And I click on the note and it has no content. So I immediately call John and say, what is this about? And he says, well, I have a little company that I've been working with for years called Symantec. I went, yeah, I think I know them. He says, they're looking for a new CEO. Are you interested? I said, well, I don't know. It's a consumer product company. I'm an enterprise guy. He says, they need somebody who's a tech leader. Do you want to join the company? I said, well, I'd like to meet some people first. So I flew to California. I met with the team. And I concluded, why not? I'm about to turn 50. And if I ever want to run a company, I better do it now. Otherwise, I just won't get there. And I joined Symantec then, and we took it from 600 million in revenue to 6 billion over a 10-year period. And I had a wonderful journey, and I concluded, I'll never retire. I'll never retire. Because if you can do that, you can do it again, because you've learned something from that experience. And while I may not have an interest in being an operator anymore, I do want to be an advisor and consultant and advocate, if you will, for the teams. And that was in part why I joined Lightspeed. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I think just, you know, getting this sense of scale, $600 million to $6 billion in revenue um, is, is a massive feat, but actually not the biggest one in your career. So we'll come to some of that in a bit. But I just want to understand some of the nuances of how you took a company from 600 to $6 billion in revenue. That's, I just can't even think about how you would achieve that. Well, as I said, it was a consumer packaged software company when I got there. So they had a very strong gaming business, a very strong connectivity business, a little security company called Norton Antivirus, and a few other things. And it generated $600 in revenue. But I was from a company that had a diverse portfolio, but it had concentrations within categories. And I couldn't understand how this company, with all of these diverse categories, as small as it was, could really leverage to scale. And I learned something from my IBM experience, which was I would spend the first 100 days listening. That's why you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen. And so I listened and concluded we need to get out of all of these related businesses that are not security related. Because in 1999, the security problem was escalating exponentially. So we did that. And we bought a little company in North Carolina or somewhere and started the journey to become a true security company and sold off many of the assets that weren't security or enterprise related. And the end result was we kind of progressed quite well for the first 18 months to two years. And then two years in, I pre-announced an earnings miss. And the stock price dropped 35% in one day. And I was like devastated. And I came to the conclusion, wait a minute, we're doing what's right. 
so you should not be devastated by this. Just stay focused. Well, lo and behold, two weeks, three weeks later, the first self-propagating self -propagating virus called Nimda hit the marketplace. And we were in market with a new product, and McAfee, our top competitor, was not. And the company took off. And the rest is history. I mean, wow. it's a very different company today yeah. than when I left it, but nonetheless, 600 million to 6 billion, you don't do that without yeah. effort, without yeah. building a great team, and quite frankly, being comfortable with the team you've built. Great. Okay, so I want to shift uh, topics a little bit and talk about um, boards. So, you know, the founders in the room, you, you presumably have formed a board if you've raised capital. Um, this is a topic that uh, I talk to the founders I work with in Europe quite a lot because I think that um, there's a lot we can still learn as to how to have effective boards. Um, you know, John, you sat on the board or sit on the board of Microsoft, um, which is you know, one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, you joined in 2012, I believe. Before we talk about your Microsoft journey specifically, maybe you could just give all of us sort of your view as to what a board and an independent director should do for a company. Yeah. Well, I, I've been very clear from the very beginning that just because you have a seat at the board table doesn't mean you run the company. The CEO runs the company. And I think it's damn important for the board to all come to that and recognize that they are there to provide insight and counsel, not to run the company. And I was quite clear about that at Microsoft. Um, and in my early days there, it was clear that in my opinion, it was time for a change. That Steve had been there for 12 years, had done a good job of making sure that the revenue continued to move, but had not done as good a job in improving the stock performance. And they then asked me to not just be a board member, but be the lead independent director. And before too long, I lead the search and I want an outsider. And sure enough, I couldn't find one because nobody wanted any part of Microsoft at that point in time. And so we turned to two relevant insiders, and I remember one of the important statements that Bill made to me early in the search process, which is, the company is in technology trouble now, and we need a leader at the top who is, in fact, a technologist. And that was a very, very important statement that yeah. resonated with me as I was looking at the two final candidates, and we selected Satya, who had a very, very strong technology background, having worked at Sun for a few years and then joining Microsoft. Um, that journey, to my surprise, led to an appreciation in the stock price that I never would have expected. Yeah, I mean, when I, so I actually spent eight years at Microsoft. I unfortunately left the year before John joined and sold all my stock uh, when I left because I thought it's been flat for eight, nine years, it's never going to change. Um, and of course, John and the sort of new leadership come in. And I, I, I was trying to do rough math, but it was about one and a half trillion dollars of value creation happened in the last decade. One and a half trillion dollars. I mean, that's just, you know, incomprehensible. So what, what do you think? I mean, earnings were growing the whole time I was there. Revenue yeah. was growing, employees were growing, but what changed under Satya's leadership? Well, I, I think what people perceived was that Steve did not have as strong a technology insight as Bill did, or candidly paging forward as Satya did. And one of the things that Satya made very clear from the very beginning as his, in his role as CEO is that we're going to have a top position in the cloud. We're not going to be number three, four, or five. We want to be number one or number two. And he and Scott Guthrie, who runs the cloud business for Microsoft, have doubled down and they have created a very, very important business for Microsoft. More importantly, however, is if you look underneath, many of the technology things that they have done quietly are incredible. And I can't wait for them to announce a few of those products in the yeah. marketplace. Well, it's exciting. We're, uh, we'll be anticipating that. Um, so, okay, so if we move on from your, your role, you know, at, on the Microsoft board, you also sit on, I think it's five other, uh, or three, you sit on four, five four, boards in total? Four others. Um, one, few, one public and three private. Okay, and a few of those are Lightspeed companies, uh, which, is, which is amazing. As a, as a board member, and you talked a bit about the board doesn't run the company, the CEO and the management team run the company, but what do you view the, the key job of the CEO to be, now with all the experience that you've kind of accumulated and witnessed over the years? 
Well, it's important for the CEO to have a strong and deep perspective on the marketplace that he or she is trying to penetrate. And it's equally strong for them to use their ears and mouth proportionately. And all too often, leaders feel that they have to tell the world what they're thinking before they think through what they should be thinking. And I learned from my early days on the Microsoft board how important it was to listen, not to talk. Yeah. Because many of the people in the room, who will go nameless, wanted to talk rather than listen. And I think that's an important issue for every leader at any level of an organization. Listen, comprehend, and then act. And that's what I did for 10 years at Symantec. I think we're, we're seeing right now um, you know, the, the role of a company culture, a corporate culture, playing, you know, increasingly being part of why some companies grow and survive challenges and others maybe sort of die off. Um, when I think about going into an environment like Microsoft or other companies you've been involved in, sometimes the CEO needs to reset the culture and get you know, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people behind them. Um, what, what do you think the most effective way to do that? We're witnessing some of this play out in the public space right now with, with new CEOs making dramatic changes. I mean, jury's out as to how that's going to work. Do you have any views as to how you shift culture? Well, I, I think people will follow a leader who they respect and admire. And I think as Satya came in to an organization that candidly was very much technology-centered or long-term technology-centered, many on the team truly respected his background and experience and had confidence that he could lead the company to a place where the top-line performance of the company would, in fact, expand. And I, as I alluded to earlier, he's one of the people that, while he may be one of the smartest people in the room, He's not the loudest person in the room. He's not the one who has the most to say in the room. He uses his ears and mouth proportionately. And that's developed an enormous amount of respect from not just the Microsoft team, but from our partners and our customers around the world. Amazing. OK, so you know, I want to talk a little bit about now your role as an investor. Uh, because sort of you mentioned one email that you got. And you know, my, I know in my conversations with you, you've actually had many emails and phone calls like that uh, from uh, kind of all walks of life, uh, the most senior levels uh, in p politics and technology. Um, I'm very happy with Lightspeed, but why did you join Lightspeed? Why are you, why are you an investor now? Yeah. Well, I, um, as I was winding down my chapter three, which was running a little startup that I was going to run for 90 days, I ended up running it for six years. As I was winding that down, it was like, okay, I'm never going to retire, so what's the next journey on this chapter, or next chapter in this journey? And I joined a firm that the, one of the founding partners was a very, very good friend and co-investor with me, and that was Riverwood Capital. And Riverwood does terrific job at supporting later stage companies. And I didn't realize how late stage it was compared to some of what I wanted to do. But more importantly, they had a business process that was not as engaging as I expected it to be. And so I would show up in the office at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning and leave at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'd do nothing, not a damn thing all day long because they had a more controlled approach to how they manage the assessment and ultimate decision to invest in a deal. And because I was a new guy on the team, they were like, we don't want you. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got to get out of here. And to my surprise, um, Arif Jamohammed from Lightspeed kept sending me notes saying, you should join our team, you should join our team. And I was candidly pretty adamant that I would not join the Lightspeed team because my startup that I had been running for six years went under, in large part because the major partner at Lightspeed went thumbs down when I asked for more capital. And I'm like, holy smokes, why would I ever go to work for that firm? Well, I went there and went to the Monday meeting, the partner meeting, and I was incredibly impressed. And then following that were two early stage companies that had come in for reviews with the team, and I was overwhelmed by then. And I turned to Arif and I said, can I start tomorrow? <laughs> because that was what I wanted to do when I was leaving Symantec. I had invested in about six or eight little companies over my last two years at Symantec because my intent 
was to become an early stage investor after I finished my role at Symantec. Well, I got distracted for six years running virtual instruments, and now I'm able to do, because of my journey with Lightspeed, what I had intended to do some eight or nine years ago. I've invested directly in probably 20 or more companies since I joined Lightspeed. I obviously invest in all of their funds and what have you, but I'm far more interested in the engagement with the founders and their teams to see if I can help in some way yeah. to make them, help them scale. So what, what are some of those, you know, the founders that you've gravitated towards? Are there any qualities or characteristics that well, you really get excited about? One of the ones that is destined to go public soon is Rubrik. And the founder of Rubrik, co-founder of Rubrik, I should say, was a partner at Lightspeed, and he came to see me when he had this idea about marrying backup and recovery and security. And lo and behold, when I spent, I don't know, $11 billion for Veritas, that's what we were trying to do. But the market was not mature enough at that point to see those things come together, so it became an absolute disaster. Well, Rubrik is now the fastest growing company in the history of Silicon Valley, or at least that's what some say. And they have the potential to do an IPO when the market is stable. Uh, we've done all of the prep for the filing and what have you. But I get to spend time with Bipple daily. Mm. As a matter of fact, at 3 a.m. this morning, he called. <laughs> and I had to make sure I turned my damn phone off so I wouldn't get any more calls. But it's that part of the journey that's so exciting to me that you can find brilliant young founders who don't start with the obnoxiousness of, I'm brilliant and you should acknowledge that. Yeah. They start more, but I don't know what you know. Let's share insights together. And that experience with Bipple and the Rubrik team has been amazing. It's been good at Illumina, and it's been equally good at all of the companies that I've been involved in. Yeah, I think that the curiosity, certainly for me as well, it's, it's high talent, high curiosity, and decent amount of humility. Nice combo. Um, okay, so I'm going to, again, shift gears one more time in the time that we have left. It, uh, you know, since the time that you agreed to come out to, to Helsinki, which thank you very much for doing that. My pleasure. This uh, has been an amazing event. I've never been here before, yeah. and... If I get invited back, I will definitely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's awesome to have, have you here. Um, but, you know, in that time, the world has, has continued to change. And it's been very challenging for a lot of people. I'm sure many of you in the room, uh, you know, you might have had, you know, your personal companies get devalued, you might have struggled to raise financing or had even personal wealth wiped out with what's happened. Um, it's trying times. Uh, for sure. And, and, you know, you've been through more than a few cycles um, any advice, words of wisdom, things that have gotten you through those tough times that you could share with the, the founders in the room? Well, I, I think in a challenging economic environment like the one that we're going through now, every company, big or small, has to start with, do I have the right team? And then do I have enough capital to make it through, particularly for startups, to make it through at least two years? Because you never know how long the recovery period is going to take. And I, that's one of the issues I learned shortly after I joined Lightspeed was how much capital do these teams really need to have on their balance sheet, particularly as you enter challenging times. More importantly, however, I think the founding team has to come together in a way that unifies them, particularly when they're operating in a challenging market. And it's incredible to me to look at some of the early stage companies that I'm involved in and how they're going through a chain cycle now because the company has matured, but it's time, quite frankly, to make some changes in the leadership team yeah. because of the scale that they've reached and what they need to do the next cycle around. And that's where I get to be very, very involved, quite frankly. Okay. That's great. Um, so we are out of time. I do have one last question, which okay. is, um, are you writing a book? And Hell it, no. <laughs> some of us, I've been asked to write a book, oh my gosh, for years. Yeah. And I just don't believe in that. I, my view is the world will come to interpret who I am and what I've done based upon what they learn. I don't need to tell the world yeah. who I am and what I've done. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed learning about your career and preparing for this session. And, and thank you for sharing this, uh, your, your lessons with the team. My pleasure. So thank you, thank you, you all much, very guys. much. Yeah. So,
Thank you so much, John and Paul. What an inspiring talk. I, I really got inspired about the lifelong learning and never retiring. I really like that mentality. Wow, well, the, the, the storytelling. And backstage, John just came up to me and said, hi, I'm John, I'm a salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> Humble guy, <laughs> impressive. Okay, next, we have the second announcement of the founder stage today. What do we have up and coming, Jose? Yes, next we have Sabrina Maniscalco, CEO and co-founder at Al Algorithmic. Uh, they just announced a partnership with IBM a couple days ago, and they have an open Series A round. This is definitely Ooh. a company to watch. Yep, so everyone in, uh, in the audience, hook up with Sabrina, go and talk to her. Open A round. Yes. Sabrina, let's hear what you have. Welcome on stage. Is there anything more important? Imagine a world where every disease can be prevented or cured. Where the three words, no known cure, are no longer spoken. This is a future we want to build together. It's about your health. It's about my health. It's about all of us. But finding a new drug for a disease is hard. The cost of drug discovery has seen a tenfold increase since the 1980s and continues to rise every year. Yet the number of new drugs discovered remains approximately constant. This is not enough. 90% of drugs are not effective for half of the people they treat. We are facing a huge scientific challenge, but there is hope. We now know that health and disease must be understood within the context of the complex interactions between molecules and their surroundings. But this approach requires the analysis and computation of infinite amounts of data. While data-driven techniques being used today for drug discovery are powerful, we already know that these alone will not be enough. Why? Because today's approaches fail to capture key aspects of molecular biology. Molecules are quantum systems. This is a quantum problem that requires a quantum solution. Quantum mechanics is so much more than just a theory. It's a completely new way of looking at the world, evolving a changing paradigm, perhaps more radical than any other in the history of human thought. And yet, nature is quantum. The building blocks of our universe are quantum. So quantum physics provides us with a model and a description of nature and therefore, quantum computers are suited to fully model it and understand it. This includes our biology, the way in which cells interact with each other inside our body. Today, I'm here to tell you how to harness the power of quantum computers for drug discovery. One of the greatest challenges in drug discovery uh, is to predict with sufficient accuracy the binding of small molecules that are potential drugs to proteins that cause diseases in our body. This is crucial to understand how drug works and eventually to cure diseases. But this is also extremely difficult to do. Today, we know how to potentially solve this long-standing problem and open a new era for medicine. 
Quantum computers indeed possess the same properties that make molecules difficult to simulate on conventional computers. They are different, they are extremely powerful, and they will revolutionize the way in which we search for new drugs. The gigantic space of molecular compounds contains 10 to the 63 molecules. This is a number similar to the number of atoms in one million solar systems. This space is currently mostly unexplored and inaccessible by conventional computers. So what can we do? Well, quantum computers will provide access to this space. And I'm going to tell you how. Today, I'm bringing to you the dawn of quantum, Aurora, our state-of-the-art drug discovery platform that combines very powerful conventional algorithms with our proprietary quantum software. This is changing the way in which medicine will work. We use quantum computers only to boost the part of the simulation that is not accessible by conventional algorithms such as machine learning or tensor network methods. Let me explain you how Aurora works. It consists of three steps, processing, sorry, pre-processing, processing, and post-processing. I will use an analogy to explain it to you. Imagine that you want to take the most beautiful picture. So you have to hire a studio, you position the lighting and the camera, you choose the best setting, and you buy the most expensive camera available on the market. This is the hardware for your quant to perform your photograph. And once the photo is taken, you send it to a retouching studio to clean it up even farther. This is exactly how Aurora is working. In pre-processing, we optimize the input for the quantum computer. This means to select that part of the chemical reaction that is impossible to simulate classically. Of course, we need to choose the language of quantum computers, so to go from molecules and electrons to qubits. In processing, we give instructions to the quantum machine to perform a given calculation. Each computation is a sequence of operations, so we need to optimize the sequence of operations to perform the calculation on the quantum hardware. Finally, in post-processing, we, we clean up the results of the previous step. Today's quantum computers are far from being ideal. They are error prone so we need to clean up the noise from the hardware in order to make the results of the computation useful. Now, of these three steps, each of them requires very complex optimization procedures. But our groundbreaking discovery is at the interface between processing and post-processing. We have indeed discovered a method to combine the outcome of quantum computers with the most powerful classical method in a way that is accurate, efficient, and scalable. This makes Aurora the only platform on the market able to use existing quantum computers to solve problems that are of relevance for drug discovery. Yesterday, we announced a partnership with IBM to achieve quantum advantage for chemistry. Many of you may think that we are still far from that point, but I'm here to tell you that this will happen sooner than you expect. We have evidence that our algorithms run on 1,000 qubit quantum computers that IBM will deploy next year will have 10 million times improvement in error reduction, 1.4 billion times speed up in runtime, and 2.4 billion times cheaper molecular simulations. Of course, the progress of any software is inevitably linked to the hardware on which it runs. So, where do we stand now? Is quantum ready to make an impact, not in 10 years, but in two? And what should we do to make this happen? So how many of you know what this is? Okay. This is a very rare, but fully functioning reproduction 
uh, of the DSK, the user interface of the Apollo guidance system, the computer that brought men to moon and back. Because of the long distance traveled, it was not possible to rely uh, on computers on Earth. So it was necessary to have computers on the Apollo shuttle. That computer had 4 kilobytes of RAM and 32 kilobytes of hard drive. Overall, 100,000 times less processing power than a modern iPhone. Because of this, Margaret Hamilton and her team of software engineers had to devise a very complex algorithm. You see it here in the picture in order to prevent and correct all the errors. Of course, if you would have asked her, she would have preferred to have a better hardware, but she didn't have it, both because computers were at their infancy and because there was limited space in the command module. So NASA engineers had to work together both on hardware and on software to squeeze out everything that was possible from the limited ability and availability of these computers. Recently, she said in an interview, looking back, we were the luckiest people in the world. There was no choice but to be pioneers, no time to be beginners. Today, we are the dreamers, the explorers, the pioneers. Aurora is the dawn of the quantum era. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Now on to the next topic. Niklas Sandström founded Skype in 2003 when the world was still figuring out how the internet worked. More notably, uh, the European tech ecosystem was still very much nascent. Since then, we've come a long way. By 2021, Europe's startup pipeline matched the US. Europe reached over 100 billion in startup found funding in 2021. While these are fantastic figures, Niklas believes that the con continent is uniquely positioned to continue growing in relevance. More importantly, we have the chance to focus on problems that matter. Niklas is CEO and founding partner at the London headquartered venture capital firm Atomico, investing in game-changing tech companies at Series A and beyond. I have to mention, Niklas is also a long-time Slush fan, been mm -hmm. here more than 10 years, I think. <laughs> Niklas is an experienced technology investor and entrepreneur, having previously co-founded and managed globally suc successful technology companies, including Skype, Kaza, and Yoltid. Join us now to hear Niklas' thoughts on how founders, LPs, and VCs alike can ensure the next decade of European growth, characterized by sustainable growth on all fronts. This is Tech Reset, a stronger Europe. Welcome on stage, Niklas.
Well, it's exciting to be here. It's been a few years since I was on stage at Slush. There's so many of you this year. So being here is a personal highlight for me. Thank you for joining me today. Of course, a lot has changed since I was on stage at Slush last time in 2019. There are many new challenges. Market volatility, macro uncertainty, things look very different. But in some ways, this feels familiar. I started CASA in 2000 and Skype a few years later, just after stocks crashed 80% in the dot-com crash. And at first I thought, wow, I missed the boat. Seriously, it was scary, much worse than it is today. I'd given up a good job, stock options, my career to become an entrepreneur together with a colleague. It was nearly impossible to raise funding for Skype. We did manage to get a check of $100,000 from Bill Draper. Even back then, it wasn't a lot of money. So sometimes, actually many times, we were really worried about making payroll. But then a funny thing happened. We managed to find a way through. As our bank balance dwindled, we became scrappy and cost efficient. So what I realized was that more resilient and enduring companies are created in downturns. And based on what I saw then and I'm experiencing today, I've never been more excited about what Europe is building. The reset presents Europe's first real test since the global financial crisis. And I believe it's also one of the best opportunities in the last 20 years. Because we're here today united by one common goal. We're all in the business of talent, innovation, and long-term company building. And innovation by talented founders is decoupled from the financial market. You wake up, you see a problem, you try to fix it. That's got nothing to do with NASDAQ. That means that the strength of European tech is about building a future-facing ecosystem, one that can withstand economic cycles and come through stronger. An ecosystem that supports the boldest founders, whatever is happening in, in the world. At Atomico, we spent a lot of time speaking with our founders over the last several months. A few of them are facing really tough decisions, cuts, layoffs, down rounds, and even closing down. We must not be afraid of the difficult choices that this reset brings. Just look at Google's layoffs in 2009 or Amazon's stock price crashing by over 90% in 2002. They made some tough decisions in this period of turbulence, and they come through stronger. And it was just a bump in the road. So we see over and over that great companies find a way through these difficult times. European founders created Stripe, Supercell, and Truecaller after the 2008 global financial crisis. It's worth remembering that from that one small check and a few tough years, Skype became the biggest tech M&A after the dot-com crash. So starting a company in a more challenging funding environment forged the resilience 
that made these companies special. So this is where context is critical. We've all been trained to believe that a company's ultimate value is reflected in its valuation today. Well, as an entrepreneur and an investor, I can say this. Your valuation today matters less than you may think. It's just a reality. The cost of capital is more expensive, but it is still available. So we shouldn't lose sight of the ultimate goal to build for the long term. And that will ultimately mean that you will have to sustain through different cycles to different environments. The winning path isn't always a straight line, and it wasn't for me. We rarely acknowledge that the ecosystem need the firms which don't make it. 50% of startups fail to raise the second round, and only 1.2% can scale to billion dollar plus valuations. We learn through adversity. Even if we fail, we learn how to build a business, how to develop technology, how to solve hard problems, and give a team an opportunity to experience a high growth environment. And I've learned when something isn't working, you have to change it. That could mean making cuts, taking a down round, or even being acquired. Even shutting down can be healthy as it releases founders and talent from stagnant firms to take chances on other companies with greater potential. This is a time of tough choices. It's also a period of enormous potential. A whole generation that has only experienced the good times in the bull market is learning an important lesson. And when applied, this will strengthen the ecosystem. So what happens if you choose not to make these hard decisions? Keeping a company on life supports traps scarce resources, talent, and capital in a company that will not achieve its goals. That's bad for everyone. I know how hard it is because I founded and folded a couple of companies prior to Skype. Each time I failed was scary. It was painful. I spent a lot of time beating myself up about my obligations to my team, to my investors, my customers, and my family. In reality, it wasn't as big a deal as I thought it was. My team, they had a great experience and they got amazing jobs. Of course, I brought the best ones with me to the next idea. The only thing that crashed was my dream. And okay, maybe my ego. But once it was over, I had the opportunity to start afresh and I was even more motivated to prove I could build a successful company. So let's talk about the thing that usually no one of us wants to discuss, and one of the hardest choices. That's down rounds. There's a stigma. We turn the down round into the worst case scenario. We're embarrassed what it may say about our business that is worth less today than it was a year ago. Data shows an uptick in uh, down rounds in the third quarter of this year, with almost 19% of all European VC rounds are fitting this criteria. And this is up from 12% in Q2. The trend is, of course, continuing in Q4. But I'd like to challenge you to think about down rounds in a different way. Because in 
a downturn, a low revaluation means something quite different. Firstly, down rounds are just a function of the broader market. It's the reality we're facing right now. People aren't willing to pay the same amount for a technology company as they were a year ago. Technology investments in Q3 is down 30% for, um, versus the same period previous year. At Series A, pre-man evaluations in Q4 so far has fallen as much as 62% from the heights in the beginning of this year. Series B valuations are down 57%. And there is no sign of this changing anytime soon. In this environment, a lower valuation is no reflection on you. It's just market dynamics. Secondly, if you need to raise, do it right away. The biggest issue with down, down rounds is that people leave them so late. It's easy to hope that market will improve, and I've seen plenty of founders putting off the fundraising, hoping that things will change. For a company that is pre-profit, that means eating into future runway. And the less runway a company has, the more risk is associated with it. In just six short months, the fundraising prospects may shift from having a choice of clean term sheets from supportive investors to rescue financing littered with aggressive terms such as liquidation preferences and exit vetoes. And that's not a situation that I would like for a founder. So don't let that be you. Thirdly, down and flat rounds are really about growth. Raising money strategically before the point of no return could prove a masterstroke. Any founder would encourage to raise money early on clean terms can continue to scale at a time when others are pulling back and losing talent. This may be the single best time to hire great talent away from com competition and consolidate your market position. Whether the market is shifting in one or three years, these firms won't have stood still. But what if you have to make the ultimate decision to close down your business? In my experience, when you come back as a repeat founder of companies that didn't work, you come back differently. You have a stronger determination to succeed because you have a stronger will to prove that you can build a successful business. And actually, we need that. For me, the third time we started a business, we invented Skype. The lessons that we learned the first time around and the second time around made Skype what it was. I'm sure there are some second and third time founders in the audience here today, so give me a wave. Hello. Awesome. I'm sure some of you can relate to this, because four in 10 founders who achieve some venture funding aren't first timers. And this raises to six in 10 unicorn founders. Those who have the guts to come back fighting are more likely winners. I know this from experience. So the reset is an opportunity. It can help Europe to, to mature exponentially quicker by developing this resilience muscle fast. We can create a stronger ecosystem, founders and talent with extra grit to sustain the difficult times. But speed matters. The sooner we recognize that this is the new, norm, new normal, at least for the foreseeable future, and take the necessary steps to ensure the longevity of our businesses, the sooner we can move to solid foundation and keep building. 
our expectations may have to change. Timetables most certainly will. But this does not diminish our ambition nor potential. There are fewer distractions, and no one is talking about froth anymore. We need true vision more than ever. We can now focus our resources on technologies that can solve large-scale problems with greater urgency. We must show the next generation of talent the true potential of technology in solving large problems. But let's talk for a moment about monetary value. When I need some perspective, I look at the NASDAQ Composite Index over time. These companies have grown their aggregate revenues from less than one trillion in 2000 to almost seven trillion today. Of course, over these 20 plus years, there have been periods of time with less growth. When you zoom in to the global financial crisis or the dot com crash, we can see that revenues plateaued. But when you zoom out, we see the trend, consistent long-term growth, and the bumps in the road are barely visible. Europe's tech ecosystem is the best it's ever been. We have the toolkit to succeed. This talk today may mean different to each one of you, the economic environment affects all of us. For some of you, maybe it's less extreme. Nonetheless, I hope that hearing about my experience gives you a different perspective about the challenges that you face. Whatever is happening in the market, there are fundamentals that don't change. Entrepreneurs are the game changers for a more imaginative, and sustainable world. Do not change your vision. We need your bold ideas more than ever. Keep building, keep believing. There will be those who say that now is a time to play it safe. But I truly believe this moment right now could be the best time to deliver inspired solutions to the significant challenges the world is facing. There's so much important work to do. So I'm excited to see what you will build from this reset. Thank you. Thank you, Niklas. Next. Sebastian Siemietkowski has been building the Swedish Global Bank payments and shopping platform for 17 years now. Klarna has made a lasting impact on the global and European fintech industry. It's one of the most definitive startups in Europe to date. 2022, however, hasn't been the easiest year for the company. As an entrepreneur, you need a high risk tolerance and immense courage and often overshadowed by other qualities, you need resilience. As said, Sebastian is the co-founder and CEO of Klarna. Klarna has been on a mission to revolutionize the retail banking industry, meeting the changing demands of consumers by saving them time and money while helping them be informed and in control of their personal finances. Sebastian will be on stage with Jessica Schultz, partner at Northstone. At Northstone, her main focus is D2C and consumer internet. Her portfolio includes Redpoints, Naked, Smart Smart, and Klarna, to name a few. Nice. This is bouncing back, Klarna's path to a stronger growth. Welcome on stage, Sebastian and Jessica.
So thank you, Sebastian, for joining us on stage today. I'm going to move so I can see yeah. a little bit better. Uh, very excited to host this fireside chat with you. You've been leading Klarna for almost 17 years now. Actually, more this. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> uh, and today we focus a little bit on resilience and your vision for the future. And 2022 hasn't been the easiest year for the company, but you came out stronger and more convinced than ever that the industry needs to change. Uh, Klarna is one of the most category-defining companies in Europe, and you have more than 150 million users. Um, and um, let us start from the beginning. Uh, what was the vision when you founded Klarna, and how has that changed over the years? Yeah. It's funny you say that. I, um, I think it was a few months ago where I found this old email that I wrote when we were three co-founders. And um, mm. uh, this email is written like a few weeks into the company started. And it basically goes something, hey, Victor and Nicholas, which were my co-founders. Um, I'm sitting here. It's 11.30 PM. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wouldn't it be cool if we actually continue growing this and kind of grew into more countries? and eventually really took on the big banks and gave them a hard time and stuff like that. Um, and so obviously reading that email, finding it among my old emails, it's like, actually, that's pretty much how I would describe things today. Um, so as much as obviously that sounded extremely crazy and aspirational back then, it hasn't really changed. Like, it's, it's the same thing. Uh, very, very inspiring. Um, but You've been dealing with uncertainty for over 70 years now, and also being in a heavily regulated industry. Uh, it's probably fair to say that you've seen more than most. Um, what's your view on the current market conditions for running a large tech company today? Wow. Uh, first, I had to reflect on the fact that I'm suddenly one of the oldest <laughs> instead of one of the youngest. I know. <laughs> uh, but uh, OK, digesting that. Um, no, I think, look, before this whole thing happened, I happened to meet one of the uh, very successful investors in this industry, uh, DST. And we were having a discussion, and we were talking about the fact that digitalization has continued to transform our society, and has been doing so ever since 99, and over dot .com, and then over to the financial crisis of 2007. And and as much as things go up and things go down and people have this, that trend is not changing. Like, it is eating into the rest of our lives. It's changing our world. And it will continue to do so. And it's actually done it at a fairly consistent pace, mm -hmm. independently of all the you know, movements and you know, investor sentiment and all the other things. So I feel extremely uh, optimistic about the long-term opportunities uh, from that perspective. And there's been a lot of public speculation about Klarna's valuation recently. Uh, and it's a lot of people that want to paint this black and white story of total success or utter failure. It's too high, it's too low. And uh, I think we heard it all, and in very quick succession. Uh, how have you been able to turn out that noise and focus on what's really important? And how important is actually the valuation to you? Well, first of all, I think actually what you said is extremely important, that it is noise to some degree, right? Obviously, you need to take into consideration the macro environment. You need to take into consideration what's going on around you. But I do think as a founder and entrepreneur, a lot of the, uh, what you need to do is filter and ask yourself, of all the things that are happening around me in the world, what are the things that really matter that I'd really need to pay attention to? And so I do think still you can describe some of it noise. Again, the valuation of Klarna is not something I decide. It's the investors that decide what they want to value the company at. And when I look at it, basically a year ago or, or up until that time, as much as today people may look at a company at like Klarna and say, oh my god, how were you, you know, where, how, where did you, how, how could you invest $100 million a month at the pace where you were loss making $100 million a month? But if you go, it's easy with the benefit of insight. If you go back a year from now, at that point in time, Klarna was valued $45, $50 billion. That means that we, capital was so cheap that we were diluting our shareholders 2% a year in order to invest and lean into the future. That, to me, is a very rational decision 
to say, I'm going to dilute 2% a year because there's a tremendous huge opportunity ahead of us that we want to lean into. Investor sentiment then dramatically shifts in the last year, and obviously valuations come down. Unfortunately then, as a CEO and, and, and a major uh, and a shareholder and, and responsible for my employees, for my customers, for my shareholders, we jointly as a team came together and had to change. We had to make a change to how much we were investing and how much we were leaning into the future and focus more on the now and the profitability and the success of the company. So to me, it's, I mean, I don't control what happens out in the world, I, I, but I can affect obviously what we do and I can try to reflect on that. And I think, to come back to your noise, when a COVID happened, at that point in time, there was a few weeks when everyone thought that the world was falling off a cliff. And, and I had investors calling me like, why are you not reducing your spend? Why are you not? And even some companies started acting as well. But at that point in time, I felt like, you know what? We are 6,000 employees. You also want a captain that is steady on the ship. You, don't want to, you can't turn a tanker around when it's our size. And so we said, let's wait for a few weeks, see how things develop. And we saw that actually it led to a digital acceleration at that point in time. So what would have been the wrong decision, right? Uh, this time around, we, we concluded differently, and some with us. Some companies actually took action already in May around the new environment. Some are taking action now. But, uh, you know, I think to me that's how you have to do it. Yeah. And you actually completed one of the biggest fundraisers in Europe this year. So congratulations on Thank that. Uh, what will you use the new capital for? Well, so to us, it was very clear. Like, again, I, maybe because I do have the benefit of, my God, now I sound like an old stud again. But <laughs> I do have the benefit of, like, I did take Klarna through the financial crisis of 2007. So oh, it, it became very apparent to me as we were fundraising that it was a very new environment. Uh, you know, stock markets were plummeting every week. Our peers like PayPal was dropping. I mean, the, the value change in Klarna is the same as PayPal. Like, there's no difference. So our, our public peers have seen a similar loss in, in valuation. And so when I saw that, then the conclusion was, okay, we're going to have to move towards profitability. Uh, in our case, the benefit is we do have a very strong business model. So we actually make about a billion dollars in gross profit in Europe. But we were investing heavily in the US, and that was making the company loss-making. So basically, we just had to put ourselves a plan that would take us back to profitability. And um, we set out that, that we were hoping to accomplish that by like, somewhere after summer next year, which we still think is achievable, and we've been delivering against that plan. So to me, that's just like, you know, you put a new plan in place, and then you have to go and try to <laughs> accomplish it, right? Like, Pretty much it. Yeah, and there's been a lot of discussions now as well about the crisis and the increase in consumer spending. Looking at the macro effect and kind of the shift you had to do, how have you been reshifting priorities? And in that process of getting to profitability then, how do you motivate the team to stay, you know, keep innovating, scaling, stay connected to the vision when you go from kind of the high growth to the more profitable growth route? So two things. So first, Klarna is a lender, so one of our products is credit. It's not the only product as much as media sometimes uh, portrays it that way. Uh, actually, almost 50% of our transactions are debit, um, so people pay the full amount. But we have a credit part, and as a responsible lender, when you see macroeconomics change, you do have to change your underwriting. So basically, already in January, actually almost a year ago, we already started tightening a little bit, and then in May, we tightened even further. And that is a combination of the company's responsibility towards our shareholders and our employees because we decrease our losses. But it's also a responsibility to people borrowing, right? That you don't want them to overextend in a tougher economical environment. So, so that has been done. Um, separately to that, the second part to your, you know, how does the team, and obviously, first and foremost, it's extremely sad and tough to, and I think a lot of companies here that may be struggling now with financing or whatever, like it is one of the most painful things to have the, to part with colleagues and people that you worked really hard to recruit and suddenly you're asking them to leave, right? So that is obviously very sad. Uh, but I also have to consider that people are staying. I have to consider our customers. That is the challenge of being a CEO. You have to think about all stakeholders, right? Um, so you have to think about that. And a lot of our employees are also shareholders. So they're kind of, they have both perspective. Um, so that's very hard, but I also felt in our case, we tried to do the best out of that. We definitely did tons of, you know, mistakes 
as we were trying to do that process as good as you can. Unfortunately, as most, I think, founders will learn, there is no good way to let somebody go. Like, there is no good way to do it. Like, there's a less bad way <laughs> or a, a very bad way, but there's no good way. So you try to learn from it. You try to take, you know, uh, to do the best that you can. Um, but I would say, at least within Klon, I feel a tremendous momentum. After summer, people had a little bit, you know, we did it in May. In summer, people had the chance to relax a little bit, you know, and recharge their batteries. And then they came back, and now there's a tremendous momentum. And I do think that maybe also a little bit, we're starting to see both investors and employees say, you know what, you guys took action early on. And that's actually a good thing, um, as opposed to some others taking action now. So, and also, actually, even if you think about the people who we had to let go, in a way, they were lucky because they went out into employment market where they could still get a job. If, if we would have done the same today, it would have been much harder for them to get a job. So it's almost like, you know, in the end, I think, again, I, when I look around and look at other companies, I think it's the strength if they, once situations really change, they're willing to take the actions. It doesn't mean that it's easy or empathetically easy, but it, it, I still think it's the strength that you do it. And I yeah. think it's, you know... It's the right thing to do. Yeah, for sure. And we're in front of this very ambitious entrepreneurial audience. I was told that it's 12,000 people here this year. Uh, so if you would speak to the entrepreneurs in the audience, what is the one piece of advice you have for kind of how to navigate the current environment? No, but I think it comes back to that. What I just said is that, you know, take action, right? Like, don't hope that things will become better but take the actions that you need to take. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the only advice that makes sense. Now, then it's always, it's always easy when you're on a stage like this to say that, and then, you know, consequently, every company is different, every environment is different. Um, at least to us, what we also tried to do is, we tried to do it where we said, let's try to do it enough so we don't have to do it, like, multiple times. Um, Obviously, then media has reported that we've made some changes afterwards, but that's just, we did that before this as well. That's just a big company does changes to the organization now and then, so it's not necessarily associated with this. But, but like, I would just say, like, make sure that when you do it, do, like, do it properly, right? Uh, so you take the actions that you need to do, if you need to do them, right? Mm. And as a founder and a CEO, you're surrounded by lots of people, but I can imagine that it's also a very lonely place. You talked about the different stakeholders, you're under immense pressure, you're in the media, uh, you have to think about your message to every you know, separate stakeholder. How are you working with support, advice? How have you worked with that in your, in your role at Klarna? Well, so I, well, two things. First and foremost, I got to say, like, I have... Michael Moritz on my board, uh, who's been supporting me from Sequoia for 12 years. I don't know, maybe some venture funds are short-term capital. I can tell you Sequoia is not. They're long-term <laughs> capital. 12 years, I think, is proof of that. And Michael's commitment is just crazy that he's been with me so long. Uh, and he obviously has backgrounds, been at Google and YouTube and PayPal and all these companies. So that has meant the world to me and, and Michael's and Sequoia's support. I think in addition to that, I have a wife who runs a fantastic startup called Milky Wire. Go check it out, by the way. <laughs> Don't care about Klarna much. Go check Milky Wire out. It's um, really cool. Yeah, but it's, it's really cool. And so that's obviously a benefit at home. It's fun that we have you know, commonalities. We can share, um, share experiences and we can talk about similar challenges. That's, that, that helps. But, but to give also a little bit of like just my history in this, I went to a psychiatrist for multiple years. I tried that. I went to cognitive behavioral therapy. I have, um, you know, I've tried meditation and all that stuff as well, even though it didn't work that well for me. Um, so I've been trying to be open-minded and, and try a lot of ways. And I've had mentors and people who've, you know, who I've, I, I always say that to younger entrepreneurs as well, like find somebody that you think could be helpful and, and don't look that much to like tech. Rather, if you're like, if you're food tech, Go and find some slightly more senior person that's worked in the food industry for 40 years. Because there you're going to find a very different perspective and insight than if you go to another tech person. It's just, you, you, we tend to kind of set ourselves in an echo chamber where we're kind of surrounded by people that have very similar experiences. It doesn't really challenge you that much. So I've been trying to seek out people with a very different background. 
Uh, yesterday, I was in Derbyshire visiting the Toyota factory, learning about you know, Toyota Way and agile working together with you know, 20, 30 top managers at Klarna. Super interesting, right? Very different world than the one that we work in. So that's some of the maybe advice. I, I always hate saying advice because I feel a bit like everyone is unique. Everyone has their own prerequisites. So not everything is generally applicable. But uh, yeah, if something, then I, I think that helps. Mm. Very useful. And you spoke a little bit about the past year, but looking at where you are now with the company versus a year ago, where are you now? How do you feel about the current position? Well, so I was... So <laughs> Nina, my wife, she told me when, I, when she, she knew I was going to come on stage, she said, like, tell everyone the title of the seminar is wrong because there is no bounce back. <laughs> you guys are doing better than ever. <laughs> so now I've said it. Um, <laughs> And I think she was right to some degree that like, people tend to look at the perception in the media and like valuation was this and valuation was that. That's an external valuation of our work. Right? So the way I think about it in many ways, my learning over the years is like you have three things. You have something I call internal momentum, which to me is like the spirit within the company. It's when I walk around, when I talk to managers, when I talk to people, how much things am I seeing happening? Are we producing new products, new features? Are things happening? Do I see what to me looks like sound and smart decisions? Are people challenging each other? Is it a good environment? That's my momentum. Then I have the P&L, which is you know, the actual performance, financial performance. And then finally, I have the external perception or valuation of the stock and kind of the external view of what's going on. And obviously, in the long term, these are 100% correlated. They will, you know, internal momentum will read to great P&L, and then that would be... But what you've learned after 17 years is in the short term, they can be extremely not correlated, right? And so if you look at it currently, in the last few years, Klarna's internal momentum has been improving a lot. And I, I wasn't that happy when I was walking around you know, seven, eight years ago. I felt that we were slow, becoming bureaucratic, that the organization wasn't where it needed to be. And I knew that eventually that would show in the P&L. But at that point in time, we had the momentum from the early days that was still you know, making our P&L look great. Now we're in this fantastic internal momentum, and actually our P&L is great as well. So we have great performance and improvements. If you compare to a year ago, we see st strong growth, we see improvements in our gross profitability, we're moving towards the plan. Perception <laughs> is something very different. I can't control that. Like, I mean, I can control it to some degree. I'm trying to give interviews, and I'm trying to talk to journalists and hope that they kind of you know, report on both aspects. But in the end, you know, it is what it is, right? And, and obviously, it does affect people. Like, I mean, valuation, we have shareholders and so forth. So I'm not saying it's all perception. There is obviously reality to that as well. But, but I can focus on internal momentum. If, that, if I do that well, P&L will come. And then eventually, the third thing will come as well. So looking ahead then, can you let us in on the plan for Klarna? What's the, say, long-term vision? And kind of what are you building towards? Yeah, so I think, look, Financial services are extremely exciting to me because they are this tremendous industry. I mean, I think the total addressable market is like trillions of dollars, whatever. Uh, so it's just big. You don't even need to size it. You can just say it's big. Um, in addition to that, banks haven't served us consumers well. Like, the services are so-so. And many times, they are built against us. Anyone who wants to learn more about it, go to Netflix, look at credit cards explained for 25 minutes, and you will just realize the amount of tricks that this industry has applied to make as much money as possible to the disadvantage of consumers. Listen to banks talking at investor relations. They will talk about maximizing interest rate spread. What does that mean? It sounds nice when you think about it, but think about it from a consumer perspective or a customer. It means I'm going to offer you as little on your deposit accounts in savings as possible, and I'm going to maximize how much interest I charge you for your loans. That's maximizing interest rate spread. That is directly in conflict with your customer's best interest. So there's this tremendous industry. It's broken, and it needs competition. It desperately needs competition. And the best way it's going to get competition is to customer mobility for consumers to be easily switch, right? So if you, if you make it easier to switch, technology can help that. So when I look into the future for myself, I think that like at some point of time, you'll wake up in the morning 
and your computer will say, hey, I looked at your mortgage tonight, and I realized I could save you $5 by switching from you know, this bag to that bag, and the only thing you need to do is say yes. I mean, I don't know how long we take before we're there. It's a bit like self-driving cars. They seem to actually be happening now, long after the hype is gone. But like, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And what it means is, at that point of time, banking will not be about maximizing interest rate spread. It will be about providing the most value for you as a consumer. Save time, save money, make you feel less worried about your finances. So that is the direction it has to go. And so to me, that has been the, you know, the direction years ago, and it's still the direction. That's what I want to accomplish. I want to be one of the players that accomplishes that and that pushes the envelope in that direction. So. Very exciting. And there's a lot of speculation in the media about an IPO and kind of your, are you staying private? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, so it's funny because we've gotten that question multiple times. Uh, we have been, yeah, I've been trying to be very consistent. So to me, it's, it's quite easy. Um, I think Google's IPO is my dream IPO. It was done in 2004 or 5, I can't remember, a little bit later, but it, the markets were quite stable at that point of time. It was not dot com, it wasn't overhyped, it wasn't underhyped. Google was in a good position. They still had a lot of growth ahead of themselves, but they have also accomplished a lot of things. If I look at the market conditions, maybe one or two years from now, we'll start getting into that sane market. I think it's probably over-depressed at the moment. And then from a company perspective, I think in one or two years, I mean, US is already our largest market by revenue. Um, we are very close to making it gross profit profitable. And we're going to see profitability for Klarna by, you know, second half of next year. So at that point of time, you know, in one or two years, yeah, it's probably you start getting to that position when, when that makes sense. Extremely impressive. So I see time flies. Uh, one last question. Uh, focusing a little bit more on the current environment, your vision for the future, what are the things you see in the market today that we should get used to because they will continue? And when do you think, uh, when do you think things will improve again and get better? Uh -huh. Well, I, I think first and foremost, like, I, I always feel difficult to answer that question mm. because if you turn on any business TV channel, you're going to find a lot of people in suits that are going to provide you advice on this topic. And I find them as believable as any horoscope that I can read in a newspaper. So like, I don't think anyone <laughs> really knows. And, um, but obviously, right now, it seems that we're going to go through a recession. It seems as if we're going to have a tougher time ahead of ourselves, and at least for Klon and for our company, we've taken a decision to assume that and prepare ourselves for that. Um, and then, you know, who knows? I, 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 I think at least one thing that I do believe clearly on this is when it comes to e-commerce companies, I think investors are overreacting, especially. I think e-commerce companies are strong and have tremendous opportunity. And I think sometimes markets just are, sorry to say so, a little bit stupid. Right now, when we look at e-commerce companies that are public, you're comparing them to COVID. And now we don't have COVID anymore. So you're comparing apples to the bananas. It is unthinkable that they would see the growth rate they saw a year ago. And I feel sometimes the market really doesn't give any attention to that topic. Like, it seems to totally ignore it. And that's at least my perception. Um, so I feel like I believe e-commerce we're seeing good growth in our e-commerce company. We see e-commerce. Like, obviously, no, if you compare year on year, it's, it's slowed down. But that's just natural. Give it a full cycle of one year, and the comparisons will look better again, right? So I think especially for a lot of like, e-commerce-centric companies, like, hang in there. <laughs> like, a lot of it is just perception. At least our numbers look great. Like, we're, we're seeing great momentum. Uh, our transactions and volume are up 25%, 30% year on year. Like, it looks great. Like, it's not, it doesn't look as bad as it does in the press, right? So, so I think a little bit of that is just what do you compare to? Um, and just keep that in mind. Thank you so much for giving us a glimpse on how you navigate the uncertainty, Sebastian. A round of applause for Sebastian at Klarna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian and Jessica.
Coach Hub is one of the fastest growing ad tech companies in Europe, expanding rapidly since its founding in 2018. Today, the company operates in 90 countries across six continents in 60 different languages. Think about that. Impressive. How do you navigate and manage such intense global expansion? Next, we discuss how to expand and launch different markets while meeting varying customer needs and localization at scale. Matti is co-founder and managing director of Coach Hub, the leading global digital coaching platform on a mission to democratize coaching worldwide. Funded with over $330 million, CoachUp has scaled to a team of over 850 people. Matti is a serial entrepreneur and a former management consultant at McKinsey with over 15 years of experience in future of work, startups, and digital business building. And with him, we have Christoph, a partner at Molten Ventures, leading the DUC activities with focus on B2B marketplaces and enterprise businesses. This is Around the World in 80 Days, Go Coach Hub's guide to expansion. Welcome on stage, Mari and Christoph. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us on stage. Um, today, we're going to talk about CoachUp. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm a partner with Molten, and we led the Series B round. But since we invested, a lot, of has, a lot of has changed. So the question for me is, how did you initially come up with the idea of CoachUp? And how has coaching changed? And then we jump a bit more into the expansion piece, which is the topic of today um, around the world in 80 days. Yeah, thanks for the question, Chris. And thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it feels like yesterday, but in fact, it's four years ago that it was my brother, Janis, and myself sitting in his living room and um, dreaming out loud, I would say, and um, both with a track record of an entre being entrepreneurs for the last 15 years. We said, you know what? Life is too short to do something that is not meaningful. So what we said is the next big thing that we want to commit a significant part of our lives on that should be building a good business. And what does building a good business mean for us? On one hand, of course, it needs to be commercially good, good unit economics, good market potential, good growth potential, plus at the same time doing something good, doing something with a purpose. And that is actually what coaching means for me. Um, I know some of you might have uh, experience with coaching. For myself, it was definitely life-changing. When I was a first-time manager 15 years ago, um, I was coming fresh out of university, and I was completely overwhelmed. Um, you learn so much great stuff at university. At most uni universities, you don't learn how to manage people, how to manage your stakeholders, and I didn't even learn how to manage myself. So, that's when my coach helped me to really overcome my challenges and to really become a better version of myself. And as Janis and me were discussing four years ago, we said, you know what? Coaching is so powerful. And every top executive, every top politician, every top sports person, they all have their own coach. But why is it actually that only 0.01% of the global workforce have access to coaching? And that's when we said, okay, this is what we want to change. Let's democratize coaching. Let's make it accessible for people of all career levels worldwide. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Today, you're considered as one of the global category leaders in that space. Tell us a bit more about the experience of so when you initially started, how companies or corporates uh, talked to you, what they perceived, what coaching means, and today, right? So I'm sure that was a very interesting journey with lots of experiences uh, down the road. But just share a little bit how this actually evolved. Yes, happy to. And I mean, when I look in this audience, what do I see? And maybe do this, look around, look left to you, right to you, behind you. What do we see? Individuals, 
different dreams, hopes, fears, challenges. And for hundreds of years, corporates would support their people in having one-off classroom trainings. Oh, no, now you're a manager. Now you have to do this. Oh, now you're being promoted. Now we want to have this career program. Now we want to have a transition. Now we want to digitize. Now we want to have a cultural change. And you know what? It doesn't work this way because we are individuals, because we want to be addressed with our own needs and our own opportunities to really unleash our own potential. And that is actually what we are helping our clients with. And side note, yes, all the new talent generations ask for this. It's not so much about, okay, who's driving the fastest car or who's earning the biggest paycheck? Nowadays, it's about personal development, growth, and purpose at work. And uh, for the first time in history, technology, AI, video conferencing, all this information are helping us to scale something as unique as coaching, which in the old day was only uh, uh, available to the executive throughout the entire organization. And that's what we're doing, really helping our clients. Most of them are, are corporates, really the, the who is who from Toyota, Fujitsu, Saint-Gobain, BNP, Paribas, Coca-Cola, Twitter, you name it, to scale coaching across their workforce. So tell us a bit more. So initially you started off in Berlin, so with a very strong focus on the German-speaking market. But then obviously you acquired a, a player in France uh, last year, which obviously put you into the European leadership uh, in, in, this, in, in, in this industry. And so now you're going after the global um, category leadership. What has changed, not only in terms of organization, but also in terms of the audience that you're talking to, are you talking now to the, the head of talent development in the big corporates, or is it still more local divisions that you're talking to? How, how has that changed? So let me take one step back. When I was a little boy, I always wanted to go into international politics. I wanted to become a diplomat. I actually, my grades were not good enough to, to, to go in this direction, but I studied law and, and did a little bit of work for the government until I realized, you know what, there's too much politics in politics for myself, but I still want to change the world. I still want to work in a very, very international setup. And that's when we said, you know what, if the public sector is not the right space, then let's go to an environment where you can create your own future and where you can actually shape this, this future. And in coaching, the wonderful thing, something is possible which is not possible in politics. A world without borders. We're having a global network of 3,500 coaches worldwide from over 80 nations coaching in any language that comes to any of your uh, your minds and this is really so rewarding because all of them collaborating all of them sharing this vision of making people's life better transforming careers transforming entire organizations and really building the future of people development so maybe quickly on your on your question on global category leadership um, I think many startups and many founders in Europe limit themselves Maybe that's something we've been taught at school or taught by our parents. No, stick to what you can, play it safe. And um, it took us a degree of craziness, I would say, to really launch this business four years with a very clear plan to build the global category leader in digital coaching and roll this out across the world. And I remember the very first weeks when we started the business, we were still two people. We looked at Wikipedia what are the 20 largest economies in the world? And we said, okay, let's go there and let's help them and let's really transform those, <laughs> those organizations over there. And that's what we did. We started uh, 2018 in Berlin, uh, where I'm born. Um, half a year later, we opened our UK operations, our French operations, our Scandinavian operations, Benelux, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, um, 
one and a half years ago in the US, North America, where we have 130 people, Latin America, Middle East, uh, we have our APEC HQ in, in Singapore. Um, we opened up our Shanghai uh, office quite a while ago. Two or three weeks ago, we opened up our office in Tokyo. And then in Melbourne, Singapore, we have another 30 people. So 850 people from, I believe, 50 nations. I would say we have the United Nations right under our roof at, at Coach Hub. Um, and that's really uh, rewarding. It's really been an 80 days around the world. Um, what was the craziest experience uh, on that journey? Which country in particular stood out? I would say every phase as an entrepreneur has its challenges. I would say maybe the most challenging moment was even getting the business started at a, at a period of time where uh, my wife was pregnant, I was in a stable job, and really to making this move as an entrepreneur to this uncertainty. No paycheck, you don't know if your business is going to fly or not. That was probably the biggest challenge to get uh, started. And then the ride over the last four years, that was just, uh, just incredible. And um, I think you know very good because we are collaborating since you let our uh, series be. Um, but in four years, we did seven funding rounds. And um, to really bring this business global and asking about what was maybe one of the tipping points and the game changer for us, that was, in fact, when we acquired um, the leading uh, player for digital coaching in France, which was the second largest uh, digital coaching platform in Europe, called Move One, uh, end of last year. And you significantly helped with this transaction. A um, hundred wonderful people in Paris and um, bringing about 80% of all French corporates as clients. That was really a game changer because all of a sudden, we grew into this position where we were the unrivaled number one here in Europe. And it sparked this idea of, no, why is it always the big US tech startups changing the world and coming here to Europe? Why is it always Amazon, Google, Facebook, and the like? We here in Europe can do so much more. So we really said, OK, even more now than ever, let's build a global player with the European DNA. Yeah. Um Look, I think you, you mentioned it already, to, to go international and to expand quickly, you obviously need to have a lot of capital on hand. Um, you, you raised 330 million to date, and just uh, a couple of months ago, you closed one of the largest rounds in Europe of 200 million. Um, how has the market changed compared to last year, and how, how was that fundraise? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge number, and, and how did you sort of convince the parties who joined the journey? So, in a nutshell, um I can honestly say I'm very glad I have a very good coach who supported me on the way because it was, it was very unexpected. And um, we're leaving end of last year on a back of very strong Q4 results. We said, you know what? It's going to be a walk in the park. January, we go out. Six weeks later, we're done. So instead of this expected six weeks walk in the park, it turned into six months of walk through constant fire. Um, I think it was a quite intense phase for all of us, um, but the results uh, were really strong, really worth all the efforts. And I'm very grateful for, for my wife and family and my coach and the entire team and our, our incredible investors to <laughs> really support this journey. Yeah, no, I think I can echo that. Um, looking a little bit into the future, so obviously now you're sitting on a lot of capital. How do you deploy it? What's the deployment plan and what are the next goals that you have set for the organization? Also in the current market environment, obviously, which is different. Yeah. Obviously, if you look at today's market, it's not the time of blitz scaling. It's not the time of coming up with crazy ideas we want to roll out across the world next year. At the same time, I am a firm believer, if you have a dream, then follow your dream and don't switch your plans every now and then. I remember when COVID hit uh, two years ago, so we were having intense discussion uh, in the board and many, many investors out there said, you know what, you need to completely change your pl uh, plans, you need to cost cut, you need to reduce your headcount. And we were having these discussions and uh, it was actually my brother, Janis, my co-founder, who mentioned, you know what? Let's keep calm, let's stick to the plan, clients will come. 
and eventually turns out COVID, we saw um, actually a very strong tailwind. Many, many organizations realized, you know what? You're doing coaching 100% digital. In the old world, I, th I thought that wouldn't be possible, but now I've run my entire organization remotely during COVID, so I understand that this is the future. And um, I know today's situation is not a health crisis, it's a financial uh, crisis that's different. At the same time, I still say, let's stick to the plan, let's be reasonable, let's make sure the business is fully funded in any case. That's a priority number one. I've learned my lessons the early days with other startups. Um, at the same time, yeah, also keep planting the seeds. So we keep growing in developing markets. We keep growing in, in, in Asia Pack. We keep investing and we heavily invest on one end in the sales side as well as in the product side of things. Because a challenging market situation also always is an opportunity. Um, yeah. No, I think th that makes a lot of sense. And the other question I have is, so I know that you internally always look at the 600 largest companies in the world. So tell us a bit more about this uh, metrics, which is probably new to a lot of the audience here. Um, why is that so important? And how did you decide, or how did you make the decision initially to move away from SME and really focus on those large enterprise clients only, which is basically what you do today? And then the second question is, how did it help with expansion, right? So landing those clients is obviously a bit harder, but then how do you expand them over time? Yeah. So. I mean, I can tell you when you are two founders in a living room and you're calling the sea level of Daimler, it's a hard sell. Um, it took a while. <laughs> At the same time, why did we take the different approach instead of like the typical startup approach? You work with SMB, then you go to mid-market and then you go to the enterprise level. We did it completely the other way around. The reason being is because we identified this incredible market opportunity. And if you look at trend agencies, if you look at the Gartner hype cycle on human capital technology, they are predicting 100x growth in the space. And they are predicting any major organization to implement a digital coaching solution at scale by the end of the decade. So that's a massive opportunity. And even though I'm sometimes joking and saying my brother Janis is the guy with the golden nose because he can smell nice business opportunities, I doubt that he's the only one who was smelling this opportunity. So we said, okay, we need to be fast. And corporate clients are, yes, they are the most toughest to crack, but they are also highly rewarding. They are very loyal. In uncertain times like this, where many companies are cutting their budgets, we don't see this with our corporate clients. They are long-term planning. We're supporting our large corporates with topics like the digital IT transformation or the culture transformation. And these are things and projects that are set up for 10 years. And what we are seeing is that our satisfaction score, we're measuring NPS for all our personas, it's at 70, which I believe is, is, is pretty nice. It's actually higher than the, than the Apple NPS, which means that our clients, employees love the Coach Up Coach more than Apple fans love their iPhone, yeah. which also results in quite nice uh, stickiness and retention rates. But this shows that the full focus on the top clients is so critical because this phase is a land grabbing phase. And um, no matter what's going on in public markets, in 10 years from now, the market shares are being split. Now is the time to actually gain those. And that obviously explains why you're so aggressively internationalized. Um, Today, you're, you're in Japan, you're in, in China, you're in India, you're also in the US. Tell us a bit more about the US. US, obviously, is the, the largest market with, I think, 225 out of the 600 largest companies in the world. What's the strategy for the US? How do you actually approach this, this huge, uh, gigantic market? For us, in general, our internationalization strategy is basically we're following our clients. When we started the business, we started from day one working with the large clients. Those large clients are typical multinational. Then we're following a land and expand approach. That means we're working maybe with one local entity in Central Europe. Then we're rolling out use cases. We're rolling out across geographies. Um, I know this leading um, e-commerce uh, companies, now they do a lot more stuff as well. They started in Central Europe, rolled out across the UK, rolled out then across North America, China, India, Australia, and the like. So that 
led us to also build our coach base globally. And then we said, you know what? We're having people being coached in all those geographies. We have coaches in all those geographies. There's a huge market. Okay, maybe we should also build a sales force in all those geographies. And that was for us the, the starting point. And if you look at markets, of course, Europe is a quite developed market. When it comes to coaching, the US is still the most mature market. And then Asia-Pac, it's a giant uh, a greenfield. Yeah. I mean, you already mentioned on the, on the demand side, obviously, a lot of the younger generation um, potential, high potentials, they're asking for coaching, right? So this, there's very strong tailwinds. Tell us a bit more about the supply side of things, right? So obviously there's coaches out there, but you need to make sure that the quality is right, that they live up to the standards that you want to represent on the platform. How do you ensure that? And, and also, once you expand in a country like India, are there enough coaches who actually have the same quality compared to the US, where this might be a bit more advanced? So when you talk about coaching, I'm pretty sure anyone here in the audience would agree it is a big thing. And probably everyone has considered coaching. At the same time, it would be very hard to find a common definition what actually coaching is. What does it mean? It's a non-regulated industry. So that's where we come in. We say, okay, let's really create these principles. Let's really create these standards. Let's really make sure that we are focusing on quality. Because many of our clients would go to Google and they can promise you The first hits on Google's, they're probably great at marketing, not so good in coaching, most likely. So um, that's why we're building the, this, uh, this, this global pool, this global community. Um, actually, our acceptance rate to become a coach with CoachUp is 5%, which I understood it's harder to become a coach with us than to get into MIT. So, um, I, uh, I take this with pride and the majority of the coaches is, is exclusive with us. Um, uh, but it's really, it is, it is an effort to really heavily invest to build a value add, not only for your clients, but also for, for your partners. Yep. And, and you were asking about uh, geographical differences. It is very different. If you go to France, generally, the organization setup is much more hierarchical. So this needs to be catered into in the product. If you look at Asia Pacific, uh, Japan, for example, there is not a word for coaching. The word training also covers coaching in these regions. So there's a lot of educational work to be done as well. Mm -hmm. I know that you have a very scientific approach to this as well. So there's lots of science with Jonathan Passmore. You're one of the leading uh, coaching experts in the world. Tell us a bit more about this lab that you actually built and, and what are sort of the, the learnings that you derive from it? What we realized early on When we really want to grow big with our clients and really want to support them at scale, we need to prove the impact on what we are doing. And impact can look different for any client. If it's, um, if it's a de diversity, equity, and inclusion use case, it's probably different measures that you would look at than when it's a, a change project or a digital transformation project um, or anything alike. So we are working closely with our clients, and that's where our lab and our behavior scientists come in. We pull them in with our, our key deals and work together with our client to define how does success look for, me, for you? How can we measure success? And then to deliver on it. We're not signing up a client unless we jointly identified how success looks like. Because then we can come back in a, in a reach row and say, look, these are the metrics you wanted to measure. We're having some scientists and some researchers in our, in our own ranks. And then we can show you this data. Do you want to roll this out? Because if you're talking about multi-million budgets, typically um, an executive level is involved. And typically, organizations want to see some kind of impact or some kind of RI. Make it measurable. Yeah. Um, That brings us to the last point that we, I wanted to discuss with you. So obviously, the current product offering is, is already serving a lot of uh, people, but how do you actually expand that? And what are sort of the next things, the big things on your roadmap? And are they also driven by some markets like India or Japan, where you might have different requests? How, how do you look at this? And how is that actually shaping the roadmap? So last part of the question first, how does the product offering differ, differ by market? And um, best example, for example, is uh, France, um, where we were having a tough time to enter the market. 
and I believe it wouldn't have been possible without the merge with the category leader in, in France. One key learning is because the market is more hierarchical, we've developed a feature to involve your line manager. So our coaches in France in the first session can loop in their line manager where they giant, jointly align on the target of the coaching and then the two individuals can have their coaching session. And this kind of features we're then taking and rolling out. For example, in Asia Pacific, we're seeing some similarities and companies can benefit from the same, uh, 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 same features that we're developing here. And this is, I believe, one of the advantage of coming from a European nation, because actually there is no one European market. Europe is a combination of many, many different nations. They have different languages, as we, as we all know, different cultures, different uh, philosophies, different approaches, different regulations. And this early need to adapt also makes you quite flexible as an organization. And that's probably what gave us this competitive edge over some US players that grew up in a very consistent, very big market. They have no need to adapt. And once you have a huge business running in the US, would you really implement this sm small feature? Because in Finland, you have a specific requirement? Probably not. Um, yeah. So the, what it really means is that the international markets have an impact on how the product will look like in the future. Um, tell us a bit more about the executive coaching piece, because that's something that you're working on. Um, how big is that opportunity, or is that actually going back to how it has been in the past? Executive coaching is an interesting one, because it's actually one, one step back to the roots of coaching. So as, as we know, in an old world, coaching would be accessible to the 0.01% of the workforce, just the executives. What we're doing with our core offering is really making this available for a larger audience. At the same time, I have to admit, until we've reached our vision to democratize it, meaning for everyone in the workforce, it's a long way to go. Um, we still have to work on new features. There is something coming up. I can't say anything yet, but maybe, maybe in next year's uh, uh, time um, to really address the whole workforce. And while we're working towards a solution to address the bottom of the pyramid, we've also developed this little feature tool to address the small executive level as well, because oftentimes they are the sponsors. And if you get the buy-in from the executives, if they feel the power of coaching, they are very likely to also roll it out across their business line. Famous last words. We're coming to the end. Thank you so much, Mati, for sharing some of your learnings uh, that you gathered in 80 days around the world. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Evan Andrew. Culture, management, target setting, hiring, and compensation fall under the umbrella of people management. These parts are incredibly hard to nail and are often neglected until the conflict is already at hand. People are the essence of the company. The dynamics change constantly, and every person in the company can and will affect its success as a whole. Vanessa, co-founder and chief people officer at Pitch, and Sophia, co-founder and mentor of Mambo, are both founders who focused on people from day one of their companies. Joining them, we have Caitlin Holloway, founding partner at venture capital firm 776. She has led Reddit's people growth and has now built her own fund. On stage, we get to hear the group's versatile conversation on leading people functions combined with advice on what every startup should pay attention to when more people enter the company. So let's hear it. Founders on building a people-centric startup DNA. Welcome on stage, Vanessa, Sophia, and Caitlin.
so much for taking the time to come and listen to the People People Chat. We are thrilled to be here at Slush, uh, and thank you so much for taking this pre-nap time moment uh, to hang out with us. So, I want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Caitlin Holloway. I am founding partner at Alexis Ohanian's venture capital firm, 776. And I am joined on stage here by two phenomenal executives and people leaders and entrepreneurs. So we have Sophia here, who is co-founder and coach at Mambu, and Vanessa, who is co-founder and chief people officer at Pitch. Uh, and we have so much to share with you today and such a short amount of time. And so I want to start first uh, by not burying the lead. I want to give you the headline of our talk today. And I can tell you this with, with full confidence because as a people leader, an executive, and now investor who has spent the last decade and a half dragging HR out of the back room and into the boardroom, I can tell you this. We are about to enter an incredibly challenging chapter, not just for technology, but for every business. And the companies who have the capacity to build people-first companies will be the ones that succeed. Everyone else will not make it. And so we believe that people strategy is fantastic business strategy. And it is your job as founders to maintain and manage and tweak that triple bottom line, which is mission, people, and business outcomes. And so, today, we're gonna to share a little bit about our combined experience. We all have been deep in the trenches of building companies from the bottom up. Uh, we all have been a part of high growth, uh, high success companies uh, from the earliest days through exit. And so we want to share with you uh, what we have learned and what we have discovered along the way. Um, but I, I challenge all of you, as we are having our conversation, to really think about your own responsibility and your own organizations in leading people first. And so I don't want you to just think about surrounding yourself with phenomenal people leaders or leaders who happen to, to believe in leading culture first, but also how you can build your own capacity to become that people first leader that you're going to need to be to survive this next chapter. And so, without further ado, I would love to have you both set a little bit of context, please. Vanessa, we'll start with you. Can you share a little bit about how and why you decided to move from being a people leader into being an entrepreneur? Uh, yeah. Um. First of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you both uh, on stage today and talking about uh, people first uh, business leadership. Um, yeah, my background has always been in HR and uh, people focused uh, work. I was always interested in building organizations that are progressive and innovative. And uh, after being an operator for a very long time, I really knew that in order to really shape the culture of a business, you need to start from the very beginning, and that's why I knew you have to be, become a part of a founding team and be there in the early days. And uh, because to me, people first culture start with the first people you hire. It's the first rituals you're starting uh, with your team, even if it's tiny. Uh, the, yeah, the first 50 people are dictating your culture in the future. And that's why I think it's very, very important as an HR professional to actually be be there from day one and, yeah, be part of the founding team. Yeah, excellent. And Sophia, how about you? How did you translate your HR career into one of, of starting a company? Uh, mine was a bit of an atypical path. I was coming actually from a clinical psychology background and I moved on then to do a master's in human computer interaction. That's how I met my future co-founders and how the idea for Mambo was born. Um, and we were coming from very different backgrounds. So uh, we had one from computer science, the other one computer science and business, and I was the only one with a people-related role in past experience. So it came naturally as uh, having me as the co-founder that would be focusing on people because that would bring uh, the, the, the people-first mentality that we wanted, we knew we wanted to have in the company. Most excellent. And can you share with the audience quickly a little bit about both of your companies and, and what, what those products are? Sorry, Sophia, we'll start with you. <laughs> uh, so Mambo is a cloud-based core banking software. So we, we started in Germany. Now we expanded to quite a few countries. And um, yeah, we've been building that product since 2010. Excellent. And what about Pitch? 
Uh, yeah, at Pitch we are building the next generation of presentation software. We are believing in yeah, rethinking the way how people build decks, interact, deck, uh, interact with decks, and uh, share and consume them. Um, yeah, we've been starting four and a half years ago and uh, have been on the market since two years. And uh, yeah, uh, lots of people already use it. I hope some of you also check it out after today. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I find it interesting that both of those products uh, are very related to people, how we communicate with people, how we tell our stories, and most importantly, how we set those goals to really create those outsized returns. And so it's, it's no surprise that having someone with a background in people makes a lot of sense in that founding team. Now, I, I understand that many founders, and I, I understand this after years and years of, of coaching and advising founders, they always ask me, when, when should I hire my first HR leader? And typically, they're asking me this question around their Series A, sometimes Series B, when they have you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 employees. I fundamentally think that that is wrong. It is too late. Um, and so understanding that both of you started your companies from day zero with a people first strategy and really considering, um, again, that triple bottom line from the very, very beginning. Uh, Vanessa, can you share a little bit about how you think leading people first from day zero actually has impacted not only your company culture, but your product? Yeah, I think um, if you have someone in the leadership team that actually really thinks intentionally about people and the type of organization you are building, you are basically also able to uh, prevent certain errors that a lot of people make in hiring the wrong people, right. potentially uh, promoting the wrong people, but also thinking about building an accessible product uh, for various types of users. I think right. um, that's one aspect, but then also yeah, being part in every conversation that goes uh, into the business strategy. Um, in the end, it touches everyone in the company and all your workforce. So I think it's very important that the people are being considered in those conversations. Absolutely. And what about you, Sophia? Um, I would probably answer that question with a focus on diversity. So we, the, the, the core founding team, we were coming again from diverse backgrounds, nationalities even. And prior to Mambu, we had been working together for at least one year in different projects. And we knew the value that there was in that diversity. Right. We had seen firsthand how each of us coming from a different mindset and contributing to the same problem, the same business case, the same project would give it such a richness that we would never attain if we didn't have that different uh, mindset. So we knew from the get-go that we wanted to have a diverse team to also serve a, diff a diverse um, set of customers. And we focused on that so much that we actually moved our headquarters from Stuttgart in the south of Germany to Berlin, where we would be able to attract a more diverse talent. And by doing that, we gained not only that richness of ideas and uh, just contributions from different uh, perspectives, but we were also able to tap into um, market segments that otherwise we might have not been able to do it right. because customers were coming from all sorts of uh, also backgrounds, but countries and cultures. And having someone in the team who was able to understand the subtleties and nuances of those cultures and communicate with them, understand their needs and translate into the business was key for our success. Right. I love that you bring up communication because communication is actually a very, very big part of the work that we do as people leaders. Um, you know, I think that oftentimes folks relegate HR to payroll and benefits administration, but the reality is, is that our work impacts not only everyone within our organization, but to both of your points, all of our users as well, which is really where, again, those business outcomes live or die. And, and so thinking about our roles very holistically, communication is actually very, very, very key to all of our strategy. And uh, especially going into this next chapter where the world is shifting and things are, are not as known as they were, you know, from, from funding and, and fundraising becoming more challenging because of the macro and microeconomic climate to, you know, really watching what's happening with our consumers as they are maybe pulling back or making different business decisions or, or consumer decisions for themselves. And so when we think about communication internally, um, it's a really, really powerful tool, and most importantly, to manage expectations. So oftentimes, uh, our employees become upset, or they are uh, 
in a position of not understanding the decisions that executive teams are making because they simply don't have the context. And so a lot of our jobs, as I've mentioned, is communication. How have you, uh, in both of your organizations or at previous organizations, used communication strategy uh, to help you drive or deliver those outsized returns? I, I believe that, Vanessa, you were the one who, you have a pretty unique approach to all hands. Is that true? Oh, we do, yeah. We are building a remote first team uh, since day one. So since we started hiring um, our first employees, we basically decided to uh, yeah, have a distributed um, company across uh, the country and across Europe and then uh, US. And um, yeah, for us, it was very important to set clear intentions around how do we manage a distributed team that's not in the same place and not having these dedicated uh, one-to-one one -one situations. And uh, one aspect of that is asynchronous communication. Uh, for that, we used our tool, um, Pitch, in order to have uh, team bulletins going out every Friday where everyone is pro uh, sharing their progress on their work with the whole company. This is one aspect of replacing these weekly all-hands um, and having this type of a uh, moment to share and celebrate each other's work, but not being at the same meeting every week. Um, we also, yeah, just practice very intentional ways of documenting our work, sharing progress in open channels, having transparent, um, yeah, communication across the teams and across functions. And uh, yeah, this is just a few of those things that we uh, consider when we think about the communication strategy internally. That's excellent. And, and how about you, Sophia? How have you used communication as a strategic tool to help your team not only feel engaged, but, but ready to perform? Yeah, I think transparency is key, has always been key, but it also evolved as we grew. So in the beginning, it's very easy to just communicate. You're seeing people who are in the same office, in the same space. In our case, we were in the same, same office. So that was very easy to have that two-way communication. But as we grew, of course, that was not sustainable and not scalable. So we started having more formal ways of capturing the overall sentiment of the team, various surveys. But we also have our all hands, which we call town hall, which is communication to the team about giving them updates, keeping them in the loop of everything that happens in the company. And um, we have it a more localized approach also for the different offices that we call village halls, where that information is in a way translated and so that people know how that impacts them in that location. And uh, we have um, also what we call the Ask Me Anything sessions, where leaders uh, sit with anyone can join and they can just ask them any question really and just to, to break that formality a little bit more uh, in attention. In addition to surveys, we have pulse surveys, engagement surveys, and so on, so to keep that two-way communication going. But we had to go a little bit more formal somehow. That makes a lot of sense. I think that there is a, um, there's a pretty strong debate around transparency within organizations, how much or how little a leadership team chooses to share out with employees, when, yeah. where, and how they solicit feedback from the team in order to build their, their plans and, and goals for the next quarter. Um, I'm curious to get you both of your takes on, on the level of transparency uh, that you choose to employ, and if maybe that has been different at different organizations and why. Sophia, we'll start with you. It has also evolved, and of course, I, I, I keep saying this, the more, the better. However, I think each company will have to look at that and see for their needs and for the team they know and what is needed for them to know. I would always default for more and to share more where uh, I was telling this earlier, we're, we're dealing with adults ultimately. And I know yes. as founders, we have that tendency to paternalize a bit and to protect. And it, it's that parenting, just keeping them away from stressful uh, situations that happen at this level. But I don't think we need to do that. People are adults. They chose to be there as an adult and they like to be part of that communication that, that, that those, those situations and who knows where ideas can come from. Maybe because someone heard that we're going through this challenge or this situation, then can come up with an idea that will actually support us and help us getting out of it. Right. I love that. Treat people like adults. What a, what a novel, shocking uh, <laughs> thesis here. You heard it first on the stage. Yeah. Treat people like adults. Uh, it's, I think it's salient. How about you, Vanessa? What are your thoughts on transparency? Yeah, that 
totally go uh, into the same direction. As a PP leader, I believe in enabling your team to A, make decisions and, and to foster innovation. And I think people need to know context and have as much information as possible in order to lead their teams, in order to make decisions, in order to yeah, also bring the right ideas uh, to life, and right. um, I believe that yeah, you are building a better business if you're letting your team participate in what you're doing and where you want to go. And transparency and open communication is the way to go for that. I love that. And another one of my favorite tools in the HR toolkit is actually policy, uh, which sounds I know, riveting, watch out, policy. We're gonna talk HR policy for a little bit. Um, I wanna talk HR policy because I think that it gets a bad rap. Uh, the employee handbook, uh, the traditional you know, legalese compliance handbook um, that we all have to sign away all of our rights the second we, we started an organization, um, I think is actually highly underutilized and it's become overly bureaucratic. Uh, my, my favorite way to use policy with an organization is actually to uh, serve as a communication tool, both internally, so to our existing employees, to drive employee engagement and to create safe spaces, and then also to signal to uh, our new recruits, our, our hopeful employees, uh, who we are and what we stand for as an organization. And so some examples uh, that, that I've employed throughout my career have been around uh, parental inclusion. So ensuring that you have a paid family leave policy, especially for us in, back in America, we, our government has not done a very good job of ensuring that that, that is protected for our, our citizens. And so the, the job then rests on the shoulders of the, of the private sector to, to go ahead and buoy that up. Um, but additionally, I think that you can take it further and use a policy like loss of pregnancy leave, which is something that is very challenging and hard to talk about at work. But, you know, through my own lived experiences, I, I had had a miscarriage at work um, and it was not protected. Thankfully, I had a manager who was very understanding and was able to give me that time to grieve and also physically heal, but that, was, that showed up nowhere in my employee handbook. And so I, I led the way on creating a policy that I then open source to share with other people leaders and other founders to say, this is something that, that every, every handbook should have to signal, again, not only to potential future employees, we care about this particular community of people, but again, to your employees to say, this is a safe space. When we ask you to show up as your whole self, I want my policies to reflect that as well. And so I typically take the approach of we make rules for the many and not for the few, and then deal with the edge cases. Because you don't want to have, the, again, that, that overly pedantic uh, employee handbook, but really thinking very strategically about when we implement a policy, when we might adapt or change a policy, and when we might want to not include a policy, because they, they work on all directions. And so now, Sophia, I know that you have also used policy in your favor before, specifically around employee engagement. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your sabbatical policy? Yes, um, I so with you in all of that. I used to cringe at the word policy uh, as a founder and thinking, no, we're all for agility. And I would say, uh, no, policies are hindering agility. We want to be an agile company. Why are we having policies? And then I changed my mind because yep. of that. So I saw how policies can actually be used to actually design the culture that we want to have in the company and to, to support us in that design. So what we did uh, two years ago, about two years ago, was to implement this sabbatical policy where uh, every five years employees would get to enjoy a one month paid sabbatical. And that was all good until we had the question from a more traditional HR person uh, saying, so what happens to people who are now celebrating their sixth, seventh or eighth anniversary when we implement this policy? Which to me was a no question. To me, obviously, we will backdate right. it and they will get to enjoy that. And this was, there, there was a bit of discussion and all because, not that there were bad intentions from this person, but because again, they were coming from a more traditional background. They were almost lost the ability to ask why. Right. Why are we doing this? Why are we not doing this? And they had their argument and I was able to fortunately show the human part of it, right? What would happen if we don't do this to these right. 10, 15 people who are in the situation? And so gladly we were, able to, to overcome that and eventually implement the policy for all of them. 
I love that. It, it's so important. I, I really, I have a lot of thoughts on policies in general, but I really think that if you show up and remember the human, and, and so I challenge all of my founders, I say, when you are speaking with an employee, so, you know, giving you a handbook filled again with legalese for you to rubber stamp and say, yes, we're going to use this policy, or yes, yes, I approve the handbook yeah. in whole. Uh, what happens when a real human knocks on your door or, or, or goes into your Zoom room and shares something really challenging? Yes something very real, very human, that probably has nothing to do with your work, but everything to do with how they are able to show up and participate. Yeah. What happens when someone comes and shares that they've just lost their partner? An unexpected loss. Are you going to pull out the handbook and say, yeah. here's our bereavement leave, you get yeah. four days off? Absolutely not. You're going to look at the whites of their eyes and say, this is, this is the appropriate thing to do here. Absolutely. And so why would we not write our policies as if that person was sitting across from us? Uh, before I move on and, and continue to wax poetic about policy, Vanessa, do you have anything to share about your, your thoughts or views on policy? Yeah, I think for us, um, in a remote first environment, I think you, you need to have ideally as little as possible um, policies, but the right ones and the right ones also for your stage. So I think um, ideally you help your team to thrive within the frame that you define and also within the, yeah, the culture that you want to facilitate. And um, ideally you need to yeah, evolve this over time also depending on your growth pace or the, the size of team you are. And uh, ideally communicate, communicate with your team and see what are the themes that they are thinking about, right. what is concerning to them, what, what, is, what are they struggling with and how can we as a company help efficiently. For us, for example, one thing we implemented during COVID, we always had um, a budget for a personal trainer uh, for everyone, for a physical sports coach. And during COVID, we felt like actually much more important to help people dealing with the complexities of the of the pandemic and we said everyone can see a therapist uh, right. for for a period of time that is also on us and i think this right. were this was like a reaction to what we felt was needed and uh, we right. still have a version of that in place and i think this is how we as leaders should interact with our companies I love that. The ability to evolve a policy that was implemented at one point is very important. Similar to values. You yeah. know, values and policies are used to inspire the behaviors we would like to see within our own organizations and therefore cannot be static. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really appreciate the notion of, of adapting or evolving a policy to help it serve the business needs, the business outcomes. Yeah. And so I want to shift gears a little bit into this new chapter that we know we're about to embark on. Um, and what I mean by that is things are about to get very hard, especially for founders and young startups. And uh, I have been around enough blocks. I have, have been doing my, my job for a very long time. And I've seen good and I've seen bad. I've seen the contraction and expansion cycles. And I, I think it would be helpful if we could share a little bit about culture and more specifically, the founder culture. And so I've often said that your culture will reveal itself when things are going poorly. Uh, it happens, culture, whether, whether we like it or not, it's building itself in the background with or without your permission. And when things are going great, it's really easy to feel like you have a great culture because you're winning. Yeah. But when things are really hard and they become trying, that is when your truest, truest self uh, as an organization reveals itself. And so, as we know, we are, we are entering, and, and some of you have probably already experienced this, you are living through a more challenging time. Um, so again, it's around fundraising, it's about your ability to retain talent, it's about your ability to hire those key hires. How do you, how do you take feedback from an investor who just has given you whiplash from going from growth at all costs to focus on revenue? Um, and, and how do you really take those and adapt those into what it is that you have been building. And so I would love for each of you to share, Vanessa, we'll start with you, um, any advice you have to the founders on how maybe they can easily or more gracefully transition into this, this potential period of hardship? I would say resilience is what we all need right now. I think as leaders, as employees, as founders, and uh, practicing resilience uh, within yourself, but also within your team and your organization is, I think, key to navigate uncertainties and also uncertain amount of time. And uh, I think for that this is the mo most important thing then for you or the best possibility for you as a leader to be there for your team and be present and show up. 
um, for your for your team members. And uh, next to that, I think, yeah, you need to over communicate with your teams. You need to tell them where are you at uh, in terms of your thinking as a founder. What is the situation outside of our business? How do you think about the macroeconomics? How do you You know, what is the strategy changes we might want to take? And I think all these things are super important to just over-communicate them to your team all, all over the place. And uh, yeah, so resilience and over-communication, I think, are the things I would say. I would upvote those. <laughs> Sophia, what about you? Um, absolutely subscribe to that too. And I would just add the fact that you don't have to do it alone. Again, it's, it's very easy for us to take it all and think we need to do it all. This is our company. We need to take, do it alone. But you don't. There's countless people wanting to help. And I'm talking about your team, of course. So if you use that transparency, you will have the team also supporting you and giving you ideas, but also mentors, advisors, right. people who have done it before. And it's not that you're looking for a prescription, but you're looking for someone who has done it, who has gone through similar situations, who has overcome that, and who can give you some tip, some advice, something that will make you feel that you're on the right track. People are far more generous than you give them credit for. Yes. I've discovered <laughs> yes. this multiple times in my career. Ask. The worst they can do is say no, but people are willing to show up and lend a hand and link arms, um, especially folks that have, have been there and done that. <laughs> yeah. Because they know. They know what it feels like to sit in your shoes. Um, you know, we are, we are getting close to the end of our time on stage here. Uh, I would share the advice, uh, get really good at doing less with less. It's a great business practice in general, but now is the time to really exercise that muscle. But do less with less with heart. There is no reason to neglect the fact that we all have lived through some incredibly challenging times outside of a frothy venture capital market for the last few years. We have survived uh, trauma, collective trauma together. And so, so do less with less, but with heart. Um, and, and before we head off the stage, uh, I, I usually like to end our talks with a call to action. So again, I challenged you all at the beginning of our conversation to really think deeply about how you can, can build your own capabilities in becoming a people-first leader and really showing up for your team in the way that is not only uh, high integrity and values aligned, but in a way that drives those business results. And so uh, the second part of that would be to really extend yourself to Sophia's point to surround yourself with people who do lead people first. And to her point, this does not mean go out and hire the best HR leader to, to sit by your side today, although I think that's also good advice. Uh, it means surrounding yourself with people who, who really understand what it means to build and operate a culture-first organization. And so, Sophia, what, is, what, is your, what are your final thoughts, your final call to action? I would just say, uh, remember to look after yourselves also. It's really easy to get into our minds and our to-do lists and to doing, doing, doing and firefighting. But ultimately, and just like with parents, we're better parents, and this is our baby too. So we're better parents when we have that time to restore, to re-energize, to recollect our thoughts and then be able to give. Because if you just give at some point, it's, it's over. The energy is over. So just remember that. Take some time to whatever you do to re-energize to, to, to do that Excellent. urgently. <laughs> Vanessa? Yeah, I would say call to action for all of us founders is to really stay alert on what's happening. And, and yeah, if you decide for things, execute fast. Um, that's what I would say. And then on top of that, I think um, now in times like this, when you want to invest in your culture, I think it would be great to invest in the right tooling for your team to collaborate and, and to, uh, yeah, to um, yeah, build out your culture. And for that, I would uh, recommend everyone to use Pitch uh, and download it and try it. Excellent. Well, thank you to all of you for joining us for the People People Talk. We are thrilled uh, to have been invited. And like I said, I encourage you to go out and make the connections with people who have this area of expertise because it truly will be your competitive advantage. But otherwise, good luck out there. You've got this. You can do this. You're going to build great products that will change the world, that are diverse and inclusive, and really keep human at the very center of everything you do. So thank you so much. And we will see you out on the floor. Thank you.
Vanessa, <laughs> Sophia, and Caitlin for that talk. Going forward with the program, there is the largest global B2B marketplace that connects over 600,000 independent retailers across North America, Europe, and Australia, with 85,000 brands located in over 150 countries. Founded only five years ago, the company is valued over 12 billion and has raised over 1 billion in funding from world-class investors. Wow. Max Rhodes is the co-founder and CEO of FAIR. As a former small business owner, Max is passionate about the positive impact of local commerce on society and has made his mission to help independent retailers and brands to build thriving businesses and grow stronger communities. Joining Max, we have Ravi Gupta, Sequoia partner, FAIR investor, and formerly COO and CFO of Instacart. At Sequoia Capital, Ravi focuses on consumer, fintech, mobile, and internet investments. He serves on the boards of Accelerate, Fair, Noom, and Remote, just to name a few. Let's hear from Max and Ravi about the importance of building a values-based and data-driven business. This is Taking on Goliath, Fair leveling the playing field for retailers. Welcome on stage, Max and Ravi. First of all, we want to say thank you to Helsinki and Slush for having us. This conference is unbelievable. And uh, Max, I'm very happy to be here with you. And uh, before we get into it, Sequoia has been partnered with you guys since the, the seed. And uh, we're more convinced than ever that this is a legendary company in the making. And so would you mind just telling people what FAIR is and what inspires you to start it? I think the founding story is really wonderful for people to hear. Yeah. So FAIR is a wholesale marketplace. We connect independent retailers with independent brands so that they can then sell those products in their store. Uh, and I think the story of FAIR really actually started back when I was in college. Uh, I went to a public high school in Oklahoma, uh, and then I ended up going to college uh, at Yale. And the first couple of years that I was at Yale were really challenging. I went from being successful in basically everything that I'd done in high school to failing at everything that I did my first couple of years in college. Uh, you know, I was the captain of my soccer team in high school. I wasn't even a starter on my college soccer team my freshman year. Uh, I you know, was on the debate team in high school. I couldn't even make the debate team in, in college. Uh, and there was just example after example of that. And I think it culminated my junior year, uh, I was applying to internships. Um, which is you know, what you're supposed to do at an Ivy League school. You want to go into iBanking or management consulting. And I didn't even get an interview with any of, any of the companies that I wanted to get an interview with. And you know, it was a little bit of an identity crisis at the time because I think achievement had been such a big part of my identity. And I just wasn't achieving anymore. And I ended up starting a house painting business in the summer after my junior year just to kind of make money and to have something to do. And I absolutely loved it. I you know, enjoyed every minute of it. It was the most fun that I'd ever had doing anything. Um, and it was really a liberating experience, especially after a couple of years of really struggling. Uh, and I remember I called my dad and I said, Dad, I, I found my dream job. I know what I want to do. Uh, I want to paint houses. And my dad, <laughs> who was spending a lot of money on my education at the time, said, that's great, son. Um, but I think maybe what you want to do is be an entrepreneur. And you know, I think that was really the beginning of it. And I think he was right. The thing that I really loved about it was being my own boss. I didn't even really like the house painting part that much. <laughs> uh, and that ultimately led me to a couple of experiences that I had after college, where I was kind of charting a path to try to be an entrepreneur. Um, the first was I, I ended up working as a product manager at Square. 
and I was really drawn to the opportunity to build technology products for other entrepreneurs. I think yep. being, you know, having that itch and really understanding that so deeply myself, um, I wanted to, to build products for, for entrepreneurs. I also wanted the opportunity to learn from somebody like Jack Dorsey, I think one of the greatest entrepreneurs of all time. Um, and then the other experience that I had was uh, I introduced this product called the Blunt Umbrella to the U.S. market on the side while I was at Square. And so, you know, I had this opportunity to basically on the, on the weekends go to trade shows, try to get this product in front of retailers, and then during the week I was building products for small business owners and, you know, really seeing what happens when you don't have any technology, uh, in the case of me being a small business owner myself, you know, that ultimately led me to, to, to try to pursue the opportunity with FAIR uh, and, you know, again, have the opportunity to try to support small businesses and support other entrepreneurs by, by building this wholesale marketplace to make it easier for brands to get their, their, their products onto the shelves of retailers. That's awesome. Well, we're glad that you didn't end up painting houses, you know, and decided to do this instead. One thing that you talk a lot about is small businesses, independent businesses. I think that a lot of times for people, they think small businesses, independent businesses, small market. And one of the things we've talked about a lot is that this is actually a giant market. And it's a giant market that's hiding in plain sight. What do you think FAIR was able to do and you were able to do in order to identify that market? And why do you think you guys were first? And I think it'll be inspirational for people who might think that all the good ideas are already picked over and you guys managed to find something that was pretty unique. Yeah, so the, the question of how big is the market and you know, the, the fact that the market is hiding in plain sight was actually one of the things that made me most nervous when we were first starting out because I, I'd been going to these trade shows for like six or seven years and it was really clear from the very first show that I went to how broken it was. One of the things that held me back from just going and doing it uh, was the fact that it seemed like Surely, if there was a there there, somebody would have done it. This market is huge. You know, trillions of dollars are, are flowing through the wholesale industry. You know, there's hundreds of trade shows with millions of attendees. If there was really an opportunity here, somebody would have taken advantage of it. And that, that frankly, scared me off for a long time. Yeah. And I, once I left Square with the idea of starting my own company, I kept coming back to this idea. And I kept asking this question of like, why hasn't somebody done it before? And the, I ultimately came to the conclusion that there's really two reasons. First is the fact that it's not exactly hiding in plain sight. It actually is kind of hidden. Yeah. Um, Good the, point. You know, the, the retail industry really has three main players. There's brands, there's retailers, and then there's consumers. And retailers sell the products of the brands to the consumer. All of the innovation in the retail industry over the course of the last 20 years has really been focused on the consumer legs of that triangle. Uh, you know, you, you can think of Shopify connecting brands to consumers. You can think of Amazon connecting brands to consumers. You can think of Instacart connecting retailers to consumers. DoorDash connecting retailers to consumers. Uh, Square connecting retailers to consumers. No one was paying any attention to the wholesale leg of that triangle. And I think a big reason for that is there just weren't that many people from the tech industry going to trade shows and seeing how broken, you know, the wholesale market was. And so I think there just weren't that many people paying attention to it. And to the degree to which there were people paying attention to it, I think the second reason that you know, it took so long for, for this, to, 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 this problem to get fixed is that it wasn't immediately obvious what the problem was that needed to be solved mm. uh, in order to move the market online. The reason why trade shows exist is it's really a filtering mechanism for retailers. They're going to the show in order to see the products that are actually going to sell in the store. There's all these showrooms, these sales reps mm. who are curating these showrooms where you know, the retailer shows up, they know that the products are actually going to sell uh, and they're able to touch and feel and it gives them you know, a, a sense of trust yep. that the products are actually going to perform. If you're a small retailer in particular, if you buy products that don't sell, you can go to business. And so it's really scary buying products sight unseen via you know, an online marketplace. And so there had been a few folks that had tried to move the market online, but they hadn't been able to because they didn't solve that trust piece. Yeah. And you know, that was ultimately, I think, what helped FAIR get off the ground was we offered free returns, net 60 payment terms. We took all the risk out of buying and that enabled us to get liquidity, enabled us to get off the ground. And you know, that ultimately led to to, to things really taking off. Yeah, I think that the, one of the things that impressed us most 
at Sequoia was just this sort of discipline around understanding the real customer need that you guys had. And I think not force fitting your own insight on it, but actually going and listening. And I think that's a real hallmark of the culture. All right, so let's get to it in the sense of the name of this session is taking on Goliath, leveling the playing field for independent retailers. So maybe give us a history lesson. How did Goliath become Goliath in this industry? And what is FAIR going to do specifically to level the playing field uh, and arm the independent retailers? Yeah, so there have been a couple of Goliaths over the years uh, in, in the retail industry. I think the first was Amazon, or was Walmart, and, and you know, now, now it's Amazon. Um, but really, the, the history of retail over the course of the last 100 years at least has really been a story of consolidation, where you know, I think in the 70s and 80s, uh, Walmart really rose up and you know, proved that scale, economies of scale, could really be brought to bear in the retail industry. They used technology, they used data, they used their bargaining power in order to drive down prices and you know, in order to offer giant assortments to consumers all over the, the country in the US. Uh, and then Amazon has basically taken that playbook, lower prices, larger assortments, you know, data-driven assortments, and they've applied it you know, tenfold and have had a lot of success in doing so. The interesting thing is, over the course of the last 20 years, there has been, there started to be a, a, a counter movement by the independent retailer mm. against the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world. They've actually figured out how to compete in a world where they don't have the lowest prices, they don't have the largest assortments. They figured out how to compete on experience. You know, th these retailers are artists. They are curating an experience for you as the consumer where when you walk in, you know, it, it's entertaining. It's fun to shop in, in an independent store. They're community builders. They're connecting their communities. They're building presence online and building their community online. And and, you know, they figured out you don't have to have the lowest prices. You don't have to have the largest assortment. If you can create an experience that draws people in, if you can build community among your customer base, you, know, you can compete. And so in many ways, Walmart and Amazon are competing head to head on the same dimensions. And the independent retailer, because they already went through their version of the retail apocalypse you know, 30, 40 years ago, they figured out how to survive in, in this new world. Uh, and as a result, they're actually thriving. The number of independent bookstores in the United States, at least, has more than doubled over the course of the last decade. That is a shocking stat that I don't think people have really grasped, which is that there's this story that you know, retail is dying. And it's like, no, undifferentiated retail is dying, right? Retail with no point of view is dying. These independent retailers are actually thriving in spite of some of these disadvantages that they do have that I think you guys can help fix. Yeah, I, I think FAIR actually has a, a very important part to play in the next stage of the journey for these retailers. You know, they still have these structural disadvantages. They still, you know, struggle to have bargaining power. Uh, they struggle to get capital. Um, you know, th they're still at a disadvantage in many ways. And I think part of the idea of FAIR is we're taking 600,000 retailers and, you know, soon to be a million retailers, and we're pulling them together into a collective, into a network, into a community that gets stronger the bigger that it gets, that brings the power of scale and technology to independent retailers that, that it's traditionally only been available to the largest companies like Walmart and Amazon. We give them access to net 60 payment terms so that they can buy more inventory uh, and, and they can actually carry more products that, that ultimately are gonna sell. We give them access to the ability to return products that don't sell. It's something called buybacks that actually large retailers have been able to do for, for decades. If a product doesn't sell, you know, our retailers can just send it back and that allows them to take more risk, that allows them to, to find the best selling products themselves. And then an another thing that we're doing is I think we're actually allowing them to lean into their strengths, allowing them to you know, be the artist that is curating this experience. And one of the things that we've just started doing is we've started using artificial intelligence to enable them to find the exact product from you know, the 70,000 brands that we have. They can find the exact product that they're looking for. They can find, you know, coffee beans from the hills of Italy. They can find, you know, boho blouses from California. They can find nautical themed goods from Maine. You know, whatever it is from wherever it is, they can search for it on fair and they can find it. Rather than having to wander the aisles of a trade show hoping that they stumble upon that thing, they can have a creative vision and they can match it on fair. And not only can they match it, but they can match it knowing that those products are going to sell because we have the power of data 
600,000 stores, you know, ordering, reordering, returning. We have point of sale integrations where we're actually seeing how the products are selling. So not only are they able to, you know, create that vision, they know that the products are going to sell and that they're going to be more successful as a result. I love that. I think one of the things we talk about at Sequoia and we've talked about before is AI ought not stand for artificial intelligence, it should stand for augmented intelligence. And you think about taking this collection of artists and giving them superpowers and giving them the ability to leverage technology in a way that the Goliaths have had, but you take that combined with their taste and I think you have something really magical. And I, I think it's quite dystopian to think about a world where you only shop at these giant, you know, personality-less big box stores. One thing that's amazing about Helsinki is actually these stores are everywhere, right? And I think that uh, this place is actually ahead of the game, I think, on, on that. I think Europe in general has been ahead of the game with the local movement. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think we've seen so much success in Europe to date, where I think we've sold something like 30 million products over the course of the last year. It's been wildly successful for us as we've expanded over the course of the past year. Wow. Well, I know this is a little off track, but how has Europe done since we've launched here relative to the U.S. at the same time? It's grown much faster. Huh. Uh, and I think part of that is we'd already figured out a lot of the things that we needed to figure out. Um, you know, when we were first starting in the U.S., there was a lot of kind of tinkering that we needed to do to get it right. But I think part of that is just the European market is in, in many ways better suited because it's so fragmented, because the shop local movement is so powerful here. You know, we've seen fair take off here in a way that, you know, not even in the U.S., where I think we also saw really strong growth. Uh, that's amazing. Well, one of my favorite things about the job that I have is I get to hear the future from people like you, right? And so I think that if we can give that as a gift to everyone, give them a glimpse of the future of retail, you've done a little bit of that, and then give them a glimpse of the future of FAIR. Where's FAIR going? Yeah, so I think the, the future of retail is really one of blurring lines. And I think there's a, there's a bunch of different lines right now that are segmenting the retail industry. There's lines between online and offline. And I think that line is increasingly blurring. You hear a lot about omnichannel. I think that's something that's been happening gradually over the course of the last you know, 20 years. But I think it's really accelerated over the course of the last couple of years. At the beginning of the pandemic, only about 25% of our retailers had an online presence. Now, almost all of them have an online presence. And actually, an online channel is growing very rapidly for us. It's growing, and I think it's now about 20, 25% hmm. of our total business is sold through online retailers, pretty similar to the you know, overall e-commerce penetration. Uh, I think the second thing that we're seeing is a blurring of the lines between brands and retailers, and between D to C brands and wholesale brands. You know, traditionally, a brand either sold through their Shopify store or through their big commerce store, or they sold through wholesale. Increasingly, you know, we're seeing the fastest growing segment on fair is actually brands that had never done wholesale before. And I think part of that is because they're realizing DTC is really tough right now, yeah. especially you know, with the, the privacy changes that Apple's made. It's really made it a lot more difficult to build your brand through online advertising. All of a sudden, you know, wholesale looks like a really good deal. It's a really good way to build your business. And, and so I think the, the whole concept of a D2C brand is really going to start to feel increasingly antiquated. Um, and, and I think the, the third line that, that's going to be blurring is the line between social media influencers and retailers. I think more and more you're seeing social media influencers, they really are retailers. You know, they're, they're tastemakers, they have an audience, they figure out how to monetize that audience. In the same way that retailers have an audience, they have a brick and mortar presence, they have an online presence, they have foot traffic, they're monetizing that audience by being tastemakers. Increasingly, I think you're seeing the social media creators looking to use retail to sell products to monetize their audience. And you're also seeing retailers, particularly independent retailers, building community online, you know, identifying ways to create content that connects to their community offline uh, and, and really blurring the lines between their online community and their offline community and using social media to build their brand, to build their presence, to connect with their customers and to sell more. One of the most successful things that our retailers did during the pandemic is they started doing live selling hmm. um, on, on Instagram, on Facebook. You know, they found that that was a really successful channel for them. They've got personality. They've got the ability to storytell. Uh, and I think that's something that FAIR can, can really play a role in. 
uh, in the future. I think the future for FAIR is really to, to help to blur those lines. Hmm. It's to help the D2C brand sell wholesale. It's to help the, on, the, the brick and mortar retailer build an online presence and identify which products are going to sell online. To, you know, push products directly from Fair onto their Shopify store, onto their big commerce store, yeah. and to take a lot of the pain out of managing an online channel. Uh, it's to help the social media influencer find products that they can sell to their audience. It's to help the online, the brick and mortar retailer, you know, build a, a, a digital presence, give them the assets that they can then, you know, sell through their online channels. One thing, you know, we talked a lot about the industry and the business, there's a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs here, early founders. One thing that I think would be beneficial is FAIR is one of the best run companies that Sequoia has been lucky enough to partner with. And I think that you all have built it with real discipline and purpose. Can you talk a little bit about the culture that you guys have created? What are some of the elements in it? Why have you done it that way? Because I think it has been built with this idea that it's going to be around for decades. And it's not something that's just, you know, what it is right now. And so I think people will benefit from that. Yeah, I mean, I said I wanted to be an entrepreneur uh, and that I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur for, for over a decade. And I think one of the things that I found that I love most about the job, but also that's most challenging about the job, is the degree to which it changes every year, mm -hmm. every six months. The job is completely different than what it was you know, the, the, the prior six months. And, you know, I, 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 I've joked to my wife, it's actually, it, it's usually not a joke. She, <laughs> she turns it into a joke. About every six months, I, I turn to her and I say, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Like, I'm bad at my job. Yeah. And she says, you said that six months ago. And I say, yeah, but this time is different. Like, yeah. this time I'm like this really bad. Really mean it. <laughs> I'm really bad at my job. And I don't know what I'm doing. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to figure it out. And every time I mean it, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think when we were first starting out, the challenge for me was I'd never been a manager before. You know, I'd, I'd been a product manager, but being a product manager is really different. You know, you're, you're leading through influence. You're trying to get people to, to do, you know, what, what you want them to do. You're trying to facilitate. You're not actually managing people. People's careers are not dependent on you in the same way. I had a really hard time making that transition. And one of the things that I really struggled with was, you know, this idea of I'm the boss, but I also want to be friends with the people that I'm working with. And, you know, early on, we had to make some difficult decisions and let people go. I really struggled with that. And it made it so hard because I, I loved the people that I was working with. Yeah. And so there's a period of time where I actually kind of withdrew because of that experience. And I, I didn't want to build relationships with the people that I was working with because I was afraid it would make it harder for me to make tough decisions. I ended up reading this book called Radical Candor that was really clarifying for me. Um, and I think his ended up being a core part of FAIR's culture. Uh, and the idea is, you know, you want to be direct, but you also want to be caring yeah. as a leader. And you want to build a relationship with the people that you're working with. And that was really freeing for me where I realized you know, you actually do need to build a relationship with the people that you're working with in order to be able to be direct, in yeah. order to make the tough decisions. Because otherwise, you know, you're just being what the book refers to as obnoxiously aggressive. That's yeah. the opposite of radical And then if you're too nice, ruinous candor. empathy. Yeah, yeah, ruinous empathy yeah. is that, yeah, yeah. And, and I struggled between those two poles. And I think, you know, my journey as a leader has, you know, that's been a big part of it. I think another big part of it has been transitioning from being a product manager yep. where, your job is to build the product, is to you know, make the product better and better and better, because that, that was my background, to actually thinking about the company as the product. And that's been a big transition over the course of the last few years, where you know, my job is to make the product better, but the best way for me to make the product better is to actually make the company better, yeah. and to really think about the company as the product, to think about you know, the people that we hire, the culture that we build, the way we define that culture. We spend a lot of time thinking about our values and our operating principles, codifying those values and those operating principles, building mechanisms to reinforce those values and those operating principles. Our core values are serve our community. We serve our community, so very mission-oriented, seek the truth, very rigorous, uh, embrace the adventure, so you know, focus on taking risks, being resilient. You know, one of the operating principles there is we laugh. We like to have a, a good time. Be an owner. You know, being willing to do 
what it takes to make the company succeed and you know really thinking thinking of yourself as as uh, you know whatever it is whether you know it's giving up scope whether it's doing the hard thing whether it's driving outcomes and then the final one is be kind uh, and, and we we're really thoughtful about the way that we try to build mechanisms in the company to reinforce those values um, and then I, I think the the final thing that has been a, a big adjustment for me over the course of the last uh, you know year, two years, is making the transition from, you know, again, being very focused on the product and the execution of the product to being more of a capital allocator. Yeah. Like I talk about the transition from PM to GM, where you go from a product manager where you're just building the product to being a general manager where, you know, you're managing the company. You get to a certain scale and the, and the role starts to change where you're actually, you know, your job is capital allocation. It's like making the big strategic bets that you know, help the company succeed. I, th I think one of our investors, I, I think maybe Vinod Kosla says, you know, your job as a CEO ultimately, you get to a certain scale, it's to get the like five decisions right. Yeah. There's like five decisions every year that matter. And so one of the things that I've been focused on, you know, over the course of the last couple of years is getting better at making it, identifying those five decisions and then making those five decisions. Uh, and, you know, some of that is getting yourself into the right frame of mind to, to be able to make those decisions. Some of that is building a decision-making process that enables you to make those decisions. Some of that is building a team that is really good at kind of identifying you know, your weaknesses or your blind spots and filling those in and creating a culture of debate that enables you to get to the right decision. You know, we do try to do that with our board. Yep. Uh, we try to do that with our executive team. Um, and then part of that is you know, getting good at breaking down the problem into its component parts. Uh, we use writing to do yeah. that a lot. We have a very written culture. Uh, I find writing is very helpful in kind of clarifying thought. It also it exposes any uh, flaws in your thought process. You can't hide. You can't hide one sloppy the, thinking and writing. Yeah, the, the one of, that is an extremely unique thing within the companies that I've ever been around the long form writing that you all do to have discussions. Yeah, sometimes a little too long. <laughs> we're we're, we're Just working long on enough. that. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it's a very powerful mechanism to force strategic clarity of thought. Yeah. Well, Max, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for starting FAIR. And thank you for letting us be on the journey. We're very proud that we get to be a part of it. Thanks so much, Ravi, okay. appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Am I excited for the next one? We have yet another announcement coming on stage. Yes, we have the honor today to actually introduce our friend to the stage, Anthony Anibonam, co-founder and CEO at Veri. Uh, Veri helps you find the right foods and habits for your body by simply tracking glucose. Anthony is also a longtime ecosystem builder here in the Helsinki or the Finnish ecosystem. Uh, he has a background in Aldous and also building QoS Accelerator. Pretty interesting, right? Yep. Let's give an incredible welcome. But before that, I want to see where is the very people? Where's the group of variants? There we go! <laughs> Amazing we go. group! Let's go! <laughs> okay, everybody ready in the front row? Big applause this time. All right, on the count of three, welcome on stage, Anthony! Yeah, let's go!
Coach Lush, how's it going? My name is Anthony. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vary. At Vary, we help people discover better metabolic health by combining a continuous glucose monitor with an easy-to-use application that helps you find the right foods and healthy habits for your body. Today, poor metabolic health is one of the biggest crises facing the human race. Before revealing what our fantastic team has been busy building for the past couple of quarters, let's take a quick look at the scale and the size of the problem. A population study conducted in Tufts University in Boston showed that 93% of American adults are considered metabolically unhealthy. Globally speaking, it's around every seventh person in the world. Continuing on the spectrum of poor metabolic health, 74% of American adults are considered overweight or obese. And this number is considered being globally every third person. Finally, 50% of American adults are insulin resistant. You might be asking, what is insulin resistance? Insulin resistance causes the cells in your body not to respond to insulin as effectively as it could. This is shown to cause weight gain, difficulty losing weight, tiredness, inability to focus, and cravings. Insulin resistance is also associated with more serious health conditions, including type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and metabolic syndrome. Poor metabolic health is a spectrum. We are still not doing, unfortunately, a very good job in combating it. So you might be asking, what are the things that led us here? There are two things, what our team thinks and what sort of like the research shows that what, which, what, what matter. First, our food environment has changed very dramatically in the past, in the past uh, uh, decades. 60% of the foods we eat are processed or ultra-processed, with unhealthy levels of added sugars, poor quality fats, and even artificial colors, flavors, and whatnot. As a matter of fact, most of these foods promote and signal hormonal activity commanding our brains to eat more. It's, it's, it's considered and called something of a bliss point, is how food manufacturers engineer our foods for us to consume more of these foods, which is absolutely wild. And our tooling is outdated and not fit for this broken food environment. The tools and services out there are, that, are, uh, that are offered to us are designed for the masses, not individuals. Diet and workout programs are all subjective, one size fits all, and the reality is one size fits none especially as the food environment around us has dramatically changed, tools like calorie counters don't consider the quality of the foods we eat and how they alter this marvelous but complex organism, the human body. Today, we are excited, and I'm excited, to show what our amazing team has built to take us closer to our mission, to, to end the metabolic health crisis. A while ago, one of our customers said, every time I think about my fitness pal, I want to die. So we decided to build something better. Introducing food tracking by Vary. Our enhanced food tracking functionality replaces the standard ways of logging foods by making the experience more intuitive and responsive using a combination of text and voice. The feature uses a database of over one million grocery, restaurant, and other food items to track amounts, calories, macros, and micronutrients. You might be thinking, ah, oh, that's pretty basic. But unlike any product of its kind, in addition to monitoring the aforementioned very grades, how healthy different foods are for your unique metabolism, based on your body's glycemic response, and even the level of processing each food item has gone through. 
the big challenge using a calorie counting application is speed, and it just feels very non-intuitive. We took on a challenge of making the experience as fast as possible. You might be asking how much faster. We made it five times faster than what is really out there. By looking at the logic of logging foods, data structuring, and with using a combination of various input methods. Let's take it for a spin. <clears throat> Our team has done an astonishing work thinking through the logic and user experience of making the process faster, intuitive, and more enjoyable than other products really out there. As I said, in addition to the basic insights like calories, macros, and micros, we grade the foods from 1 to 10, and we look at the nutrient density um, and, uh, and, and, and the nutrient density uh, and the level of processing of those foods and put them into different sort of buckets. And not just the foods, but every single ingredient that is inside a pasta bolognese, for example. That will keep going for a minute or so, the video there. And just for the sake of this presentation, I have to, I have to keep moving. Um, have you ever visited a doctor's office to test out your blood sugar levels? If you know, you know what a pain the whole experience really is. You can't eat anything the previous night. Uh, you need to drive out. You need to draw blood to receive a single data point and wait for results multiple days. With the support of our advisors from world-renowned organizations like Harvard, Stanford, Duke University, our team of data scientists and engineers put their heads together to develop a better indicator of metabolic health based on contextual time series data. I'm proud and excited to unveil uh, metabolic health span. Health span is a scientific-based metric that integrates five evidence-based metrics into one. It's developed to be a guiding metric for their users to understand how well their metabolic health improves over time based on context-rich time series data without a single drop of blood. With metabolic health span, our team has packed hundreds of euros more value into one single product experience being very. Both of these features will be available in the app in the beginning of December. Being raised and support, supported by the entrepreneurship community here in Finland, I, wa I really want to thank the team at Slush and the amazing volunteers putting this year's event together. I know the effort and the hard work it takes, and you've done an amazing job yet again. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Antoni Aniebadam. I'll see you around. Thank you so much for that, Anthony. In the past years, Miro has taken the world over a storm. With over 35 million people using the collaborative whiteboard platform globally, it is among the most recognized software applications used. There is no question that its product-driven founder has done something right. Andre is the founder and CEO of Miro. Miro has more than 1,400 employees in 11 offices across the globe and over 30 million registered whiteboarding fans. Taking the stage with Andre is Axel's Harry Nellis, general partner at Axel and an early investor to Miro. Harry is all too aware of what it's like to be in founder's shoes. Prior to joining Axel in 2004 as one of the first members of the London office, Harry founded his own venture-backed software company. Now his current portfolio includes some of Europe's most successful private technology companies, such as Celonis, Check24, Miro, and Personia. 
This is Miro's wild growth through wild times. Welcome on stage, Andre and Harry. Hello, Andre. How are you? Hi, doing Harry. Today? Doing good. good. Thank you. Good. Great. Andre, as you know, is the CEO and founder of Miro, the online collaboration platform. Um, especially during COVID, the company went through an enormous growth spurt and is now serving 45 million users a month. Uh, Andre, Miro clearly has been a product led growth success story for the people in the room. What are the secrets to building a product-led growth company? Yeah, my pleasure to share those insights with you folks here. So we started in 2011, and we shipped our first product in 2012. And since then, it was a lot of iteration toward kind of today's success of the business and of the product. And from day one, we were focused on our users. And this is the key for me in terms of product-led growth. When you understand your user, when you understand your user behavior in the product, when you understand the problem your user is trying to solve with your product, you can iterate toward better, better solution for them, better fit for them. So we uh, took our initial cohorts of users back in the day, and we had all different users from education, from product, from engineering, from, from marketing, from different departments. And even some users were uh, using the product for the Personal, personal goals. So we took all of them and we start iterate toward like what resonates with the key cohorts and where we see the best retention. And once we found uh, those users and once we found uh, where retention is flattening over time, we start to build around that and we start to iterate the onboarding. We start to iterate uh, product value around that and start to iterate how we can uh, drive the, the virality. So. That's what took several years to actually figure out and, and, and build. And uh, once we optimized all these user journeys and built kind of best leak UX for them, it started to grow organically really fast. And as some people say, like when you hit product market fit, you feel it. Uh, and you, we, we actually remember this uh, time when we uh, send service to our users and ask, like, hey, how would you feel about uh, Mira would not be there anymore? At that time, it was real-time board, actually. We ask, like, how would you feel if real-time board is not available anymore? And people were strongly disappointed about that. So as well, we saw, like, pretty, pretty strong organic uh, uh, word of mouth around the product. So at that time, we clearly understood that this is happening now. The product market is happening. And we start to layer marketing and sales, which was also layered in a product-led growth way, where marketing and sales were connected with the product signals, with the usage, and try to extend the journey and like bring bigger customers uh, on a journey where they need help and support. So that's, uh, that's what we did. And um, to summarize, I think that key uh, for product-led growth is understanding your user, their behavior, building best-in-class user experience, and um, yeah, advancing that through marketing and sales, which is working as the same engine. Were there particular features in the product or aspects to the product that made the product-led growth model particularly viable? Yeah, I mean, um, in terms of functions, we had um, a bunch of... Um, a bunch of things that we focused on. For example, we organized our product uh, in a way where we create value and distribute value. And um, a lot of teams, like product teams, they just do both. 
and we separated that. Like one team was focused on creating value, and the second team was focused on how they optimize the journey, how they optimize the conversion rates on the journey. And that was one of the decisions that we made early in the day, which uh, was pretty successful for us. Uh, and uh, there are a bunch of other things that we did. Like, for example, our growth um, organization consists of growth marketing and growth product, and they work together. It's a tribe. Uh, while product reports to product organization, growth marketing reports to marketing organization, they work together. They have shared goals. They have shared uh, KPIs, and they work toward those goals together. So this is another organizational decision, organizational architecture that we did to, to support these dynamics um, and to build truly product-led growth. We, we see our organization uh, uh, not like in silos where like product is working separately, success separately, marketing separately, uh, or, or other functions. We see it as a consistent journey, and the organization is built around the journey of the user and the customer. There are a lot of things to improve as an every organization, but that's the foundational kind of philosophy around how we organize it. Got it. Um, COVID hit. Suddenly, organizations needed a tool like Miro to run their business. There was no way around it. They needed something like this. And you were in the market at, at the right time and at, and at the right place. Your organization grew dramatically um, how did you manage that, and how did you manage to have what is still a very consistent culture across all the offices and across all the employees that you have? It was hard. Um, last couple of years were really difficult for us. Uh, when the COVID started, we were around 240 people organization, and today we are almost 1,800 people organization. Uh, we were around 3-4 million users on our platform, and today we're around 50 million users on our platform. So we had a tremendous growth in the last uh, several years. And uh, the biggest kind of challenge was, uh, to what you say, is to find the right people for the organization, onboard them properly, and make them successful with the business. So what we did is we it was before COVID, but we codified our values. We did it in 2017 when we, as a leadership team, uh, came up together and tried to realize what is kind of shared values uh, we have here and what makes us um, to the point where we are in the journey. So we codified all those values. And then, especially when we started to hyperscale the organization, we integrated those values in every touch point uh, of a uh, new employee's journey from um, like surfacing them on the website and attracting people who share those values to have value-based interviews during every interview with every new um, employee to having a two weeks culture onboarding and to having performance management focused not just on what people deliver, but also on how they did it and how was um, also and is also reflecting the values that people uh, live or not. Uh, um, so all of those touch points were uh, built in, and they helped us to scale the organization where we still feel like at this size of the organization with one company. Mm -hmm. um, again, there's a lot of things to do. One of our key values is iteration. I don't believe there is um, something that is like at the top of the performance. I think there are a lot of things that we can do better as an organization. But I think we have very strong foundations to iterate on top. In a way, to grow from 3.5 million users to 50 million users today in just a matter of two or three years is the definition of hyperscaling. What are, what are the secrets to hyperscaling, and, and what are the three things that really made a difference? Yeah, uh, like different companies have different uh, situations where they kind of accelerated. Uh, we were growing pretty fast before pandemic, so we were doing like almost 3x year over year uh, in terms of the business. So pandemic boosted us even more. And one of the things that I personally learned uh, through all this hyperscale journey is how you can make decisions uh, fast. So because you have to hire 50 
uh, heads and leaders in your organization. You have to uh, change your organization like multiple times every month. You work as a CEO uh, in different organizations every quarter because your job also changes. Like it's the same name, but it's a very different job. Um, and all of those things uh, kind of impact uh, my performance, but if it's my performance, it's the organization performance. And what I understood is like I need to make fast and high quality decisions. And that's what you have to learn, that's what you have to develop. I do it in a way where I have a bunch of advisors, where I can go and validate my, my assumptions, my insights. Uh, I also try to triangulate anything I want to kind of decide on. Like, I'm trying to bring different perspectives on every decision. And I'm trying to do it fast. You need to build a network that helps you to, to make those uh, things fast, because if you once you need to decide on something, and once you only start to build a network around that decision, it, it can go a long way. So, so what, what I learned is like fast decision making, high quality decision making, and bringing people who share the value, who, uh, uh, values of the company, who share the mission of the company. And we, we live our mission. I personally um, wake up every day, and I think that my biggest motivation to continue run and develop the company is the excitement around the mission. Uh, Miro's mission is empower teams to create the next big thing. And when I think about Miro being behind all positive changes in the world, I'm really motivated. I'm fulfilled by that mission. And that also helped us to survive and grow through the pandemic mm. because uh, this is the story you tell to your team, to your customers, to your users. And this is the story that you find people who it will resonate with. Um, and if you have a lot of people with who it resonates, they will be engaged. And if they will be engaged, you move the business and the, and the problem that you are trying to solve forward. So these are a bunch of lessons I learned through the pandemic. So strong values, mission-driven organization, fast decision-making, high-quality decisions, having a strong network, triangulate insights, and yeah, act fast upon them. What ended up being easier than you thought it would be? And what ended up being harder in this journey? I think the hardest part of uh, our business is people. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's the most um, kind of uh, fulfilling part uh, because we all come together to co-create. Uh, we all are kind of you know, creative creatures so who are um, trying to change status quo, who are coming to who are trying to come up with something new. But at the same time, we are all humans. We have our emotions, we have reactions, we have our disappointments, excitements, and challenging times. And the hardest thing is like to uh, keep motivation going. It all starts with us as a leaders, but it's also uh, necessary to make sure that the team feels uh, that they are in the right place, that they are heard, that they are included. Because if we don't walk the walk inside the business, uh, our customers would not kind of feel that. And we as a company, we as a product, we provide this platform for empowering teams to create the next big thing. And our customer is a team, is a group of people who come together to create something. And we need to charge them with an energy, not just to ship uh, software to them. So that's, that's what I think is the hardest thing in terms of um, kind of hyper growth and leading the company. But also, on the, on the easier side, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Um, the easiest side is uh, to make, um, you know, to, the easiest side is to let things go, like, and uh, be in a bit of a passenger seat. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm speaking about that because I've been in a lot of situations where I let myself to be in a passenger seat in some decisions, and I regret that in a bunch of them. I would kind of be more in a driver's seat where I had this initial gut feel, I need to be in a driver's seat. So that's the easiest, like to be in a passenger seat and see how it goes. Right. So. For many software companies, to be number one in the world, you've got to be number one in the US. 
And actually, the hardest bit for a software company is to land in the U.S., not only with customers, but also with, with employees. How did that work at Miro? Yeah, um, definitely. Like We started a company in Europe, and we have our product engineering in Europe, while our users and customers were across the world. We are um, spread pretty evenly between Europe and the, and the U.S. in terms of revenue and usage. And I was intentional um, when I was thinking of hiring go-to-market that it should be in the U.S. And if we look today at the organization, the majority of the leadership of the business is in the U.S., and especially go-to-market leadership. And that helped us to balance our um, kind of leadership focus across all regions. So our chief revenue officer is in the U.S., chief customer officer in the U.S., chief marketing officer in the U.S., chief sales officer in the U.S., and a bunch of other leaders are in the U.S. While um, in Europe we have a chief product officer, chief technology officer, myself, um, a head of self-serve business and growth. So we balance this team between two continents to make sure that we are growing uh, fast in both regions and that we are making global decisions that serves all regions at the same time. We added Japan, we added Australia, we strengthened our European presence uh, in the last couple of years. And the idea was to make sure that the leadership is evenly spread to make all markets a success. <laughs> so you have enough people to make it a success, but you also have enough balance for those people in other regions not to gravitate toward one market. Mm. So that's what we did, and it worked pretty well for us so far. We're happy with the distribution of our customers and users across regions. And yeah, if you are kind of organically started in, in Europe, uh, and your product engineer is here, maybe your hires should be there to, to to, to, to go after that market. Even if you do it in Europe, I would definitely go with the talent that saw how to grow the business in the US. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very different, um, in a way, operational cadence that I noticed in the US. And in some positions in Europe, we bring people from the US to fill those positions because they know how to hyperscale and how to, to, to support the business through this uh, growth stage. So, yeah, that's, that's what I would think of. Was it hard to attract great people in the U.S. early on? Because typically, it's hard, people don't know the product, people don't know the company, they're reluctant to join something that they haven't really heard about. Um, was it hard in the beginning, and did it, become easier, did it become easier later on? I think it's every time hard. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a thing that you should appreciate. It's a hard thing to hire best-in-class people. And what I do, I try to understand, I try to benchmark what awesome looks like in every role, in every job. Before I go into hiring, I actually start to dig into my network and ask people who are best-in-class operators in this or that role, what they accomplished. Um, do they know how to do zero to one, or they are more um, kind of operators at a scale when they can scale things? So that's what I start with. I, I start with understanding who are best in class people out there. I learn from them. I calibrate against them, and then I start search. And I don't give up until I find the best in class person for the business. And yeah, we have some searches going for almost two years. But it's worth it because um, the time you onboard the person into the business, the time you kind of uh, you give the person to build their organizations, to develop a culture, it's huge. Like, and if you do something wrong, um, it will cost you way more than the cost of delayed hire. And um, of course, like hiring is one of my key priorities as a CEO, like I run all the leadership searches myself, um, the people who report to me, like uh, I'm trying to be on top of those things. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of work to make it right. But that's definitely not the work you will fully delegate someone. You definitely can have people who help you in this. And I'm, I'm uh, pretty lucky to have those people on my team 
who helped me with this, but it's, it's my job to hire right leaders for the company. You sometimes talk about managers who can do zero to one and other managers who can do one to infinity. Can you explain what you mean by that and how it is relevant to you today? Sure, yeah. Um, so for those who are in a product world, you know that like iteration from zero to one before you got into product market fit is very different from when you scale things uh, when they can hit, hit, hit the customer, hit the uh, relevant usage. Same as with the rest of the business, you have a bunch of things that you have to build in the business. You have to build policies, and you don't want these policies to be just formal operational kind of uh, papers. You want these things to enable people to make uh, faster decisions, to have more autonomy, to be empowered. You need to build a culture, and it also requires uh, leadership skills. You need to build your go-to-market machine, and you have to iterate through your I don't know, inbound engine, or you have to iterate through your sales pitch uh, at scale, especially when you move from one persona to another at scale. You have to iterate on, um, I don't know, like even financial reporting. I was um, really surprised um, to see financial reporting from one of the uh, companies that I'm following how smart they are in uh, their financial reporting and like what metrics they actually look. And I was like, maybe we need to adjust like 20% our financial reporting to look at the right numbers and then as a result to incentivize the organization around those numbers. So all those things require builder skills. And what I mean under builder skills, you have to identify opportunities you have to validate a bunch of hypotheses. You actually have to grab a bunch of hypotheses from your network uh, of people who report to you or uh, who are peers in similar companies. You have to validate those hypotheses against each other. You have to test them uh, with your potential users. And then if something works, scale. If something doesn't work, scale, scale back and iterate further. So it all requires like this zero to one mindset and iterative mindset. And a lot of great operators, they never did it because they didn't build companies from scratch. So what I look at when I interview people is, do they actually zoom in into details? Do they actually come up uh, from first principles while they have iterative approach to things that they do? And it's hard. It's hard to find those people uh, out there. But at least you have to find people who can be coachable and who can iterate with you together on those things. So that's, that's what I mean when I say zero to one. You're now the CEO of a business with 1,800 employees. W what are the things that you like doing, and how do you make sure that you can still do some of those things? Yeah, I love doing product. I love, doing kind of, I love being engaged with the product design. And my, my biggest passion is when I see we deliver the value and that value being consumed. That's my biggest question, passion. So my favorite channel in Slack is product news. Mm. So this is the channel that I read uh, first. Every morning, I read it like every evening first when I go into Slack. Um, because that that's tells me about what's our velocity as a business in terms of delivering value, how we package that value, what are the learnings, what are the insights we're getting, and then checking if this value resonates with our audience or not. That's kind of what I loved um, learning and, and be involved with. Um, I try to be involved in several strategic uh, product explorations, product design explorations, and contribute um, to, to, to the team. Uh, I'm definitely not the driver for those, but I'm a, I, I consider myself as a part of the team. And uh, people might be surprised, hey, what CEO is doing here? Like, we're discussing this, uh, this small thing, but I'm, I'm kind of positioned myself as one of the people on the team. And like, you can, you can pick up my brain, you can pick up my insight, you can skip it, it's, it's up yeah. to you. But I'm here to, to contribute and, um, and uh, bring kind of my 10 years insights being in this space. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other things that you have to do as a CEO. And um, I'm trying to uh, spread my time 
not equally, but kind of in a way where I'm on top of things in all other parts of the organization. It's definitely hard, and I don't know way more than I know these days. Uh, but um, as a CEO, I think it's a responsibility to make sure you are staying on top of things uh, in the business and helping the business uh, move forward in any way possible. So, what are the things that stress you, and, and how do you deal with it? Yeah, um, things that are stressful, and you know, um, I, I had this uh, moment recently, a couple months ago, when. Um, we all came together after pandemic, and there were like 1,600 people in front of me, and I had to deliver the next uh, next organizational um, organizational evolution, kind of where we go and how we go as as a company, as a, as a as a as a culture. And it was pretty stressful to be back in front of uh, the room of people. Uh, with a lot of them I never met before, and I did it, and then I was pretty relieved after that. But in terms of work, I'm not stressed much, so I think as long as you understand the problem, as long as you pick it up and act quickly um, and see things are moving forward as a business, I was like, it's, it's a part of the job, so it doesn't stress me out. Cool. On that note, Andre, it was a true pleasure to, uh, to chat, and um, onwards we go. Thank you, Harry. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre and Harry. The legend of a born unicorn founder seems to be, to a certain extent, a myth. We tend to see a magical aura around unicorn founders. But in reality, founders can actually be guided to reach the billion dollar valuation. Mar Hershenson founded PerVC in 2013, and her bets on companies like DoorDash and Gusto have taken her this year to the global Midas list. The speciality of Per VC is that they don't just invest in early startups, but they have an accelerator consisting of 10 to 15 startups, which they mentor from zero to one and beyond. Now Per VC is expanding into Europe, a process led by Pepe Agel, partner at Per VC. Pepe works closely with founders to help develop and optimize their go-to-market sales and growth strategies. The discussion will be led by Harry Stebbings, founder of 20VC, one of the largest media assets in venture and startups, now with over 175 million in assets under management. Harry's well-known 20-minute VC podcast series reaches some 700,000 subscribers and has 120 million downloads to date. Quite impressive. Very. So this is fantastic unicorns and where to find them. Is this a Harry Potter reference? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to stage, Mar, Pepe and Harry. Massive applause. My God, I feel like I'm at a Maroon 5 concert. This is great. So great. we are going to start today with a little bit of introductions. So why don't we start with you, Ma? Okay. Um, pa, how did you come to co-found Pair with Pajman? And just give us a one-minute intro on that story. Okay, it's a good story, so I'm glad you asked. Um, we started Pair in 2013. I actually had moved uh, to the US from Spain in 1995. I went to school there. I started three companies. I had done one angel investment at the time by 
2013, and my partner, Peshman, had come from Iran. He had been in no companies, but he had done a lot of angel investing for 15 years. He was actually an angel investor in one of my companies, and in 2009, he said, let's start, pay let's start a fund. I really want to help founders, and um, we're going to rent a house, and we're going to fill it up with Stanford students, and we're going to back the best of them, <laughs> and I want you to do it with me. And I said, oh my god, this man is insane. What year was this? This was 2009. 2009. Okay. I said, you're insane. I'm not renting a house with you. Um, and he tried for four years to convince me. Ultimately, uh, he decided to change strategy, and he said, oh, forget the house. Let's just go do some angel investing. Uh, we started meeting at Cooper Cafe, which is this cafe in Palo Alto. Um, at first, like an hour a week, then an hour a day, and then eight hours a day. And I said, fine, you win. Let's go build uh, a fund. So we raised the fund. We rented a home, and we still have a home where you know, it's like a communal space where founders work, there's no charge, there's a lot of food and activity, so it's, you know, anyway. So and Peshman got his And house. you've been to that place. I, I have, I had tea yes. with Peshman there. Yeah. Pepe, give me one minute intro on you. Yeah, my, my story, I'm also from Barcelona, I actually moved to the States in 2008, just fascinated by Silicon Valley and its entrepreneurial culture. And I wanted to learn from others and eventually start my company, and, and so I did. Um, in 2011, we started Charboost, and that's a company that I've led for 10 years, backed by Sequoia Capital, and, and successfully sold to Zynga last year. And uh, so I took some time off after selling it, and I knew socially, actually, Mar, as a fellow Spaniard in Silicon Valley, and she seduced me together with the rest of the team to come <laughs> over to this side. Uh, so I joined as a venture partner uh, first, uh, uh, part-time, and you know, three days a week that I committed for became seven days a week quickly. So I want today to be as like tactical and granular as possible, especially for founders. I think that's what Slush specializes in. And we're going to focus specifically on the fundraising market. It's changing every day. And I want to start at seed first. And so when we look at the seed market today, are valuations fundamentally different now versus 2021? Yes, yeah, so yes, they're lower. Valuations are lower than 2021. But I, I want to put things on perspective because 2021 is not the benchmark. And if we back track uh, to the last 10 years, we saw one of our early investments, DoorDash, did a seed round at, a, at an 8 million valuation in 2013. Oh. Last year, we saw a company actually out of Colombia, founded by fellow Spaniards, doing a 14 million round at a north of 60 million valuation. So again, that is not the benchmark. And what we're seeing now is valuations going back to 15 to 20 million for seed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. We are expecting valuations to maybe drop a little bit, but not too much. And the reason is that there's so many investors. There's liquidity in this market. Um, yesterday, I think at the investor event, there were 1,700 investors. So there are opportunities for early stage uh, companies. So, so we think we're at reasonable, state, uh, reasonable levels um, now. I, I, we said we'd go off schedule, so we are, but I'm just too interested. You said that like, okay, 15 to 20. So that's like four or five on a 15, 20, 25 post, whatever we go for. Like, the thing I, I don't see anymore really is actually the friends and family or the pre seed. It seems like for pedigreed founders, we've skipped this one on five stage and we've just gone straight to the three or four on 15 to 20. Do, do you see what I see? or? Uh, definitely. I think there is, uh, if you are what I call them elite founders, and yeah. everybody has a different definition of an elite founder. Could be a second time founder or somebody who's, you know, been at a high growth company for a long time. So you have an exec out of Klarna go and start a company. Um, they get just a premium and valuation. Uh, and they skip that pre-seed round. But for most companies, there is this pre-seed round where you need that initial, you know, uh, cash to prove something. Yeah. So, you know. I mean, speaking of needing cash, I think the really interesting thing is also like how much cash to raise and how much runway to raise for. I actually always take the view that you should always raise much more than you need because things always take longer. When you think about fundraising today and advising founders in the audience, how much runway is the right amount of fun Run, runway to raise four, uh, specifically today, do you think? And how do you advise them? 
So for seed, we don't typically ask for necessarily for a runway of 18 months. I know we've heard this, yeah. this word quite a lot. But we do want our founders to be nimble, to be able to be very agile and iterate. Companies need iterations, right? So you need to have that enough space to iterate, to, f to get closer to product market fit, and to build sustainably for, for the long term. I think in our portfolio, 40% of our companies have gone through iterations and pivots, Post. right? One of our stars, Branch, for instance, uh, they've done three pivots. Uh, they started, uh, <laughs> they've gone from a consumer app to now being a, a deep link SDK, right? <laughs> Totally agree. With and you need you need that time and and that space to be able to iterate. I, and I would even go farther and say that the measure of success really really early on your KPI is how well are you iterating. So how many iterations can you fit in a cycle of pre-seed, right? And it has to be a good iteration, meaning that you can't quit too early. So you have to try it all the way, and you have to learn something from that iteration. So you have to be measuring. So you can do the next one with some more knowledge, right? So the random walk doesn't work. You have to be thoughtful as to how you do it. I do just want to dig in on that. Speaking of like measuring in each iteration, yes. can you give us an example of one, just so we can actually kind of go granular on and understand what that means, and so people can build that velocity into their iterations? What do you mean when you maybe, maybe I can talk to you about Branch. This is an older company of ours, and you know, originally when we invested, so this is iteration two, um, they had a consumer app where you could choose photos and you get a photo album. And we said, okay, um, you know, I gave him some money initially, a pre-seed money, and I said, let's try grow, let's try paid advertising to see if it works, right? So the founders went out at Christmas when everybody prints photos and we, you know, tried to change the knobs to, to get to a reasonable CAC. We couldn't get there. I think we tried every possible. No, but we were tracking and we couldn't get there. And you know, the founder was ultimately convinced this is never going to work, right? And then he iterated. And the iteration said, well, if I want to print, I'm not just going to print from my app. I want to print from every possible app in the world. So I'll, be, I'll build a printing SDK. So I would call that a pivot, yeah. but it's somewhat of an informed pivot, right? In I that sense. Totally get you. Uh, again, I'm so sorry because we <laughs> did have the schedule. But when we think, I, I had a founder the other day and they had six on the table, but they only set out to raise three. Okay. And I said, listen, f raise. Yeah, okay, I, I, I love this. Question. I'm interested to, uh, <laughs> we might have different views on this. I was like, five or six, take it. Put aside three, like pretend like you have three, save it in the bank and operate with the mentality that you only raise three, but you need the cash. And actually, it's better to have that for the rainy day because iterations can always last longer. What do you think? Well, that, that is an approach. I think having been, <laughs> the, having been on the founder's side, it definitely gives you a safety net. It allows you to maybe think bigger, which yeah. is necessary, just having that cushion. Yeah. Um, I think I, I would... From the, 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 on the other side of the spectrum, there's uh, those founders who just want to raise as little as possible, whatever you need, and, and, and I, again, stay nimble. I, I have to say this, because when you say, put it away, and people don't act the same way. If you don't have money, you're going to work, you're going to go figure out the truth before you know, anybody else, right? When you have money, you hide the truth. Yeah. And if you look at numbers, raising a higher seed is not a sign of you making it to a Series A. It's not. It's not. It gives you amazing leverage for fundraisers as well. I think it gives you more time. I, 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 I tell you that the DNA of a suffering company is irreplaceable. Yeah. It's irreplaceable. And, and by the way, if you, if you are a founder, and I want to look at you, you only have so much equity in a company, right? It's a bad sign when a founder is like, I want to raise more money to be sure. It's like, okay, you don't believe you can do it, right? I'm just saying you, you should keep all the equity for yourself, uh, not for me or anybody else. Right. We, we've seen that. Execution is so important. And in terms of scarcity, we're way more productive. Yeah. Just think of you getting ready for an exam. When do you study more? <laughs> So the day when you're study. getting ready for an exam, when do you study more? The day before or a month before? I think that's on the assumption that I did study for the exams. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, uh, I, I, I see it all, all the time, the curve of productivity of a company. 
the less they have, the more they do. I think the really interesting thing, though, like taking this company for an example, like you know, there was a lot of interest in this company, but then for a lot of other companies, there's not interest, and a lot of times it's because of the space that they're in, and investor kind of attraction is often led by segments. Like when you think about segments enjoying investor tailwinds and segments that are maybe colder. How do you think about which are kind of colder and hotter, and how do you advise founders in? in well, I could, t- you, you know, I can tell you today in this environment, anything that needs a lot of money, it's a hard sector to invest in, right? Because money is more expensive. So, you know, you couldn't do something like a last mile delivery company. I mean, I think you've seen all the last mile people. Um, I think you know, cutting costs, right? Like, I think Gorillas Pepe was telling me they were burning $90 million a month. So you gotta cut, you gotta cut. Um, autonomous vehicles, they need a lot of cash, right? So, I mean, you, we've seen Argo, AI, um, just shut down. They've raised $3.6 billion, right? There's not enough cash to build that. There are some bright spots. If anybody in the audience is doing generative AI, there is a premium going on for those companies. You know, Pepe and I were actually using generative AI to answer your questions. Oh, really? No, just kidding. Oh, great. I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, <laughs> hope it's real. good. I hope it's good. <laughs> I want to ask, I think a lot of founders have raised a seed or raised yeah. some money, and they're thinking, okay, well, funding markets have changed. How have expectations of where my business is changed as well? When you think about what companies need to do in graduating from seed to A, what has changed in the last year? Um, what we've seen, good companies always raise, and I don't think that's changed. Yeah. I think, I think um, uh, the best companies, and by, by good companies, what we mean at Pair, and, and we like building towards four things. First, you need economics. They need to be profitable and, and get as close as possible to co- contribution margin profitable. We like uh, businesses that have higher LTV than CAC, and ideally 3x at least LTV f- from CAC. We like low payback times. And then we want growth, growth, and being able to fuel that growth, right? That is the goal. Obviously, at <laughs> Seed, you're, it you're not like getting a great there. company. Right. Exactly. Um, so I think I. You got it? Hello, hello. You did. There we go. Am I back? Yes. All right. So anyways, I don't think these uh, basic fundamentals have changed. But obviously, when money is expensive, and we're clearly in that period of time, the bar is, is just higher. So anyone building a company right now, focus on being as much as possible to show signs of building a good company. I, I think, you know, at Seed, you're trying to figure out, can I build a machine that can scale and grow? And when you get a Series A money, it's all about scaling that machine, right? So a good Series A investor is looking at not necessarily the you know, the, how much revenue or the, any absolute value they're looking at can you scale? So it's more about um, you know the expectation than the actual level. But you know to give you some numbers, which maybe the audience is interested in. Think in 2021, a Series A, you didn't need much revenue. I would say a few hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Uh, you would get. Nobody cared about metrics in terms of LTV to CAC or payback. It's like, you're going to figure it out. Don't worry about it. Uh, the multiples were 100 to 300x. So, you know, you could be a company that was doing, I don't know, 300K in ARR, and you would be 100 million. You could even be zero revenue on a 100 million valuation, right? Clubhouse. Well, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. <laughs> Often it's easier to raise money like pre-launch or on zero Absolutely. revenue. Absolutely. That was yeah. a, a, a Series A in 2021 was a seed, you know, today. Now in 2022, so this is today, if you go and raise a Series A, what happens with everything is the pendulum swings, right? So if this was 2017, we went this way and now we're this way. So people are much more demanding, right? So you're going to need enough revenue. Um, and I, I want to say that 
you know, there's no absolute, but people want you to do, I'm seeing people actually want one and a half to two million, especially if you've raised the big seed, right? If you've raised six million, if you spent it, then they want more revenue. They're gonna want those unit economics that Pepe said, et cetera. So you might be a company doing one and a half or two million ARR, and your 2022 valuation may be 50. And you're like, you have valuation nostalgia from you know, a year ago. So you have to let go because the rules have changed. And um, you know, one of the things founders should not do is trade crappy terms for high valuations at the end of the day. Can, can we play out like a hypothetical scenario? Let's there, do it. There's a startup and they've got 12 <laughs> months of runway, okay? So they don't need to raise now, but leverage is always great. But they're also thinking, ah, I don't know, 2023 could be even worse. How do you advise founders in the 10 to 12 months of runway where we don't know what 23 is going to look like? Some say it's worse, some say it's much worse. How do you advise them on when to raise and how to time their fundraise? I mean, it, it takes time to raise, right? And we're seeing now at least six months ahead, I would say. Um, so again, it depends on where you are on that iteration process and th those signs of becoming a good company. Yeah. So I would say uh, raise at least <laughs> start raising at least nine months ahead because you're 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 gonna need good six months. I don't know, Mar, what do you think? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I I would look at a company and say, okay. Let's look at all those questions, those four things that Pepe was saying, and let's see what grade do we give ourselves. Do we have proven unit economics? Do we have uh, growth? Do we have retention? Do we have payback times that are under control? Whatever it is, it's slightly different if you're a consumer or a B2B company. If the metrics are good, then I'm not, I'm not worried, okay? Because I know we will be able to raise. If the metrics are not good, depending on how far we are, uh, today, you know, you're assuming you're really far. I'm going to say 10 months is not enough. We need a longer time because it takes time for a company to figure things out, right? If you're close, I may say, okay, let's, you know, do minor iterations. We'll probably be able to get there. So it really is on a case by case basis, right? And depends on really the fundamentals of that engine. Are they working or are they not working? Can I ask, what happens to all the companies that raise preemptive Series A's yes. with very little revenue, very little product market fit, but in a popular space? What happens to all of them in this new market? They're at a higher risk, right? Because let's assume you were that $100 million company yeah. um, at zero revenue. So now you're you are literally at the iteration stage where you're trying to figure out your go-to-market and your product. You're at the same risk level as a seed company. It might take one iteration, two, ten, or infinite iterations, which means you never get there, right? Um, you may go out on fundraise with a $2 million in revenue, and then your valuation is only 60. And then it's a trouble, because what do you do? You're going to do a down round. Down round are horrible for founders. They're just terrible because you get completely diluted and so on. So those companies have to work really, really hard to grow into that $100 million valuation. Can I just jump on that? Yes. Albert Wenger from USV tweeted recently that like, in his career, you know, there's a lot of talk about down rounds, but in his career, he's only ever seen or executed on two. Um, and actually, that's not as common as people think. And it's so challenging with the damage to morale and what happens to internals within the company. Like, have you had a down round uh, you know, process go through? And what advice would you give to founders who are contemplating going through it or going through it? Well, you know, there are many ways to do down rounds, right? And I think when a company, I mean, when we invest, and I think a lot of venture people feel this way, we are part of that team. If the founder, I mean, listen, the founders got raised money at 100 million, let's say this hypothetical company, um, Somebody paid that. Yeah. They're responsible as well, right? We're both responsible for those prices. So if we need to do a down round, and, and you want to keep the company successful, you need to take care of your team, of the team, because ultimately those are the people that do the work, right? So if you do a down round in a way where the founders and the team are still significant owners of that company, so you take some of the blame, um, you're okay. If you take a down round where you are like, I don't care, my legal documents say this, I'm gonna do whatever it takes. Um, then there's a lower chance of ultimate success, right? So mm -hmm. it really depends on how you do it. You can't be that greedy. This is not just the founder's fault. This is everybody's fault. 
Yeah. One, one point that I would like to make, because we're taking the f fundraising perspective here, yeah. but one thing that we tend to forget is also our responsibility as founders to, to build teams. And I think today, the talent is extremely informed. So those companies that last year did these crazy rounds with very little uh, revenue, as you said, Talent knows that, and I've been, I've been in good times and hard times, and it's very hard to get the best talent as a founder when people know that your valuation was inflated, that revenue is not there. So I think because we're talking about finding fantastic unicorns, I think we also need to think about the impact of having these crazy rounds, not only from a financing perspective, but also on building teams that are going to help help you succeed in the future. So to you, do you kind of just say how it is then? If you're one of the founders of one of these very inflated like, price companies, do you say to the team, hey, we're all aware that this price is something that we're going to have to grow into, but let's grow into it. To get, how do you communicate that to the team when they're going, this is crazy? I think as my perspective, again, having been in hard times is transparently and vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, uh, you need to be open to the reality and what the company is. And my experience has always been that even if you don't know how to get out of this, but if you communicate it as soon as possible early on to everyone, especially the top talent in the company, um, they're going to feel involved and they're going to be part of the solution. I mean, a lot of people are repricing options, right? Yeah. So that's an important part. To Absolutely. keep your employees, you have to reprice those options. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to ask a really unfair one now. We have product, we have market, and we have team. How do we weigh these three kind of core pillars of a company when making an investment decision today? You should take it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it depends on where you are. From my seed, where we do seed, um, and seed means typically there's nothing. There's no product, there's no customers, or there may be some MVP, but it's very, very early. It's all team. I mean, our majority is team. It's all we have, right? Um, but there's a caveat on that team. I mean, we're looking as to how they present the company. And the, the company at Seed is just an initial hypothesis of some product you're building and a market you're going to. So I look at how the founder is describing that market, how ambitious they are, uh, how knowledgeable they are about the product of what they're going after. So all those details matter. Right? It's not just the founder, it's kind of their awareness of the rest as well, right? But yeah, I think Mike Maple says it very well. He says, like, what's your insight development? Yeah. Like, how do you see the world in a way that they don't see it yet? Oh, exactly. That's part of it, right? And some founders have spent 10 years working on something, so they bring something to the table, for sure. We've mentioned iterations many times, we've mentioned pivots many times. I think the hardest thing when you're going through it is, When's too early? When's too late? And what's the right time? You've both been through pivots. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's never too early or too late. We uh, we tried to work together with our companies very early on to put together operating plans. Yeah. When you have milestones, goals that you live and breathe for, and you look at the hard data, it's not, it, it, you, you don't get emotional about pivots, right? So I think the sooner you put together a plan, you set up goals um, across the organization. It's not only product adoption, it can be team, it can be, um, but with clear metrics, it's, you, you're going to easily see that things are not working out, right? And you can work with your board if you have a board or with uh, mentors or advisors, right? But the, we encourage our companies to put together these operating plans very early on so that they can be, be detached uh, of the emotion and go through these pivots a little bit more rationally. Now, I want to do one final question, then we're going to do a quick fire round. I want to ask about biggest miss. I think often we learn a lot from our biggest miss and how it changes our investing mindset. Um, <laughs> so when we think about our biggest miss today, what's the biggest miss and how did it impact your investment decision making? Mar loves this question. That's a very <laughs> painful question. <laughs> we'll say it first. <laughs> because, um, you know, I think we all have our anti-portfolio, which is the companies that we could have invested and we did not invest. Mm -hmm. In the life of Pear, we're nine years old, we've done 14 big misses, so there's not just one. So I think it's one and a half per which year. One's, which one sticks with you the most? Um, you know, I think probably Rappi is the one that pains me the most. Um, why, why Rappi in particular? Uh, they were from Spain. 
which is where I'm from. We actually worked really hard. We introduced them to their first investors. And um, you know, ultimately, we didn't do it because the valuation at the time, this was 2016, it was 26 million. And Peshma and I thought, oh my god, that is crazy. Who would do a seed at 26 million, right? Um, and at the end, you know, our business is very simple. You have to back the best people, big markets. Um, when you start thinking about valuation, or analyzing proof points, et cetera, you know, you make mistakes. So, yeah. yeah. I don't know, that was our biggest, but I have 14, <laughs> you know, so. I mean, that's a cool episode. So we lots of scars. 14 scars, <laughs> yes. Okay, we're gonna do a quick fire round. Ready? All right. But, I, but I'm gonna direct the questions here, so don't worry. So we're gonna go with Pepe. What is the most common investment mistake you see now? Not building your own criteria and being dragged by FOMO. I, I heard a brilliant one, which is, you know, uh, ventures traditionally FOMO, but in 2022, we have JOMO, which is <laughs> joy of missing out. Yes. Um, uh, tell me, Mark, what's the best investment advice you've received? Um, we're not on the bus in the business of not investing, which means that when you look at a company, it's not about why it won't work, but what could happen that it would work. You know, that's the way to look at it. Pepe, why Europe? Why now? You're obviously in Barcelona. Uh, why Europe? Why now for Pair? Well, we're in Europe. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> it's, um, I, think, I think talent is more fluid than ever. And great talent comes from or wants to live in Europe now. Ma, biggest fundraising mistake you see founders make today? Uh, go see Sequoia for your first meeting. So please practice first like a hundred times before you see anybody you want. <laughs> Do you say they should? Sorry. Do you say they should stage stage it in terms of like angels first test out? No, I mean like you're ready to go finance. You know, when you practice a pit, you're you're getting ready. It's like a little bit of acting, right? Um, if you want to see your highest target, your you want I want to work with this investor. Don't go pitch him first. Practice with other people before you go see your, you know, your best practice target. Practice with the other investors. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Pepe, what have you recently changed your mind on? Uh, that's a good one. I thought we would become kind of Zoom animals, and <laughs> I am valuing more and more the in-person meetings. Yep, got you. <laughs> so, uh, Ma, what would you most like to change about the world of venture? Well, one, uh, one of the things I care a lot about is diversity. You know, we still have, um, it's a, you know, and I think it's less in Europe, but in the US, we still have only 2% of companies that are female founders only, and 15% have one female. So, you know, that's, that's something we can do better as a... Okay, so final one for both of you, and I want like, separate ones from each of you. So what was your most recent publicly announced investment, and why did you say yes and get so excited? Two. I'll start. So um, there's a company that I'm very excited about. They're actually from Barcelona. It's called Spathios. It's a platform to book uh, venues for corporate events. And I met the founder through actually a common contact, a common founder. And um, I've been in the business of organizing e events. I know how painful it is to book a venue, to book everything that needs to happen. And we love the greed of the founder. So uh, we decided to invest in their pre-seed and they've been part of PairX, which is our uh, pre-seed bootcamp. And uh, we're very excited, very excited. They're gonna be doing a, a seed soon. Ma, most recent investment? Uh, you know, now people announce their seats like a year later, so you know, I have to <laughs> rewind. Um, but uh, maybe Fair Street, which is a company that sells software to Medicare agents, it sounds really boring, but it's a massive market. Um, the founders, Tori and Sarah, took my class at Stanford and they came in with the idea of building a healthcare company. I said no for two years. Uh, and they kept working on it and iterating. So finally, I'm like, oh my God, this, people are never going to give up. So, you know, we ended up backing them and um, we helped them through the pre-seed. And they just, they just, a few months ago, they closed the seed round with, was several times oversubscribed. So they're really happy about it. I'm going to ask one more really unfair one. Ma, in 10 years time, where is Pear? In 10 years' time, you know, our vision is very clear for Pair. We want to be the best seed fund that ever existed. So, uh, you know, it's, um, I think when you look at 
a series, you know, the, the, the great firms, the Series A firms, you know which are the top five, but you know how about seed, and that's where Payer wants to be. So, you know, we had a lot of work to do. Ma, we're Pepe, on it. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been a joy to do. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mar, Pepe, and Harry. More and more companies are trying to tap into the power of buzz to drive business growth. Rahul Vora, CEO of Superhuman, has done this successfully, generating excitement around his company and product. Rahul's company, Superhuman, has built a user base that borders on the fanatical as well as an impressive lineup of investors that includes everyone from A16Z to Ashton Kutcher and Will Smith. Nice. Oh, unfortunately, we couldn't have Sofia Amoruso join us today. So actually, instead, we're going to have Harry. Harry, have a glass of water, and you'll be back on stage in a minute <laughs> interviewing Rahul on stage. So the question is, how has Rahul managed to capture people's attention and generate so much interest in superhuman. And how can this kind of bus be captured by other companies, yourselves here in the audience? This is the secrets to using buzz to build your company. Welcome on stage, Rahul and Harry. I'm excited for this. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, guys. You've got two of me in a row. Um, if I'm looking down at my phone more, um, I didn't write this schedule, but this is going to be a free-flowing one for sure. So, um, Rahul, let's start with some context, some intros. Rahul, the Superhuman, we all love it. But how did you come to found Superhuman? How did you come to change our lives with email? How did I come to found the product? Well. I previously also had an email company that some folks here may remember called Reportive. It was the first Gmail browser extension to scale to millions of users. On the right-hand side of Gmail, we showed you what people looked like, where they worked, their recent tweets, links to their social profiles, and this thing grew like crazy. In less than two years, I ended up selling it to LinkedIn, where I ran all of our email integrations. And during those four years, I became intimately familiar with how professionals do their email, and the TLDR is really badly. So we decided, let's build the fastest email experience in the world. It's blazingly fast, where search is instantaneous, where everything happens in 100 milliseconds or less. An email experience where you never actually have to touch the mouse, where you could do everything from your keyboard and fly through your inbox. An email experience that had the best Gmail plugin functionality, but built in natively, and one, of course, that just worked offline. And so with that vision, we built Superhuman. Now, I, the thing I loved about Superhuman was kind of the exclusivity that it had from very, very early days. It was obviously kind of invite only from what I remember, and it had this kind of aura around it. And you've been very surgical in terms of how you build buzz and hype to get early customer traction. Can you talk to me about how you thought about this and some kind of core cool takeaways for you? So we were really surgical about our positioning. And I think this is, I want to make this as actionable as possible. This is something every startup here can do, is get precise about your positioning. The best resource to start with is this article by Ariel Jackson. It's called Positioning Your Startup is Vital. Here's how to nail it. You can Google it right now. And in the article, she uses a fill-in-the-blanks approach. It goes something like, for your target customer who has a key need or opportunity, your product has a key benefit. Unlike competing alternatives, this is its key differentiation. It sounds very abstract. I'll give you an example. She uses one Harley Davidson. So for macho wannabes 
who want to join a gang of cowboys <laughs> and who live in an era of decreasing freedom, Harley Davidson is the only motorcycle manufacturer in the world that makes big, loud motorcycles. And if you're familiar with the brand, you'll know that captures it in a nutshell. And I say this as someone with a Harley in my garage back home. So we thought about this for a while, and we started asking questions like, are we the Ford of email? No, not really. Are we the BMW or the Mercedes of email? No, still not quite. Are we the Tesla of email? Yes, now we're starting to get somewhere. We did a whole bunch more reading, and by the way, here's another book recommendation, Positioning the Battle for Your Mind, and we eventually came to the following positioning. For leaders and managers of high-technology, high-growth companies, Superhuman is the fastest email experience ever made especially for those who feel like their work is mostly email. It's what Gmail could be if it were built today, not 15 years ago. And in Superhuman, everything is meticulously crafted, blazingly fast, and happens in 100 milliseconds or less. Now, you might think that is ludicrously niche. How many people in the world could possibly fit that? But to paraphrase Paul Buchheit, the creator of Gmail, it is far more effective to make a lot of people, sorry, to make few people like you a lot, then lots of people like you a little, because you can always expand from there. That is the key to both. So one thing that really strikes me there is like the challenge. I'm sorry, we are off schedule, but I'm too interested. You, like, email is is used by you know, every segment of society. How do you think about and advise founders when it comes to horizontal product marketing? To when your product is used by so many, to making it resonate across so many different verticals. How do you think about that when you think about that messaging? Well, like I said, our messaging is. Our positioning is, ex is extremely precise. When it comes to the messaging, this is what I always advise to early stage startups. You don't yet know who your hero user is. So like Harry, I also invest. If, if I go to a website and at the very early stage, the startup is extremely precise about who it's for, that's actually probably a mistake because you don't know yet. Have it at the back of your mind. We had the positioning I just gave you at the back of my mind. But if you went to our website, and indeed, if you were to go there today, you wouldn't see any of that. So what do you do? Instead, you simply extol the benefits of your product. Explain what it does for people. In our case, Superhuman helps you get through your inbox twice as fast. You reply to people faster. You'll save three hours or more every single week. But nowhere on the website will you see it's for founders or leaders or managers or executives or business development or sales or all of the people that we now support. So long story short, don't explicitly say who it's for. Just say what the benefit is. How is building for obsessed customers different? What makes that truly different to versus just building for broader customer segments? And how do you think about that in the product build out process? One of the best things about building for obsessed customers is, and people ask me this all the time, how do you get so much feedback? Well, I tell you, if your customers are obsessed, if they live or die by your service, and for all of our customers, email is mission critical, you will be swimming in feedback. At this point at Superhuman, we've now tagged and triaged over 100,000 individual different pieces of feedback. These are recorded verbatim, voices of the customer, actual sentences in a custom CRM, essentially, that we've built explicitly for the purpose of product feedback. And you just don't get this with many companies. So charge early, get obsessed customers. That's one of the benefits. So, so charge early, what, like, when should they charge? How should they think about pricing lessons there? Because also for you, like, to be, and I mean this politely, like 30, like, was it 30 bucks, 30 yeah. quid? Yeah, like, that's quite a lot for email. Like, how did you come to that price, and how do you advise founders on pricing their very early iterations? So we actually charge from day one. We even charge all of our investors to use Superhuman, and, and that was I even know. <laughs> early, as, as well you know. Uh, that was in the early days. How would I advise this to founders? Well, again, I would advise surgical precision. And I want to make this super actionable. The best resource available for pricing is this book called Monetizing Innovation by Madhavan Ramanujan. 
Now, Madhavan describes various ways to do what he calls developing pricing. And this can get arbitrarily complicated with conjoint analyses and expensive consultants will definitely do the, the full bells and whistles approach, but you don't have to do it that way if you're an early stage startup. What we did and what everyone here can do is the Van Westendorp pricing sensitivity meter. You essentially ask your target market four questions. And I'll give you the example of Superhuman. Number one, at what price would this product, Superhuman, be so expensive that you would not buy it? Number two, at what price would this product, Superhuman, be so cheap that you'd be worried about its quality and you also would not buy it? Those prices exist. Number three, at what point would you consider this product to start getting expensive You'd stop and think about it, but you would still actually buy it. And number four, at what point would you consider it a bargain for the money? Now, most founders, most companies intuitively orient around uh, question number four, and that's usually the right thing to do. But as we just discussed, the positioning for Superhuman is premium. Our position is that we are faster and more powerful than Gmail or now Office 365. And it turns out that the question that most directly supports that position is question number three. Uh, it's starting to get expensive, but gosh darn it, email is so important to me and I want to save those three hours a week, I'm still going to buy it anyway. So that's typically what I would advise, but there is one more step, which is once you have this price figured out, and Harry does this math, I'm sure in his sleep at this point, let's do a quick gut check on market size. So you say you want to be a billion dollar company. Well, as we just heard, valuations are regressing to the mean. Let's assume at a billion dollars, that means that you are 10x your run rate. You need to be a hundred million dollar plus revenue business. Well, at $30 a month, you do the math. It's not hard. You need 300,000 subscribers. So we asked ourselves in the early days of Superhuman, do we think we can get to 300,000 subscribers? We answered, yeah, absolutely. We can get to 300,000 subscribers. And so we went ahead with the price. I think, so I, I totally agree with you there. And I love the kind of bottoms up TAM analysis. Uh, the one thing that I also remember very vividly was how struck people were by the onboarding process in terms of building hype. And I'm sorry, because we did have this schedule, but it wasn't my schedule, so I, I just prefer mine. Um, so like, in terms of building hype, you did the onboarding process personally with, with yourself, with other reps, with amazing team members. And everyone said it didn't scale and it wouldn't scale. Like one, how do you reflect on that? And two, how do you advise founders on doing things that don't scale to build hype in the early days? So for those that don't know, some, a little bit of context, Superhuman is famous, infamous, if you will, for, and in a sense, we pioneered this in technology, insisting on 30 minutes one-to-one -one concierge onboardings for every new person that was using the product. And in the early days, I did this myself. I actually turned up in person, and back then it was an hour, and I would bring a gift, a bottle of wine, or if you didn't drink, <laughs> what, you know, something to make you feel really special. There's all kinds of obvious reasons to do this. However, I'm not gonna claim to be a genius. I didn't sit down in our office and think, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we pioneered this new go-to-market that would completely change the way that people retain and become viral and so on. We actually found it by accident. And here is how. I had this observation that most companies, especially B2C-ish companies, and I would count ourselves as B2C to B, make the terrible mistake of just launching their product. Perhaps you go on product hunts, and if you're in a market like ours, general productivity and collaboration, guess what? You'll get tens of thousands of people to sign up in the first few days. That used to be impressive. These days, that's no longer hard. But here's what happens, is those people will come in, they'll use your app, they'll kick the tires, they'll break stuff because it's early stage software, let's be real, things are broken. They'll report those bugs, and if you don't fix them in time, they'll then get disappointed and churn out. That is the very definition of a net detractor. And I've seen this happen, I've seen it happen countless times. So how do we fix this? Well, we only let on board the precise number of people that we think we can actually handle in terms of fixing bugs for. This isn't technical scaling, 
This is technical debt scaling. It's the debt that we all have but that we don't see. And so in the early days, this was really small. I onboarded maybe four or five people a week. And that saturated my small engineering team of 10 people. But eventually, we got the number of bugs down, and the products became higher and higher quality. We could do 10 people a week, 20 people a week, uh, until we were doing hundreds of people, thousands of people per week, and still maintaining a high quality product. What we found, and here's the reason why we continue to scale it, is that we had category leading benchmarks across basically everything you would care about. Uh, retention, churn, net promoter score, products market fit, which is the 40% metric that you may have heard of we came up with previously. Retention, virality, really every which way you could slice it, these users were incredible. Now, as for the folks who said this wouldn't scale, here's the common misconception. If you just grow a large team of people to do onboarding for folks who are not yet sold, then yes, this won't scale. But remember, everyone who met or meets an onboarding specialist back then or today is already a customer. They've already authorized their credit card. They've already signed up. They've probably seen the sent via superhuman signature multiple times, and internally, they're mostly sold. Not 100%, but mostly. And that's what you need in order to make an approach like this work. I have to ask as well, you know, I had Brian Armstrong on the show from Coinbase the other day, and he said, you know, the NFT launch, the mistake we made was we built Buzz too early before the V1, and then never ever has a V1 ever lived up to expectations. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Like, actually, the dangers of building Buzz, kind of what if V1 doesn't live up to expectations, and, and how do you think about that? Because I've been thinking back and forth about that danger of building buzz and whether it's good to set expectations high and create it, or actually whether it can create more challenges as well. I think we need a healthy balance. Sure. I've definitely seen founders go the other way. Yeah. They don't build any buzz at all. And then by the time they're ready to launch, yeah. they're starting from scratch. Totally. That's not a good idea. Do not do that. I see also, and I'm not going to name names, that would be uh, terribly unfair, of founders who build way too much buzz. Yeah. And then V1 doesn't meet expectations, which, by the way, is normal. That's to be expected. But the delta is so large, and the amount of catch-up that that founder now has to do is so great that they never do actually catch up. So this is an awfully delicate balance that we need to somehow thread. I think in our case, we definitely leaned towards creating buzz in years two and three, by which point I would say we still really hadn't launched, not by any reasonable definition. But years one through two, we were hella quiet. There was barely anything we did. I was establishing thought leadership, though. For example, when Mailbox got yeah. shuttered by Dropbox, I thought, aha, here is a good way to inject myself into the news cycle. And I was able to drive north of 10,000 signups just off that little piece of news. And we did a few things like that to build our email list up. Email is still the best marketing channel of all time. So we, by the time that we launched, we had perhaps 50,000 people on the email list and another 50,000 people on Product Hunt upcoming. Can I ask, did being very public and speaking and writing, was that always very natural to you? Because the most uh, kind of common thing that I hear from founders is, I know I need to build a brand, but it's just not me. It's just not me. And I say, well, you know, no one loves going to the gym when they first go to the gym, but you know, you keep going and you get better and better, and then a year later, it's much more natural. Like, did you feel very natural and at home being that public-facing figure? And how's your relationship to kind of your own personal brand building, I guess, changed over time in relation to creating buzz? It does feel really natural. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is where we all need to play into our strengths. Huh. I mean, you are naturally an incredible interviewer, and it's been no, a but blessing. I'm not. I'm not. I've just done it for eight well, years. I've done so 3,000. I was terrible. So here's the thing. I think I was one of your early interviews. You were one of my very early interviews. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the first hundred. Yeah. And, I've, and I've seen Harry become come from that humble beginning, if you don't mind my saying so, yeah. to, at this point, one of the most, if not the preeminent tech interviewer, tech personality in this industry, to the point where I'm like, you're Harry, come back on stage. And he's like, sure, <laughs> I'll just do this off the top of my head. This is fine. <laughs> but to answer your question, I find it very natural. Probably the reason is I grew up doing it competitively. 
Uh, I, I was in the debate team, but I'm actually a terrible debater. So in the, the way that this works in England, I don't know if this work uh, is similar in other countries, you'd have an opener, then someone would rebut, then you'd have someone rebutting that, then you'd have a closer. The thing is about being the opener, you don't have to really argue with anyone else. You don't have to rebut anything. You just get to go out there and be theatrical and really enthuse and entertain an audience. And that was my position, because I was terrible at doing the actual arguments, but I was really good at riling an audience. And so I did this from a very early age, and I loved it. I, yeah, this is, this is what I do. Now, if that doesn't mean that's what every founder should do. If, this, if the idea of doing that makes you terrified or it makes you nervous, please don't do it. There are things that I absolutely suck at, and I don't, I don't even try to do them. I try and build a world-class team of other people who can do those things. So should they then pass off, not pass off, but delegate brand to their COO, CMO, to kind of build that kind of cult of personality in their brand? Should they just promote the superhuman brand? Like, do you need a personality brand within a company, given the cult of personality being so prominent in many of the big companies today? Do you see what I mean? I do, and I think the short answer is no, you do not need your company to have a cult of personality. But if you can create one, it's an amazing edge. And it we, is easier. We, we see Elon Musk doing this, right? whether you hate him or like him, it kind of, it doesn't matter. He is a cult of personality, and that is probably one of his strongest assets. I totally agree. When you, when you think back kind of over the superhuman journey, I think lessons are often learned through the hardest times. So very unfairly, you, you kind of said I you know, was on the fly. So are you. Um, what was the hardest element of the journey with superhuman? And what did you learn? Gosh, the hardest element. I'm going to give you the cliched answer, which is each day feels harder than the last. Does it? And so it doesn't get easier? Because I always think, I don't know, I think it does get easier. You have more resources, you have better teams, it's yeah. different problems, but you're not, you know, sleeping in the office or, you know. No, I mean, I never did sleep in the office. <laughs> every, every company has a different culture. We, we never had that culture. Uh, we're very much believers in this is a marathon, not a sprint, and I, I want people to be in it for the, for the very long term. And, and it shows, by the way, in our employee retention metrics and our attrition metrics, we have very, very long-lasting employees. We don't burn people out. So, gosh, there are so many hardest things I could possibly choose. Well, okay, let me be specific. You're now also selling to companies. What's hard about going from B to C, well, like direct to consumer, sorry, to like selling to companies as well? What's difficult about that transition? Yeah. So there is this thing, um, and, and I'll, I'll come to that very shortly. Jason Lemkin, uh, who, who writes the blog Sasta, amazing, and probably my favorite blog, has in many articles said that once you reach $10 million of ARR, yeah. I think his phrase is, then the cavalry is coming. Yeah. You can breathe just a little bit more easy. You know, you can maybe take a weekend every now and then, that, that kind of stuff. I'm like, I'm not sure if that's true. It's just as hard <laughs> well past that than to before that. So I don't know. But selling to companies. This is something that if I had 100% retrovision, I wish we had done earlier. So just one and a half years ago, and actually three years ago when Harry and I were last on this stage, we were 100% we were selling to individuals. Yep. You couldn't buy Superhuman as a company, as crazy as that sounded. Fast forward to today, and we're now selling Superhuman also to teams and to companies, and this by far is the fastest growing part of our business. Now you might think, oh, this must require some kind of fancy team features in order to do that. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true, and we drove this change without any team collaboration features whatsoever. And furthermore, I'm going to say that almost any startup here can drive this change if you're selling to an individual in the workplace. So I'll run through how this loop works, because I think it will be useful and actionable. It still starts with an individual buying superhuman. 
They then become brilliant at what they do. They start getting through their email twice as fast, responding faster to messages, unblocking their team, taking on more projects, and this gets noticed internally by their team, by their peers, by their managers. Superhuman then spreads virally inside companies. And there are three, because I know you're wondering, three viral mechanics that make this work. Number one is the sent via superhuman email signature. And it's shocking that this ancient, probably the oldest viral mechanic, still works today and drives north of 20% of our site traffic. Wow. Number two, the word of mouth. People naturally want to help each other, especially inside companies. And number three, the referral and the invite mechanics. So we then grow to like a handful of seats inside a company. We then reach out to the company and say, hey, do you all want to consolidate these seats onto one team? And sometimes the company is like, why would we do that? And we say, well, you get to pay upfront and annually once, as opposed to individually, perhaps you know, nine different times, depending on how many seats you have. Number two, you hit amazing discounts when you get to 10 people. And number three, every single user is going to save three hours or more per week. So the consolidation is generally a no-brainer. And then when it hits 10 seats, we staff it with a customer success manager and an account manager. And the CSM is responsible for driving usage, adoption, and engagement. And the account manager is responsible for demonstrating the return on investment of buying superhuman to the customer. So the accounts now grow really rapidly, and the customer derives a ton of value from Superhuman. And this loop is shockingly effective. We're now on target to quadruple Teams revenue just this year alone. And further, I think basically any startup here that's selling to individuals can replicate the same loop. So we're going to do a quick fire. I'm going to hit you with a series of questions super quick. So let's go with, what would you most like to change about the world of venture? Oh, what a <laughs> Harry always asks me these quick five questions, and I'm like, hmm, really good question, Harry. Let me, let me ponder on that one. Yeah. Um, I would like. I would like to get some. We have a lot of oscillation going on right now, between valuations being super sky high, valuations being sort of middle of the ground. If you're a founder who's coming into this new, I just like more clarity for the founders in terms of. And it was asked in your session, like, what, for example, do you need to do to raise a Series A? Yeah. What do you know now that you wish you'd known in getting to your first 1,000 users? Thinking of the seed founders in the audience getting from zero to 1,000 users. What do you know now that you wish you'd known then? Well, this one's easy. If I could change one thing going backwards, we would have built for teams from the get-go. Now seeing the growth that we're able to achieve, I wish that we'd done that from day one. OK, 10 years. We did it three years ago we were here. 10 years. Uh, where is Superhuman, and what does that look like? Gosh, I remember this question from before you asked me, many years ago. We're, we're going to go back on past tapes each okay. time. Uh, let's see. Oh, no, now, you, <laughs> now you can track it over time. This is awful. <laughs> um, OK, so 10 years from now, we are a multi-product company. And I mean that both for Superhuman, the email clients, Keep your eyes peeled and stay tuned. You'll start to see additions of Superhuman tuned not just for the horizontal email professional, but specific vertical, specific job functions, and specific industries, as well as brand new products that aren't even email. Now, can I say, everyone, um, Rahul has done the most stellar job here. We had a schedule that someone else wrote for some, a different moderator. He had no idea of the questions that were to come. I think he was exceptional. So can we give a massive hand to Rahul? That was fantastic. Thank Harry for stepping in at the last minute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul and Harry. What an amazing speech that was, or discussion. And fantastic that Harry had the time to step in with such a short notice uh, to interview Rahul. Exactly. Uh, and this actually concludes day one of Slush 2022. Yes. How did you enjoy the day? Thumbs up, three thumbs, OK. Excellent. <laughs> a lot of thumbs. It's getting even better tomorrow, then. So 8 AM, doors open, 10 AM. The show continues on the founder stage. 
And we will be back here again, hosting yep. the stage. See you at the after parties. Give yourself the last big round of applause. Well done. <laughs>